Good morning, all. I welcome you all to the Pharma Summit 2022 Drug Discovery and Community Trial on 27th and 28th August 2022 in virtual conference and expo organized by Association of Pharmaceutical Research. Yes. Association of Pharmaceutical Research is one of the world's leading professional association for pharmaceuticals and life science professionals caring for people. APR is non-profitable professional association meant for research and development in the field of, in the field of pharmaceutical science and technology. APR is an international forum for researchers, academicians, doctors, and practitioners for sharing knowledge and innovation in the field of pharmaceutical science and technology. APR aim to bring together worldwide researchers and professionals, encourage intellectual development, and providing opportunities for networking and collaboration. APR meets with its objectives through academic networking meetings, conferences, projects, research publication, academic award, and scholarships. APR strives to enrich from its diverse group of adver uh, adversary members. APR connect pharmaceutical professionals, researchers, exchange global innovation, and act as a bridge between researchers and academicians by organizing international conferences, world conferences, faculty development programs, international workshops, seminars, guest lectures, short-term training programs, providing membership, establishing chapters, faculty exchange programs, implant training. BioLeaks Worldwide is not-for-profit professionals association, which prominently promote research and developments. We at BioLeaks have brought a revolution in the field of worldwide conferences. BioLeaks Worldwide Conference bring together the professional wizards and leaders who have explored all avenue to enforce, to enforce the field of life science and medicine technology. BioLeaks Worldwide conduct events worldwide which help in enhancing the skill set of the people from diverse industries and also from forms a common platform for eminent personalities, physicians, researchers, doctors, and academicians, professionals, business figures, and much more. Biolic conferences encourage better comprehense about improvements and progression over the world through worldwide conferences with the speed of science and technology. We work with our motto of creating a better tomorrow by organizing conferences and creating a network which, help, which will help grow a better tomorrow with the help of advanced technology and achieve suitable development. Associations of Pharmaceutical Research, which is organized by the Pharma Summit 2022 Drug Discovery and Community Trial, on 27th and 28th August in, August in virtual conference and expo. This conference is a multidisciplinary program with broad participation with members from around the globe focused on learning about pharmaceutical science, research methodology for, for formulations, manufacturing and its advances. We invite all the speakers and delegates from all over the world to attend this conference. It creates a perfect podium for global networking as it brings together renowned speakers and scientists across the globe to the most exciting and memorable scientific event filled with innovative and interactive sessions, international workshops, world-class international exhibitions, and poster presentations. Experts and scholars from drug manufacturing and pharmaceutics background can showcase their scientific work research and emerging technologies on the topics such as pharmacology, pharmaceutical biotechnology, pharmacoeconomics, drug delivery systems, biodrugs, pharmacovigilance, and drug safety, pharmaceutical bio microbiology, pharmaceutical research and development, pharmaceutical analysis, and quality assurance, biotherapeutics, radiopharmaceuticals, vaccine designs, formulation technologies, clinical pharmacy, 
industrial pharmacy, pharmaceutical chemistry, pharma pharmaceutics, it would like to welcome all the uh, honorable delegates. I would like to welcome all, uh, all honorable dignitaries, Dr. Pramod Kumar Rajput, sir, Senior Vice President, Clarilla Pharma Limited, Ahmedabad, India. Professor Ramesh Chandra, sir, Founder and Director of Dr. B. R. Ahmedkar, Center for Biomedical Research, University of Delhi. Conference Chair, Dr. Ahmed, sir, Center of Biomedical Research, Population Council, New York, USA. Conference Co-Chair, uh, Samba Shiva Rao, Puram, sir, India Global Lab Research and Testing Organization, India. Conference Secretary, Dr. Rajiv Shibar, sir, Vice President, External Affair Advisory, board member at the International Human Rights Council, India. Publication Chair, Dr. Roy Rileria Marzo, Sir, Head International Research Collaboration, IMS and Program, Head Malaysia. I would like to welcome our eminent keynote speaker, Dr. Uday Kumar Rakhbe, Sir, PhD founder, Pharma Mantra, TM Mumbai area, India. Dr. Sanjeev Chandran, sir, PhD Director, Drug and Delivery Systems and IVIVC Biopharma, RND Pune, Maharashtra, India. Dr. Anil Parikh, sir, President, Medical Affairs and Clinical Research, IPCA, Laboratories Limited, Mumbai, India. Dr. Anil Kaira, sir, Partner, Modern Laboratories, Director, Nandini Medical Laboratories, Private Limited, Chairman, Modern Group of Industries, India. I would like to welcome Dr. Satish Kumar Sarankar, sir, Professor and Head Faculty of Pharmacy, Mansarovar Global University, Shehor MP. Would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Rokhia Sultana, ma'am, Professor in HOD Department of Pharmacognosy, Unopia Pharmacy College and Research Center, Mangaluru. Uh, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Bhavna Kapoor, ma'am, Assistant Professor, Maya College of Pharmacy, Dehradun, Uttarakhand. Dr. Mayang Bansal, sir. Principals and Professor Jaipur College of Pharmacy, Jaipur. Dr. Isra Damthruk, ma'am, Assistant Professor from Chukruwa University. Dr. Anita Nandan Gopal, ma'am, Professor in HOD from Sultan. Ul Umul College of Pharmacy, Hyderabad. Azmovia Bhatikul, ma'am. Department of Inorganic uh, Physical and Colloidal Chemistry. Taskin Pharmaceutical Institute, Ubakistan. I welcome you all. Next, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Sanjeev Chandran, sir, Director, Senior General Manager, 
uh, advocate of drug delivery systems and IV, IVC Biopharma R&D Pune, India. Thank you, dear. Uh, Very good morning, sir. Good morning. So should I share my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Just let me know if the screen is visible. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Okay. Well, very good morning, all of you. And uh, thank you for having me here uh, today. Uh, uh, as a keynote uh, speaker uh, for this uh, conference, I would... Uh, I uh, like to touch upon some of the innovation aspects and scientific product development uh, uh, without uh, getting into uh, uh, specifics of a, a, a very uh, I mean a, a specific area. We would like to talk in general what drives innovation in pharmaceutical product development and what have been some of the key milestone developments over the last 60, 65 years, which have defined the uh, uh, drug delivery uh, applications and uh, clinic for to ensure clinical benefit uh, and uh, uh, how they have been able to meet the unmet medical need. Uh, so uh, a, a very statutory uh, disclaimer here that these opinions that I'm going to express in the course of next 20, 25 minutes are so only my uh, opinion and don't represent the organizations or, or, or any of my affiliations um, that I work for. So, so I, I, I primarily plan to cover uh, certain aspects. What is driving innovation in pharmaceutical product development, some historical aspects, some of uh, the uh, examples of some of the strategies that uh, pharmaceutical organizations employ in terms of extending product life cycle, and then some of the key innovation which have happened over the last uh, uh, few years, which are, uh, or, or in fact, last one decade that uh, have been, that, that have started redefining uh, product development and application of pharmaceutical technology in uh, uh, overcoming the un unmet medical needs, which have been very different from the conventional pharmaceutical product that we have been talking about in the past. So uh, just to give you a, a brief overview of uh, uh, what uh, we have here uh, in terms of what is the global market size, in, if I can put it. Uh, so we are at this point, a huge uh, 500, 150. Uh, what two fifty billion dollar or twelve hundred uh, twelve hundred fifty billion uh, dollar uh, pharmaceutical market globally U.S. If you if you put it in terms of U.S. dollars, this was uh, somewhere around two thousand nineteen, and the projections for uh, up to two thousand twenty four is that we would be roughly a uh, fifteen hundred fifty billion dollar uh, pharmaceutical market globally. Out of that. Uh, US, the North America actually constitutes the largest chunk of around 40 45%. Uh, whereas uh, Europe, the top five countries in Europe constitute roughly 14%. Whereas the rest of the world, excluding China, constitute would constitute around 25% of the global pharmaceutical market. So, so around 350 400 billion dollar market is going to reside in where the part of the country that we live in, and 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 out of that. The ten large, tenth largest in terms of volume, and even the third largest in terms of uh, sorry, the tenth largest in terms of value, and third largest in terms of volume is the Indian pharmaceutical industry, which is growing at a rate which is expected to grow at a rate of around seven point eight, seven to eight percent compounded annual growth rate compared to around four and a half percent for global pharmaceutical industry and uh, U.S. in general. Would most of the other pharma industries are. And other countries are expected to grow at around five percent. If I can request some of the participants who have unmuted to mute so that uh, we don't have this disturbance. Thank you. Right. So, uh, so, 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 but then uh, India is considered the pharma basket for the world, actually. And the reason why it is considered is not because of 
in uh, the the primary uh, drug discovery based uh, drug products being developed in india but uh, because indian indian companies have excelled in one niche area within the pharma sector and that is the generic product development so if you look at the us generic market which is around 90 billion a a a, a major chunk of this market is actually uh, driven by the indian pharmaceutical companies uh, top 20 25 pharmaceutical companies actually drive uh, this entire market but if you look at the generic scenario in us Uh, every nine out of ten prescriptions are filled as generic product in US, but then value-wise, it's only twenty-five percent. One in four of the in in terms of the money that is spent, in terms of uh, the value, uh, the the generic prescription is only twenty-five uh, percent of the overall prescription. But then there is a lot of scope and long-acting injectable space for generalization, especially complex uh, long-acting injectables. And even in topical and ophthalmic space, the market has not been generalized. So, which means that there are a lot of uh, opportunities still existing uh, in that space for uh, uh, Indian pharma industry to further grow uh, and 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 grow by uh, leaps and bounds actually. And and most of the pharma companies in India at this point are actually uh, concentrating on that that the complex. a uh, product development bandwagon and uh, they are they are part of almost everybody is part of um, that bandwagon one way or the other some are in inhalation space some are in uh, uh, injectable as well as in inhalation space there are few others who are in onco space and and so on and so forth so so almost every uh, complex product development aspect is covered by the indian pharmaceutical um, uh, sector at this point now if you look at just to give you a bird eye view what type of products are getting approved uh, uh, and and what is the therapeutic category of these product that are new product or new molecules that are being developed so you will find that if you look at complex products being approved the highest number is in dermatological space followed by with uh, um, uh, urinogenital as well as uh, female reproductive uh, organ uh, 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 female reproductive cycle related or menstrual cycle related spaces where most or, and then then the nervous system and then uh, elementary tract and metabolism related that is where complex products are coming up in the market but whereas the maximum number of products are coming up in cns anti psychotic space cardiovascular as well as anti infective and this anti infective is a recent phenomena because in the last one half three years we had lot many um antibiotics or antivirals being investigated and a lot of clinical impetus being given clinical trial impetus being given around that space because of covid which was a forced uh, um, uh, effort uh, forced innovation around that space but then on an average you will find that uh, complexity is associated with the device with which um, um, products are getting approved so 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 that was one uh, point that i tried to highlight in the beginning that uh conventionally complexity was associated with a tablet or a capsule or a liquid oral or a injectable formulation but then as we are progressing as the technology is advancing innovation in pharmaceutical uh, segment is actually happening in the drug device combination so how do you how do you make it more acceptable to the patient how do you make it more convenient to the patient so so, so uh, to cite an example an auto injector based a drug delivery system for a, for an injectable is an effort to ensure that for every injection that a person has to take he or she need not visit a paramedic or a nursing home or uh, take an ambulatory care uh, support whereas uh, with an auto injector you can self inject that medication in spite of it being highly potent medication similarly in case of inhalation you have all these uh, inhale in, inhalable devices uh, respules or respi mats or, uh, um, or 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 the one with dose counters and stuff like that so these are all innovation aimed at making sure that there is more compliance to the therapy there is more patient compliance there is more patient convenience so basically uh, ensuring that the therapeutic benefit of the molecule is enhanced by providing those additional uh, paraphernalia around that which will ensure that uh, you derive maximum benefit out of the molecule that is administered so 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 that is 
that is the essence of um, uh, newer product development uh, presently globally so and and in fact uh, the covid um, uh, years like the last one and a half years have been a big boon in that direction for the simple reason that uh, it actually accelerated um, uh, a, a new a technology which have been in the horizon for almost 25 30 years the mrna based uh, or dna based drug deliveries or, or drug delivery of mrnas or dnas uh, but then nobody actually no regulator actually uh, took the risk of approving it considering the long term benefit to risk ratio was always uncertain but then uh, with these mrna based vaccines and this dna based vaccines that have been approved over the last two years across the globe by different regulators based on solid clinical trials that have been done you have actually advanced one more frontier which is uh, delivery of uh, oligos actually oligonucleotides or poly oligonucleotides uh into uh, and and that is another segment that has come up in the last uh, uh, few years which was not uh, uh, which was not at all uh, uh, no product was approved in the past in that area now coming back to some some um, uh, some uh, some 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 basic understanding about what drives innovation like before we examine uh, what is the basis of uh, what what goes behind a product development Uh, when you talk about a a first time in the world product development now when you look at some of the gadgets that you use on a daily basis say for example mobile phones or your uh, or your laptops or your pads or your tablets they were not uh, market need driven innovations they were actually technology push based innovation wherein what i mean by that uh, so basically somebody developed a novel technology and then you started finding um, applications for that and once you started finding applications for that you started converting customers to your new technology and that is how uh, uh, from a, a, a dial based phone or no phone to a dial based phone uh, to a, a simple uh, uh, pager to mobile phone and to a smart tab which works all in one like your laptop your um, a tv screen your uh, uh, mobile phone your video conferencing device and your mini office you carry actually in your bag right now right so but then such technology push based innovations have one disadvantage uh, in fact they make the previous innovation obsolete and so you you would know like uh, from uh, uh shutter bag shutter based camera to a digital camera to no camera right today nobody buys except for except when you are uh, an 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 photography enthusiast you would not venture into buying a good digital camera even if, even though if it, it is digital but then you would not venture into buying a digital camera because your mobile phone your tab actually uh, works as a very good uh, camera device and to capture uh, uh, emotions to capture selfies to capture uh, situations to capture events right so so nobody ventures I mean, of, of course photography experts or photography enthusiasts do still go and buy but then you have actually made a, a camera which was so integral 20 years back to everybody's camping trips and uh, field trips and uh, vacations uh, obsolete everybody carry a camera now in your uh, front pocket now these days so 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 they actually make the previous innovation previous object of innovation previous technologies obsolete progressively whereas uh, the market full based innovations are basically uh, uh, driven by identifying an unmet need in the market say for example uh, you have a product which is to be taken uh, you have allergy you have uh, sneezing you have a running nose and you need to take an anti allergic now the problem is not systemic there the problem is very much local and local associated to the nasal passage right so so that is where the where the actual requirement is but then typically what we do is that we take a we pop an oral, oral anti allergic pill say for example cetrazine levocetrazine loratadine and any such molecule and what it does is it not only sub- suppresses the allergic reaction it helps you control your sneezing but it also makes you drowsy of course there are molecular modifications done to decrease the sedative potential of these molecules but then 
a, a market need based innovation in that would be a, a nasal spray of of this molecule so for example you have in market azelastin nasal spray which is basically an anti allergic administer only to your nasal passage working only at your nasal passage controlling the allergy based uh, sneezing and not impacting the systemic circulation so 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 basically the market pull based innovations are the one which are pharmaceutical innovation most of the pharmaceutical innovations are market pull based innovations and almost all of them if i can put it because you don't develop something for just because you wanted to advance the frontiers of technology you actually identify a niche unmet market need unmet medical need and then try to develop a technology which would suffice or which would solve that unmet or 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 identified lacune in the state of art and that is how and that is when you bring it to the market so basically basic need products are never uh, you don't create demand for a particular new technology you actually try to solve a problem so most of the innovations in pharmaceutical sectors are um, um, in fact all the nmes all the ncs developed have been trying to identify a uh, uh, solving a problem in the in 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 the medical fraternity right so now with that but then since i am planning to talk only about drug delivery innovation so i will restrict my discussion here uh, to drug delivery concepts so if you look at over the years from 1950s when uh, the silver bullet or the magic bullet was the were, were some of these uh, for the sulfur drugs the or sulfonamides uh, the molecule uh, uh, the, these these terms were coined as uh, uh, magic bullet somewhere around the second world war right and from then uh, the drug delivery platforms have undergone lot of innovation uh, if you look at the spansules which were i mean even today they are a fancy product but then they were actually invented somewhere in 1952 i have not mentioned here another iron iron complex venofer which was somewhere approved in 1950 and it has been and that that was at that time itself based on a nano nano um nanonization of iron complex now nano iron complex and and at that time even the nano concept was never coined like the nano systems were not uh, as 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 a subject in science were not being discussed but then people have actually invented some of those products at that time then you have this um osmotic uh, pillow carpin system the ocucert which actually revolutionized the pillow carpin delivery in 1970s and you have these iud's which actually revolutionize how uh, family planning and population control can be done merna is a classical example which came of course later on uh, then you have these transdermal patches which came in uh, late 1970s so scopolamin uh, transdermal patch being the one of the first one to be commercialized for morning sickness and then you have some of these and 1980s actually saw long acting depo injections or implantable injections being developed i have listed few there are lot many uh, i i just lift, uh, listed the one which were pioneers in some of these areas uh, the, the first of the depo injection which was approved was in 1986 which was the tripotrelin uh, dicapital is the brand name there Uh, which was actually an academic research which was in licensed by the company and then you have this doxorubicin liposomal formulation which came in 1990 and then by 2000 you have these implantable depots uh, for uh, luprolide uh, acetate uh, depot that came which was basically a a micro uh, electro mechanical system it was a micro mechanical system because it had certain mechanical components uh, uh, miniaturized mechanical components and then it has the drug delivery component it and these were working in tandem right so uh, so so this is so 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 last 50 60 years a drug delivery technology has evolved but then if you look at whatever i have listed on this slide all the innovations that i have listed on this slide they've all been need based innovation so if you look at pilocarpin what was the need pilocarpin is a mydriatic drug used very extensively uh, uh, and it was uh, of course now you have some of the newer drugs that have come but then in 70s that was the only drug available and you don't want 
multiple dosing of this every 2 hour 4 hour dosing is not required so this pillow carpin actually by alza corporation at that time brought an insert which you just insert into your topical eye and this would be available for 14 days there were two uh, um, uh, versions that they launched one was a 14 day version and the other was a 28 day 7 uh, day version and a 14 day version so you can simply remove it after 7 days 14 days so one dose supporting you intra uterine device was you don't have to take a oral contraceptive pill every um, uh, so so the cop, i mean i'm not mentioned here the copper tea and so all those which actually revolutionized uh, the family planning strategies globally in the in the developing world you have um, um, uh, you have these uh, doxorubicin based uh, liposomal system which decrease the toxicity of the molecule to a very large extent and at the same time provided it prolonged its action over a longer period of time dipo injections for antipsychotics were a boon to come because antipsychotic with antipsychotics drugs you already have uh, psychosis or depression associated with the patient so when the patient is in that uh, state of mind compliance is a big problem so the caregiver has a lot of trouble ensuring that uh, you have uh, Uh, adequate uh, therapeutic uh, uh, you have uh, compliance to the therapeutic regimen so a long acting dipo injection actually helps you cover that compliance over a longer period of time 3 month 6 month dipo injection actually help you ensure that you have a 6 month compliance with one single injection of the product now why what is driving pharma companies to innovate around these space identifying this unmet need and then uh, looking at i'll i'll try to give you a small story which i which is uh, basically referred to in literature as cardism story which is basically the story around the innovations of a very very popular uh, calcium channel blocker deltiazem and if you look at deltiazem in 1988 aventis had this marion labs or aventis had this product which was thrice daily as very simple innovation that i'm going to talk about but then uh, talking about what type of uh, uh, commercial advantage the company derives and what type of clinical benefit that the patient derives so it's basically a symbiotic requirement uh, patients or the caregivers require such innovation and the uh, and the pharmaceutical companies which actually innovate around this actually derive commensurate commercial advantage or using uh, these innovation so if you look at uh, cardizem ir tablet which were which had a market of around 260 million at that time in 1988 in uh, correcting for inflation uh, this would be more than a billion now in current terms but then in 19 88 91 they introduced what is it called they converted the thrice daily regimen which was little uh, inconvenient for the patient to remember and to comply with with twice daily a bid regimen so so you just have to take instead of three pill a day you have to take two pill a day and then they came up with an extended release once daily cardizem cd in 19 uh, 96 and and you can see the growth in the amount uh, the market share of the product of the molecule for the company that own this the the rights of this molecule or the patent protection around this molecule and then they came up in 2019 uh, like in 2003 where the patent expired recently couple of years back cardizem la the long acting deltiazem which was basically a chronotherapeutic deltiazem it was much more than being a once a day now we talked about the commercial advantage that a company derive what was the between the cd you know like from ir thrice daily to twice daily to once daily you have a very distinct advantage of decreasing the pill burden improving compliance instead of three tablets or two tablets a day you just have to take one tablet a day but what was the advantage from cd to la is an interesting concept now if you look at this is the pk profile of cardizem cd so you have you administer the drug and you immediately the peaks and then plateaus and it remains there in the system at a basal level for a long over 24 hours whereas cardizem la actually is having a lag phase after administration of the formulation it doesn't immediately start getting release it is not released and it is not absorbed so now if you look at what is the therapeutic requirement of of a beta uh, of a calcium channel like uh, blocker uh, especially uh, it it is uh, uh, widely reported that most of the heart attacks most of the congestive heart failures happen in the early morning hours like between uh, maybe 5 o'clock in the morning till 10 am is what is what is reported right so now the advantage is if you have a calcium blocker which is taken in the evening somewhere here at 10 pm after your dinner it, an la product 
it will only peak towards 6 am and then it will remain at its highest level in the morning hours around your breakfast time and then it will further taper off towards the evening hour. So, so it will provide you the, the, the ben therapeutic benefit of the drug when it is required. So, so, so this is uh, how uh, like, so, so basically a very subtle requirement uh, while Cardizem CD was doing its job, but then Cardizem CD when it is, since it is taken early uh, after breakfast in the morning, uh, the, the levels of Cardizem CD at around 6 a.m. was at the lowest, whereas the levels of Cardizem LA actually improves, increases in the early morning hours. So, so if a calcium blocker is going to have any impact on uh, the, 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 the cardiac muscle or in the, the cardiovascular functioning, then it would be best maximum in the morning from an LA and, and maximum during daytime around 2 o'clock, around 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock and from a CD product. So, so this is how people innovated to understanding the actual chronotherapeutic requirement of the product of the, of the therapy and, and work with the molecule and the technology to arrive at a solution which is win-win for both the caregiver, the patient and the pharmaceutical manufacturer. Now, another innovation, a very recent one, only a two-year-old innovation is oral delivery of peptides. Now, oral delivery of peptides have been a holy grail of uh, innovation. Like for the last 40, 45 years, people have been talking about how to deliver peptides orally. Almost every company has uh, failed, but in here you have an example where uh, semaglutide now as an uh, anti-diabetic drug is available as an oral product and it's and it is and and, and it is very well uh, received by the market it has already been launched in us europe and other uh, even in india now it is available from no one artist but then uh, i'm not uh, <laughs> promoting the product here but then what i'm trying to uh, highlight here is that a careful design of the peptide here um, there, what what are the problems with a peptide delivery oral peptide delivery the biggest hurdle is acid degradation of the peptide or the poly or a polypeptide in our gi tract now semaglutide as a peptide has been modified enough to ensure that some of the amino acids are tinkered with to ensure provide them with resistance to acid degradation and then you have this proprietary um, drug delivery agent developed, which is called SNAC here. Snack is what popularly it is known as, developed by this company called Elegant Technology, which actually collaborated with Novo to develop this product. Now, the combination of peptide and carrier complex, so the absorption of peptide from the GI tract is enhanced by this delivering agent, and they together cross the barrier, uh, biological membrane barrier, the branch border epithelium in our GI tract, and then get absorbed into the systemic circulation. Of course, the bioavailability would be comparatively less compared to uh, injectable, but then look at the patient convenience that you provide. So, so obviously you have to make some compromises, but then if you can ensure uh, comparable bioavailability over a period of time over uh, at steady state over a, or a period of usage, then of course it has an advantage and it is a major advantage for to, uh, to have an oral peptide instead of an injectable peptide. Now this is one, and this is the is the front runner. This is the first one to come. I'm sure there are many such products which are being researched across by different pharma companies, especially in anti-diabetic uh, therapy or anti uh, in, in 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 control of diabetes. Uh, so so basically, uh, we would see more uh, products coming up, uh, more innovation happening in this area. Another uh, concept that we talk about is uh, uh, 3D printing in pharmaceuticals. Now, 3D printing is not a, 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 an old is, is not a new concept. 3D printing has been there for last last three decades, if I can put it, from 1990s, 3D printing as a concept is available, um, mainly in mechanical and electromechanical engineering disciplines in plastic industry, in polymer industry. People have been talking about it. People have been attempting those things. But then in 2015, so if you look at and, the, and look at the contrast, in 2000, you had one of the earliest publication in pharmaceutical uh, area, pharmaceutical research area of 3D printing, which was published in Journal of Control release in somewhere in 2000, which talked about this concept and uh, 
and 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 researched the in a preliminary prototype for one of the molecule and then in 2015 you have uh, apricia company which brought its zip dose technology platform the product name is spritam uh, and uh, it is of um, uh, levetiracetam uh, fast dissolve or zip uh, dissolve uh, tablet uh, amount dissolve tablet Uh, whereas the dose now here look at the innovation that uh, these man these developers actually try to solve usually when you talk about mouth dissolve you talk about very low dose maybe one milligram two milligram nothing more than five or ten milligram right here we are talking about a molecule which has a dose of around thousand milligram a two fifty to thousand but then the highest dose is thousand and you want to make it a mouth dissolve system and you can you can see it around four second is all that it takes for a tablet of Uh, spray time to dissolve compared to even the best mouth dissolve tablet that are available in the market which takes still more time right so 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 the so the here the application was can i make while 3d printing as a technology was known and it is a very cumbersome technology it is not at all easy to implement it but then can i make a very high dose drug available in a mouth dissolve fashion and then here you have a innovation which talk about it but then that's not the end of 3d printing 3d printing has lot of application you can actually manipulate the drug release kinetics by in multiple ways i've just given some examples like you can have a pulsed release you can have a flat line release uh, you can have at this type of tablet design is possible in 3d printing which is not possible in a regular compression process uh, and but then you can always uh, manipulate it in a way that you get pulsed dosing wherever you want you get the dosing so depending upon the thickness of these arms you can get the therapeutic levels the way you want you can have decreasing levels you can have increase ascending levels you can have uh levels which are high in the beginning then you have low then you have tapered off and then you have the last push over 24 hours so 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 these are systems which can help you with chronotherapy uh or these are systems which can help you in a, so over a period of time you get pulses of the dose and and that helps you so one example one classical requirement here is in menorrhagia so if you look at if you, if you talk to gynecologist or you talk to uh, females who suffer from uh, pcod or who suffers from um, irregular bleeding and uh, menorrhagia and all you will find that you have random pain you have periodic pain you have periodic bleeding so so a, some a drug like tranexamic acid is a is a very good candidate to be administered in a pulsed dose because the dose is also very high so you only need a small dose to be administered to control that bleeding and 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 if it can be administered at a fixed interval of time you actually bring in lot of comfort to the patient now these are now these are uh, products or processes and uh, concepts under research at different part of the world and hopefully over the period of time in the, in in the time in, in in coming times you would find that some of these innovation reaching the marketplace now looking at long acting injectables now this is one area which holds lot of promise for two reason uh, long acting injections actually improve go a long way in improving the patient compliance because you just take one shot and you are sorted for 3 months 6 months only disadvantage with this type of technology is that you have you you have to uh, see for example a tablet you take the first dose and in the physician or the or, or the caregiver decides that no now i don't want this tablet to be given i want to change the tablet i want to change the molecule because the the, the benefit is not coming to the patient it is very easy to re-prescribe or change the prescription whereas <coughs> excuse me whereas in case of a long acting injectable it is not possible because once administered that system will that will remain the depot will remain in the body for the des the design period of time so so that is one disadvantage but it can always be overcome by having localized depots or implant which can be surgically removed now you have several systems excuse me you have several systems which are known uh, which have been researched and for which there are products available so you have oily solutions which can act as depot once inside the system you have liposomal system that i talked about doxorubicin you have polymeric microspheres you have suspended particles so the particle you control the size and the crystal 
property of the molecule and they act as uh, um, uh, act as depose themselves. So for example, paliperidone long acting injections are a classical example of this type of technology. Now, if you look at approvals in different therapeutic areas, long acting injectables, uh, the highest number of long acting injectables have been approved in these two areas, oncology and neuroscience and women's health. So, so this is where you have, and the reason why you have it is because patient compliance is, the requirement of patient compliance is of the highest order is in these therapeutic areas. And also the, 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 because of the inherent condition of the disease or the subject, there is greater probability of patient inconvenience and incompliance also from conventional therapy. And for that reason, you will find that uh, uh, you have uh, long acting injectables, maximum number of long acting injectables being approved in this area. And then even the under clinical development also, if you look at uh, pain and women health, uh, pain, anti-infective, neuroscience and oncology constitute the maximum uh, number of clinical trials that are happening in the area of long acting injectables. And if you look at from the uh, technology that I talked about, from the technology perspective, suspended solids technology, wherein you don't need to do, you just have to control the crystal structure and uh, um, the size of the drug particle in your system is the one which is the highest, which, which have the maximum research that has happened. Then you have oily solution, then you have polymeric microspheres. And the last is in situ forming polymer implants is the lowest one because there uh, you need biostimuli. You need to have some stimulus within the system which will ensure that you have depot formation. Now, if you look at, um, uh, this is one of the last one that I would like to discuss, share with all of you, uh, is uh, the wearable technologies. Now, a new advancement in uh, long acting injectables or injectable technology would be wearable injectables, so which already we already have infused pumps and all that thing. But then, so from, from there, so, so basically, uh, if you look at the trend, the way our technologies evolve from lab devices to handheld ones, to wearable ones, to attachable devices, like say, for example, flexible, you have gadgets, um, pinned onto your uh, uh, fabrics or your clothing to implantable device that we talked about the under the skin cell depot, long acting depot injection. You now you have ingestible systems which are uh, available. Now, what, what actually it does is that you will have something called a, a biosensor network systems or a body area network, body sensor network system or a body area network system, wherein you have an IoT device which will actually control the whole delivery. You have sensors which will sense the environment. You have sensors which will sense the activity or motion of your body. And then you have <coughs> sensors which will actually sense the pharmacological or physiological parameters. Say, for example, how the heart is working, or how the liver is working, or how uh, what what type of uh, what is your blood pressure, or what type of uh, blood sugar level you have. And based on that, this IoT actually would define the algorithm uh, embedded in the IoT device will actually trigger the next step in that, whether it is. Um, uh, administering a, a dose of antihypertensive or an anti-diabetic uh, drug and basically an insulin injection through a microneedle device or uh, an antihypertensive product uh, through a, a, a particular uh, system or uh, you have uh, for an onco patient, you have pain perception increasing or you have pain increasing and you want an anti uh, nociceptive agent to be administered at that point in time. So, so or, or you have cancer chemo happening and then you have uh, you have a fixed uh, schedule for that every six hour you need to give a dose of a particular anti cancer drug uh, through injection. So you can actually uh, control these things and that is what is going to be the future of uh, the drug drug delivery in 20 years time. So basically, when we talk about personalized medicine, we are not talking about personalized paracetamols or personalized antibiotics. So that is a wrong notion that most of us carry when we say when we when we will have personalized medicine in the years to come. Personalization of your medicine delivery is what we 
would be the order of the day when you have the same molecule but delivered as per your requirement nobody is going to develop a new molecule every day for you based on your own your genetic need uh, so 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 that is a misconception that in general people have that uh, advent of personal medicine means for every disease that i would have i would get a specialized medicine no you would get a specialized treatment regimen and that treatment regimen becomes specialized because it is controlled through these parameters through these sensors these uh, monitoring devices that are fitted onto your body and they actually will ensure that you get a therapeutic regimen which is of of drug delivery which is customized to your body need customized to your activity need customized to your stress level customized to your um, uh, how do i put it customized to your lifestyle uh, need and that is what is a personalized medicine to me it is not uh, having a new molecule every day for a new disease that every person will have that is not how it would it would work now um, so 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 that is uh, all that as a keynote uh, address i plan to talk with all of you uh, so if you look at uh, uh, one of the reports that appeared a couple of years back that uh, the overall drug delivery market just the drug delivery market i am not even talking about the overall pharmaceutical market the drug delivery market by 2025 is going to be 900 billion and and that excludes devices and uh, that excludes other uh, uh, medical systems and stuff like that so 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 there is huge uh, uh, market uh, available to be explored there is a huge potential that is to be available to be exploited so that that is one reason for for one reason why if you look at the read the annual report of most of the big pharmaceutical companies whether in india or globally you would find that their impetus is on innovation most of the time and almost every page in their annual report is how they are going to innovate how they are going to uh, adopt newer digital technologies newer uh, uh, platform technologies to bring in better products to the market to alleviate uh, Uh, to meet those unmet medical needs that are still existing in the market or or future medical needs whatever will emerge based on how our population age or how uh, what type of demographic changes happen what type of uh, changes happen in our uh, lifestyle and disease burden based on the climate change that is being talked about and stuff like that now they these novel drug delivery tools and platform do have a big potential to uh, elevate to to solve some of these uh, problems now oral biologics would be the next holy grail i mean if to me uh, oral biologics is would be the one where most of the companies would uh, pursue right now we are talking about biosimilars and all that but once that rush would be over in 8 10 years time uh, or uh, delivering biologicals overly orally just like uh, somebody thought about an aspirin pill or a sulfa drug pill 70 years back uh, you would start getting biologicals which are peptidomimetics which are uh, uh, which which mimic the human biomolecular systems so 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 they would be much much uh, acceptable drug by the body because right now today if you ask me whatever we take the adme of a profile or the absorption uh, distribution metabolism and elimination of a of of a drug is what the body does to the drug the pharmacodynamic effect is what the drug does to the body and so there is a constant fight between uh, the drug trying to elicit its pharmacodynamic effect and our body trying to remove the drug from our system presenting with all the barriers so 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 the next innovation would be uh, to make biomimetics which are except more acceptable by the body which can stay in the body for a longer time which work like the biomolecules are not regular indigenous biomolecules work in our body i would uh, uh, close my talk here uh, thank you for um, uh, the patient uh, hearing and thank you for this opportunity to talk to all of you thank you so much sir for sharing your informative presentation thank you sir if there are any question i would be happy to take maybe couple of couple of them <clears throat>
Any questions from the audience? If not, then thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, yeah. thank you, sir. Hi, Sajid. Dr. Parikh here. Hello, hello Dr. Parikh. <laughs> yeah, I was listening to your session. Interesting. Uh, just you. one more observation. Personalized medicine is more now entrenched, well entrenched in oncology. You see the, you know, the genetic makeup of the individual, and then uh, depending on that, you decide the, which drugs are suitable. So it's very much already in practice in oncology. So, agree. Uh, that, I agree, thought I agree, just, uh, agree. Share that. Agree, agree, agree. But then yeah. personalization like, you know, would have be... Have chromosome in chronic myeloid leukemia. So you, you know, identify and also you have the therapy based on that. So it Correct. is there in the oncology and now it is much more there. So based on the genetic makeup of the individual and the, you know, tumor coding and all those things. So um, oncology is the field where this personalized medicine is, you know, expanding because these drugs are very costly also. Correct. So, so I would, I, uh, Dr. Parik, I would go one step for ahead of this particular uh, uh, concept. So, so basically, uh, uh, I would say that you have much more personalized screening methods being developed, which can right. identify exact the subtype of uh, the aberration ah, that uh, is. Uh, that's uh, what exactly I'm pointing out. So, first you should have the proper diagnosis, that's right. so, and then makeup, and then you. So, and then when you family. have, uh, uh, see, I, I know uh, Mitra Biotech, which is uh, a very good friend of mine, startup in um, um, Boston, uh, which actually has a very rapid screening method. So they take your genetic sample and what they do is that they test that genetic aberration against all the anti-cancer drugs that are available over a period of 24 hours to 36 hours. So it's a very high throughput screening process and tell you the exactly which molecule has the best chance of uh, succeeding at this particular yeah. patient. And based on that, yeah, uh, the physician gets, the oncologist gets a better uh, chance of treating that patient and the, the success rate is like enhanced. Like obviously there is a lot of unknown elements still with oncotherapy, but then at least at the starting point, you start with an advantage rather than doing a trial and error on uh, that thing. Right. So, yeah, so very good observation. I, I, I completely agree with you. And I'll share one example in my presentation. Okay. Sure. All right. So I will be looking forward to hearing that. Because I'm going to discuss. I'm going to talk now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Anil Parekh, sir, President, Medical Affairs and Clinical Research, IPCA Laboratories, Limited, Mumbai, Maharashtra, India. I heartily welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Can I share my screen? Yes, sir, please. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. So actually, I would like to uh, first of all thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to uh, deliver this uh, talk. And this is uh, talk is you know based on my experience uh, mainly and the uh, and the projects which I have you know conceived and worked on. And you know, uh, we may discuss many advanced things and all that, but at the grassroots level, what is possible is very, very important at the end of the day. So how we have you know, uh, done some of the projects and carried out, and they are already in the, I will be discussing four areas, and three are already in the market, and uh, they are doing uh, very, very well. And the fourth is in development. So, so you know, I would like to start with the, uh, you know, uh, the talk on, uh, you know, uh, most Indian companies, as you are familiar, they deal with generics. We don't uh, have, you know, uh, 
we are we are yet not into most of them are uh, most all indian companies i can say barring one or two they are not yet into new drug discovery uh, but pharmaceutics is the area where you know uh, most of the indian companies can you know uh, have a modified release and all those population but by and large drug discovery because it's very costly very cost intensive it's not the cup of most indian companies so is this the generic drugs where indian companies can look forward to innovating so i would like to start with the uh, the science of translational medicine uh, translational medicine is a, a science which deals with turning basic research into medicine and treatment so from the bench to the bedside from the, your when you conceive the idea and then you know uh, it reaches the patient that's the translational medicine so you need to have a good scientific knowledge uh, as well as uh, a good knowledge of regulatory science to you know traverse your idea to the various regulatory path and get the final approval so that it reaches the patient so this is a, a, a science which is taught at various uh, universities abroad there is a translational medicine chair at various universities but in india uh, there is no no one is teaching it at you learn it when you enter the pharmaceutical industry so from idea to pill or device the odds are not very good this is an example of uh, reference of american journal of medicine out of 101 discoveries only you know uh, five could reach uh, approval for clinical use and out of that five only one was a popular treatment so when you work on 101 uh, you know ideas you just uh, uh, succeed with one idea so so that's how the cost is very very high so indian market as we are now aware uh, we are different from the developed countries markets where you know if you have one atorva set in there will be 200 300 branded uh, companies coming out with a brand and they all have the doctors attention for that so uh, india is a branded generic market where almost entire revenue comes through generics and global generic market contributes significant revenues to indian companies so there are challenges of when you you know operate in this market so you have you know long term challenges like price erosion drying pipelines and follow on biologics now you know instead of the if you see the top 25 molecules of you know 2022 versus top 20 Uh, 25 molecules of you know 25 years back you hardly found any biologic there but now most of them are filled with biologics but biologics are not easy to uh, you know uh, replicate for indian companies as compared to small molecules so that's a challenge for uh, smaller and smaller and mid size indian companies and the indian companies by and large have not seen major success on phylon biologics so all of them are after it barring one or two approval uh, in the developed countries we don't find many biologics so far approved in the uh, developed market although in india people have uh, replicated for the indian market so as i said drug discovery and alliances they are uh, uh, difficult for most indian companies and research based indian companies also need to collaborate with mncs uh, multinational companies for the drug development because the cost of one introducing one molecule internationally is almost 2.8 billion dollars so this is you know not the size of most indian companies so barring two three indian companies they don't have the size to of this this much size so so even the research based indian companies they will have to also partner with mncs for uh, completing the entire uh, you know uh, clinical development cycle and multi and the other uh, sources are you know you collaborate with mnc and in license their molecule so uh, this route is also available to you know big indian companies because uh, if a multinational wants to you know uh, license out a anti diabetic drug which is still under patent then it will you know prefer a big indian company and smaller and mid size indian companies are left out so 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 you find that uh, indian companies are deprived of this option as well so what are the options for the you know new drug uh, new drugs for indian companies so indian companies need to explore other options so current scenario new product launches is uh, is a significant growth driver for the indian companies and change in intellectual property rights has deprived indian companies the option of launching molecules patented post 95 this has forced some indian companies to explore new drug discovery research but the learning curve is long cost intensive and risky and so far we have not seen major success uh, for indian pharma companies in drug discovery 
and uh, there is a need for a paradigm shift of uh, you know uh, from global pharmacy where we are the significant volume wise we are a third largest in the world india is the third largest and considered global pharmacy but when it comes to value we are 13th or 14th uh, value wise so you know so what are the other options for us so we need to you know uh, shift to clinical research hub because we have uh, good clinicians investigators and excellent uh, hospital setup and good patient load is there so disease burden is significant in india because we are the more, uh, very very highly populous country after china and just uh, i think overtaking china so we have significant disease burden as well so this uh, gives us a good opportunity to turn ourselves into a clinical research hub and clinical development hub so as uh, the talk is on exploring innovations in genetics which are products which are of patent or which are patented pre 95 so where uh, can we explore the you know uh, uh, these genetics for the unexplored potential which has not been done before so this is uh, the model which we work on so so we need to have you know good insight of the disease as well as the good insight of the you know treatment available for that disease or product so if you have only you know product insight and not a disease insight it doesn't work so and if you have a disease insight and not a, you know the therapy insight or product uh, insight which are used in that disease then again you it doesn't work so you need to have disease and product insight both and then find out uh, you know therapy gaps there and you have to target those therapy gaps and uh, based on that therapy gap you have your innovation and then uh, you have uh, the rational for that and then you uh, propose a hypothesis develop a clinical research protocol generate data and seek regulatory approval so this is the uh, model which i would wanted to emphasize where we have been working so i will give example of just four examples i will give for a want of time uh, first is the example of therapy gap uh, in the safety of non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs which has been fulfilled in the indian market by aciclofenac and second i would talk about uh, a clotheridone which is an uh, thiazide like diuretic and anti hypertensive drug which uh, is there in the in the market since 1960 and uh, you know which had disappeared i used to use this drug as a resident in nair hospital Uh, with and it was marketed by Siba Gaigi that time as Hytherton, and then this uh, product had disappeared. But this product has largely, you know, uh, come back and become the mainstay of hypertension treatment over the last ten uh, years or so. And we are the ones who, you know, played a major role in this uh, renaissance of this anti-hypertensive clotheridone. And I, uh, I'll tell you how you, you know, uh, uh, how we have conceived our idea. third product is uh, you know hydroxychloroquine which is uh, uh, basically an anti malarial but this anti malarial uh, you know again approved in uh, 1955 so more than 65 years old molecule similarly and this molecule was initially approved for malaria but subsequently it was approved for rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus so lupus disease and uh, it's basically an anti inflammatory drug so now how we, it got approved in diabetes and uh, we did a repurposing of this molecule uh, from uh, rheumatoid arthritis to you know type 2 diabetes and that will be discussed then lastly i would like to you know discuss a uh, uh, innovation to eliminate the pharmacogenetic limitation of clopidogrel so this so we have considered the clopidogrel derivative and which is still under clinical development so i would like to just briefly talk about that so these are the four areas and how we conceived so background of the our idea will be shared with you so first we'll discuss the therapy gaps in nsaids in uh, you know november 2002 uh, mark shop and um, msd uh, you know did uh, published uh, the vivar study this study is a phase 3 study where the new uh, highly selective cyclooxygenase or selective cox2 inhibitor rofecoxib was compared to naproxen to get approval in as an anti inflammatory drug in rheumatoid arthritis uh, patients so what uh, was uh, there that when you are highly selective towards cox2 you leave cox1 unopposed so you become gi safe 
so the primary endpoint of this drug was uh, you know less upper gi and uh, events like you know peptic ulcer and uh, gastritis so that was proven by uh, the, this study by Merck Vigo study. But what was there in this uh, study came out was a secondary endpoint of signal of you know increased cardiovascular uh, risk, where there was increased risk of myocardial infarction or heart attacks in the rofecoxib group compared to naproxen. You know you can see there so naproxen as compared to naproxen, rofecoxib is having increasing evidence of myocardial infarction. So Merck explained this uh, to the regulator that uh, you know naproxen is like aspirin, so it is you know safe. It is like aspirin, so it is a cardioprotective. So we are cardiac neutral, so we appear you know unsafe as com we appear unsafe as compared to naproxen, but in fact we are cardiac neutral. And this uh, explanation was you know ex accepted by the regulator, US FDA and EMA and worldwide. But we thought that you know this there is some problem with the mechanism of action here. When you are non-selective with conventional NSAID like diclofenac, ibuprofen, you know you uh, uh, you develop GI side effects. But when you are uh, highly selective, you have less GI side effects, but you create an imbalance between cyclooxygenase one and cyclooxygenase two. By not inhibiting cyclooxygenase, the you know uh, the you create thromboxane generation continues while prostacycline reduces. So this is this imbalance leads to uh, the heart attack. So we were in search of a drug which is not neither non-selective nor highly selective. So we identified a drug which was there in the European market, and drug drug was you know acyclofenac, and uh, we did a phase three study and got it approved in India. And this you can see that you know uh, this is a study done in European countries, and they found that among all the NSAID. Acyclofenac was coming out to be safer as compared to other drugs like etoric oxib, rofic oxib, which were, you know, uh, much more uh, uh, CV uh, risk of heart failure was there in them. So this is another uh, study from the same European uh, uh, group which published this data, where uh, you know even not only the uh, CV risk was less with uh, acyclofenac, but even GI risk was also less. So we also conducted a study in almost 21 uh, medical colleges across India in 600 patients where we compared acyclofenac with uh, diclofenac to see the GI safety of acyclofenac and we found that you know acyclofenac was you know much safer. Other thing you can notice in this slide is that NSAID prescription should be short lived for not uh, should not be taken prolonged not only for GI adverse effects or more but also there is a uh, renal toxicity or you have you know kidney adverse effect is there and patients can undergo uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. So NSAID prescription should be only for the duration, short duration and not should not be for a prolonged duration. So as you move from one week to six weeks, you find that the GI adverse events are increasing. And at all level, uh, acyclofenac has lesser GI side effects as compared to diclofenac. So this study is very, very widely quoted uh, study of ours. Then, uh, in uh, continuation with uh, Bits Pilani, uh, which uh, where I met Sajiv Chandran uh, with Dr. Aran Shah, we designed acyclofenac control release because acyclofenac, uh, uh, by the originator, was innovator was giving it twice daily. So we thought that we can have uh, looking at the pharmacokinetic data, we can design uh, once daily preparation, and this uh, pre uh, this drug was done by uh, Dr. Aran Shah, uh, Bits Pilani group, and then. You know, we had this, this is there in the market and this uh, study of, you know, uh, acyclofenic control release was published in the journal of, official journal of American Pain Society, a very, very high index journal. And it was shown that it is, you know, uh, better than tolerated than even acyclofenic uh, plain uh, conventional release tablet. So now that's about, uh, you know, the data about uh, acyclofenic. Today it is... Uh, it is the largest selling oral NSAID and it has replaced uh, all as a major diclofenac as a major drug and uh, after us every other Indian company came out with uh, acyclofenac it comes with the brand name Zerodol and uh, and now it is you know very very widely used not only that Indian companies followed us but even the multinational companies also introduced uh, acyclofenac in the Indian market who are operating in India. So now next uh, innovation coming to is the how uh, uh, clothed on uh, uh, 
very, very old molecule is now in the forefront of hypertension management. So in 2002, December, uh, a very large study, uh, largest hypertension trial till date was published. So this, uh, you know, uh, trial was spons not sponsored by any pharma company. It was sponsored by National Institute of Health, which is equivalent to our ICMR. So National Institute of Health is the one which, you know, uh, uh, drives the research in uh, American universities. So this uh, study was sponsored by uh, the National Institute of Health, where you know four study, uh, four drugs were uh, in uh, were uh, you know comparatively studied in hypertension, and uh, almost 42,400 and odd patients were studied for eight years. They were followed up for eight years. So there was one uh, old drug uh, at that time that is clotheridone, and three new drugs like uh, calcium blocker, amlodipine. Uh, you know, endurance and receptor blocker, listenop, uh, uh, AC inhibitor, lisinopril, and uh, and the third drug was uh, terazosine and alpha blocker. So within two years, the terazosine arm was stopped because of increased heart failure uh, by the data safety monitoring board. So three drugs remained in race, and uh, out of the surprisingly, clotheridone came better than the other two drugs uh, on many uh, cardiovascular endpoints, particularly heart failure. So this is uh, we were the only taker of this uh, uh, study, and then uh, you know uh, uh, for clotheridone and hydrochlorothiazide, which is the drug in use currently, uh, was uh, is very widely used, but now clotheridone is replacing hydrochlorothiazide. So 12.5 milligram is the one which is very very widely used. So people were equating uh, clotheridone and hydrochlorothiazide by the same doses at 12.5 and 25. But uh, the clotheridone is more twice as uh, more potent than uh, hydrochlorothiazide. So, so we were thinking that what is the corresponding dose for clotheridone? So we conceived a 6.25 milligram dose, and uh, we did a series of studies and showed that you know 6.25 milligram is as good as 12.5 milligram hydrochlorothiazide, and this obviously has uh, you know when. You, this gives more option for dose escalation. You can from you can start with 6.25 if the blood pressure is not controlled. You can go to 12.5, and with the lesser does uh, lesser doses, it's the incidence of metabolic adverse effects are much lesser and it's much better tolerated. So we did a study where we showed that it is <coughs> as good as you know uh, other drug 12.5 uh, hydrochlorothiazide, and we published uh, those uh, studies. Combination of atenolol with the low dose clotheridone. Then we did the first uh, combination of angiotensin receptor blocker losartan with clotheridone, and this uh, data I presented at uh, the Jackson Cardiovascular Renal Meeting at University of Mississippi, and we received a new investigative travel award for this uh, research because this first time uh, this combination was there uh, conceived there. Then uh, in the uh, four, uh, uh, last study, what we did was we compared 6.25 clotheridone with 12.5 milligram hydrochlorothiazide by 24 hours ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, monitoring. And we showed that, you know, after 10 o'clock in the night, hydrochlorothiazide loses its antihypertensive efficacy, while clotheridone continues to act because of its longer half-life. So, and uh, it is very important to control the blood pressure during the night time and early morning time when most of the heart attacks and the stroke take place. So, uh, so th that time hydrochlorothiazide is you know not effective. So this uh, uh, this uh, our research was published in the premier journal of Journal of American College of Cardiology. And our study was also referred to in the Canada's 2017 hypertension guidelines. So first time an Indian study being mentioned in a uh, uh, in a foreign country's uh, hypertension guideline. And we also received, so our research was also rewarded and we received a clinical research and excellence award at uh, Boston for this uh, uh, this study among all the multinational small Indian company won this award. And this study also featured in the, uh, the, the textbook of, you know, uh, cardiology, the brown Brownwald's heart disease. And you can see there the 24 hours ambulatory blood pressure monitoring much better controlled with clotheridone as compared to hydrochlorothiazide. So this study appeared in two chapters of this uh, Brownhorst heart disease, which is the, the foremost book in cardiology, which is referred to by all cardiologists. 
so this was the you know second uh, innovation the third i would like to talk about now uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine repurposing done in type 2 diabetes so diabetes and uh, is not not only considered a metabolic disorder now but also there is a chronic low grade inflammation in uh, type 2 diabetes and now it is accepted that inflammation plays a very important role uh, low grade inflammation in both type 2 diabetes and atherosclerosis so there is a link between diabetes uh, type 2 diabetes and inflammation so this is the study how you know in the era of you know big data analytics and all that you say but actually if you are you know little, little bit attentive you can you know look at the major publications and see what is happening around you so on the uh, one hand we had marketed hydroxychloroquine we are marketing hydroxychloroquine rheumatoid arthritis which is you know it is the leader after the approval of hydroxychloroquine rheumatoid arthritis in the disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs so in 2007 uh, i read uh, this uh, reference which appeared in journal of american medical association where what they uh, did was university of Pitt, uh, uh, pittsburgh what they did was they followed up 5000 rheumatoid arthritis patients uh, prospectively for the next 72 years so it was a prospective observational study and they divided patient into three groups those who were not taking hydroxychloroquine rheumatoid patients those who were intermittently taking and those who were taking for four years or more and what they found that if the patient has been taking hydroxychloroquine for four years or more then uh, you know uh, uh, then they, they did not uh, you know uh, develop diabetes so this was very very interesting because with age both type 2 diabetes and hypertension are uh, very very common so uh, you know here the patients are not developing diabetes so almost 77% uh, less risk of being developing uh, diabetes so i was very intrigued by this data so but then this is a prevention uh, of diabetes so that is not easy to uh, you know uh, do by clinical trials you need a long follow up you need a huge patient database so i was in search of whether this drug is also you know uh, can have an uh, anti diabetic effect and i found two small studies where patients who are uncontrolled in them it was demonstrated that this drug lowers uh, this drug uh, you know reduces uh, the glycosylated hemoglobin in patients who are not controlled on various other drugs so that's how we you know did a study where patients who are uncontrolled on metformin and sulfonylurea and they were given one uh, arm was given a pioglitazone the other arm was given hydroxychloroquine and we found it uh, you know lowers the blood uh, the blood glucose to similar levels in addition we also found cholesterol lowering in hydroxychloroquine arm so based on our data the hydroxychloroquine is now approved uh, in type 2 diabetes in india so this is the first anti inflammatory drug to be approved in the management of type 2 diabetes so and then various presentation which we made at american diabetes association and other places we received a new uh, best patent award for this uh, combination of hydroxychloroquine with other anti diabetes drugs by idma these are the uh, data generated on hydroxychloroquine as an anti diabetic uh, agent in combination and then uh, this is a combination with uh, the gliptins dpp4 inhibitor the patent uh, then uh, this is a statin uh, one of the side effects of statin is that it uh, you know accelerates the uh, diabetes also uh, though statins are must for reducing cv risk but we need to be careful because uh, uh, few patients they develop uh, type 2 diabetes when they are prescribed uh, uh, statin so we designed a study where we showed that you know so, uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, in combination with statin as compared to statin alone you reduce the incidence of uh, diabetes so based on our study this uh, we have been granted a patent for hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis and treatment of statin induced diabetes this is the uh, another is that now non alcoholic fatty liver disease and non alcoholic steato hepatitis or nash where still there is no approved drug for this particular indication so we did a experimental study and showed that you know hydroxychloroquine being an anti inflammatory drug it also works in animal models of uh, you know liver cirrhosis uh, preventing liver cirrhosis in these patients of 
non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is the principal cause of cirrhosis and hepatocellular cellular carcinoma. So this is the US patent which we have been granted. So even if you're of, uh, uh, not known, uh, so you, you do not always need NC approach to, uh, you know, a, a disease where there is no therapy. Even the existing drug can work there. So this is our uh, patent in diabetic nephropathy. So we not only have, you know, uh, approval, regulatory approval, but we also patented some of our ideas. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to share with you. Now I would like to call a uh, talk on the last uh, 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 work which we are, uh, the, the current work which we are undertaking. You know, clopidogrel is an antiplatelet drug and it acts by inhibiting the CYP2, uh, uh, inhibiting the platelet uh, receptor, uh, P2 white well uh, platelet receptors. And, uh, you know, but, uh, it is, uh, you know, widely used in the treatment of uh, coronary artery disease and following uh, myocardial infarction in acute coronary syndrome, the drug is very widely used. But uh, clopidogrel is, uh, is a pro-drug and it requires, you know, uh, two-step metabolism to convert into active metabolite. And, uh, you know, we have, uh, Designed a chlor uh, clop de developed a clopidogrel derivative where one step uh, is, uh, is it covers and so patients who are CYP two C nineteen deficient uh, they don't uh, they are not unable to met metabolize uh, clopidogrel so clopidogrel is uh, in, uh, not effective in them as effective in, as compared to people who are not deficient in CYP two C nineteen enzyme so uh, because of this innovation we are able to uh, uh, you know overtake this uh, disadvantage of clopidogrel. So this is where you, you know uh, uh, the concept which we have already proven in you know human phase one study, and uh, the black box warning which is there on clopidogrel is that don't uh, use any other antiplatelet drug if the patient is CYP two C nineteen deficient. So that black box warning will be taken once uh, our drug is you know undergoes entire uh, human uh, drug development cycle. So this is the fourth uh, uh, innovation that we are currently working on. The other Three are already in the market. So besides, I would like to just mention that MNUs for innovation in generics, uh, that you have new formulation, new drug delivery, which I think was covered by Sajeev. Then you need safer drugs, as we said, acyclophenic was based on safety. Uh, you need uh, rational combinations is required, drug repurposing, which we showed up uh, hydroxychloroquine, for example. Then chiral chemistry, where you take out the ineffective uh, uh, an chemical modification of existing drugs as we are doing it in uh, clopidogrel. So uh, generic drug versus new drugs. So like uh, we showed that the, not necessary that all the multinational work on the premise that all new drugs are better than old drugs. But this can be true eight out of 10 times or two out of 10 times if the old drug may be as good as new drugs. So that is how Clotheridone showed not only that it is uh, as good as the other drugs, but it is even better than the newer drugs. So, and traditional medicine. So these are the avenues if somebody wants to, you know, uh, do innovation on the generic part. We have uh, our experience, which I shared with you, some of them, uh, Clotredone 6.25 milligram, acyclophenic control release, Quetiapin SR, we were the first to innovate uh, uh, sustained release formulation there, Zolpidem extended release, Methylphenidate sustained release, Etotolac is only available in, was available in only oral market. So we were the first to innovate come out with the parental etotolic injection. So these are, you know, various, you can have a new doses form, which is not there, like hydroxychloroquine 300 is not there in international market. You can come out with that. So, so, so on and so forth. So there are uh, some of our ideas have been in licensed, uh, out licensed to other Indian companies and the multinational companies. So these are our collaborators, as I said, that Bits Pilani was one of them, CDRI Lucknow, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, National Institute of Malaria Research, uh, the University Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Punjab, Chandigarh, and Indian in in Institute of Pharmaceutical Education, Research, Vardha, where we have carried out our preclinical studies, animal studies there. So I would like to conclude now, integration of pharmaceutical innovation and clinical research can yield new product. And innovation in genetic products is less risky and rewarding. And unlike new drug discovery, innovation on genetic products can be pursued by many Indian companies. IPCA is a mid-sized Indian company, so if, if IPCA can do it, many Indian companies can take this route and you know uh, 
innovate in the products which are of patent. So future direction, the medical department actually predominantly function as support to marketing. So the focus to shift of medical department from marketing support to innovation through validated through clinical research. And this focus shift will help Indian companies to launch next generation uh, generics. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizer. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have, I have finished. Huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing yeah. your wonderful knowledge and experience with us. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Next, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Anil Kairia, sir, Partner Modern Laboratories, Director, Nandini Medical Laboratories, Private Limited, Chairman, Modern Group of Institution, India. I heartily welcome you, sir. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. Uh, the keynote speakers of the day, Dr. Uday Kumar Rakibe, Dr. Sanjeev Chandran, Dr. Anil Parekh, Dr. Rudrubanu Satpati, and all the delegates organizing committee of the event, all the pharma professionals and dear students. It is a great honor and privilege to be here with you all on today's event. It, the Pharma Summit 2022, the Drug Discovery and Community Trial, organized by Association of Pharmaceutical Research. I am delighted to deliver my thanks and best wishes to the organizing committee for organizing such a glorious event. I want to share my slide screen.
Um, whether my screen is visible? Yes, sir, it is visible. The drug discovery is the process through which the potential and new medicines are identified. It involves a wide range of scientific disciplines, including the biology, chemistry, and pharmacology. In today's session, we will discuss some challenges and opportunities associated with drug discovery and development process. This is the drug discovery timeline which I am showing. In the, it's a it's a very uh, the drug discovery is a very complex system, and uh, for every successful medicine finding its way to the market, there are around five thousand to ten thousand compounds that fails necessary test. It takes an estimated around uh, three to five years for the identification of the new compound and its validation. The validation, it means the efficacy, in vitro efficacy we, we check and we identified that these drugs can be developed further, that the assay method is uh, developed and all these things are done. And out of these 5,000 to 10,000 compounds, 250,000 250 compounds were uh, selected. This is the normal system. And in vitro and in vivo toxicology is done. And uh, ADMIT means the absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, and toxicity. So, yes, up. And then the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the drug. So, pharmacokinetics, it means the how the drug is absorbed uh, in the body. And uh, the movement of the, uh, the drug in the body and uh, body's biological response to the drug is the pharmacodynamics. The, during the discovery phase, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic model can be used to identify and select the best drug candidate, which helps to characterize the mechanism of action and disease behavior of the given drug to predict clinical response in the human. And out of these 250 compounds, almost the five compounds they are selected for the clinical trials for phase one, phase two, and phase three studies. The timeline is also given normally when we uh, synthesize the compound, we develop the compound, it takes around three to five years. Then for uh, this preclinical studies, it takes around one to two years. And for clinical trial for phase one, phase two, phase three, it's, it takes around six to seven years. In the clinical trial, these uh, the जो हम perform करते हैं इसके अंदर study कि it, it is for evaluating the medical, surgical and behavior intervention. और um, the actually what we want to see is the uh, new treatment is more effective and less harmful. Jo compound we develop kar rahe hai, wo jis medicine, jis, uh, disease ke liye kar rahe hai, to wo hamesha jada effective ho ya kam harmful ho. Less side effects ho. Ye hota hai. So the phase one trial is, uh, it uh, tests our experimental treatment on a small group of often healthy people and around 20 to 80 to judge the safety and side effects to find out the correct drug dosage. 20 to 80 healthy people are on phase 1 ka trial. Hota hai. 
just to judge, judge the safety of the drug and the side effects of the drug and to find the correct drug dosage form the phase 2 trial it uses more people like 100 to 300 while the emphasis in phase 1 is on safety and emphasis in phase 2 is on effectiveness this phase is aimed to obtain the preliminary data on whether the drug works in people who have certain disease or condition these trials also continues to study safety including the short term side effects this phase can last several years जो फेज टू जो डाटा होता है फेज टू ट्रायल्स होते हैं इसके अंदर जो डिसीज पीपल होते हैं तो उस पीपल दे आर हैविंग दैट सर्टेन डिसीज और कंडीशंस उन्हीं के ऊपर करते हैं एंड कंटिन्यू टू स्टडी कि उसके ऊपर हमारे इफेक्टिवनेस कितनी आ रही है एंड सेफ्टी शॉर्ट टर्म साइड इफेक्ट और कई सारे सालों तक ये फेज टू हम इसको चलाते हैं then what is the phase 3 phase 3 trial gathers the more information about the safety and effectiveness and it study the different populations and different dosages using the drug in combination with other drugs and the number of subject usually ranges from several hundred to around 3000 pupils aur iske baad agar fda agree hota hai and uh, the trial results are positive it will approve the experimental drug on this or device a phase 4 trial for the drug or devices takes place only after the fda approval a device or drug effectiveness and safety are monitored in large diverse population and sometimes the side effects of the drug may not become clear until more people have taken it over a longer period of time and uh, post iske baad after this regulatory approval at this, uh, this post marketing drug surveillance is done and it refers to the monitoring of the drug once they reach to the market after clinical trials it evaluates the drug taken by individuals under a wide range of circumstances over an extended period of time this individual laboratory contributions to the drug discovery and the development bahut sari jo industries uh, jo small laboratories hain they contribute for the drug discovery and even the um, educational institutes they can also contribute in that then these are the involves uh, the target identification like new receptor enzyme pathway protein and other target validations data linking target to human disease finding new molecule chemical or biological then screening assays cell lines animal models and others data on drug like characteristics pharmacokinetics toxicology development tools pharmacodynamic biomarkers including the biochemical assays pet ligands electrophysiological measures and others efficacy measures including this clinical scales cognitive test functional measures self reported outcomes electronic health recording technology to improve efficiency of trial completion recruiting technologies electronic data capture tracking trial simulation safety monitoring and others so these are the many things which the individual laboratory can contribute for the drug discovery and the development now comes the what are the challenges challenges during the drug discovery research now now at times that in there is a decrease in r&d spendings as the percentage of sales kept market potential in this is the major problem in india that r and d expenses they are reducing 
slowed growth of the pharmaceutical market results in decrease in funds available for r&d and the cost of clinical trial process shifts funds away from research and project and these are the some challenges faced by the research product market when once the research product comes into the market so what are the problems the instability of global economics debtors capital expenditure shifts to data mining and computational techniques affects the sale of consumables and instruments complicated intellectual property issues hinder product development so these are the challenges faced by the research product during this pre clinical there are some challenges the several issues must be considered when planning and pre clinical development the technological advancement discovery of new biomarkers the development program for novel investigational compounds such as the nature of the target mode of action the choice of suitable animal model identification of pharmacologically effective dosage level the design of pre clinical proof of concept studies adequate design of toxicological studies in last two animal species that are predictive and for situation in humans so किसी भी ड्रग को तो क्लिनिकल ट्रायल ले जाने के पहले दीज आर दीज सेवरल चेंजेस चैलेंजेस विच द सी आर ओज और द प्राइवेट लेबोरेटरीज और द एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट दे हैव टू परफॉर्म और दे हैव टू वर्क ऑन इट एक्सटेंट ऑफ नॉन क्लिनिकल प्रोग्राम एंड टाइमली कंप्लीस ऑफ इसेंशियल डॉक्यूमेंट्स जनरल कंसिडरेशन रिगार्डिंग क्लिनिकल डेवलपमेंट प्रोग्राम special considerations when planning first in human trial technological advances discovery of new biomarkers and enhancement of pre clinical procedures have improved the pre clinical steps in drug development however the lack of business management is now we over to regarding we basically see that is one major barrier in drug development for academic and industrial scientist so now what are the solution to fund, to fund research project proposed by the scientist normally what happens if the scientist proposes the research um, project and the funds uh, required and normally the company they cut short it so the company has to see and the separate the research fund or grant mechanism should be developed for academic scientist the research should be contracted with established contract research organizations jo research hai jo educational institute hai they should establish the contract with with cro's the principal investigation investigators need to release their ideas and market or contract their ideas to the investors these are the some solutions related to the uh, funds and now the clinical challenges analyze the clinical trial data from 2010 to 17 shows four possible reasons attributed to the 90% clinical failure of the drug development the lack of clinical efficiency almost 50% of the drug they fails in clinical efficiency unmanaged unmanageable toxicity 30% of the drug they they are uh, out because of toxicity poor drug like properties 10 to 15% drugs are uh, out and uh, lack of commercial needs and poor strategic planning the unknown 
pathophysiology from uh, for many nervous systems disorders makes the target identification challenging animal models often cannot recapitulate in the entire disorder or the disease so the har cheez ka animal model is not possible challenges related to the heterogeneity of the patient population might be alleviated with increased clinical phenotyping and endotyping and there is a lack of validated diagnostic and therapeutic biomarkers to objectively detect the measures biological state now what are the solutions select the best best lead drug candidate to achieve adequate clinical efficiency just select the best lead drug candidate to minimize clinical toxicity select bad lead drug candidate with optimal drug like properties optimize strategic planning in the drug development greater emphasis on human data might lead to the improved target identification and validation hospitals need to subsidize research instead of looking to the research dollar as revenue patient clock should start after the uh, patent clock should start after the drug has gone through phase 1 clinical trial because so many patents now they are in the they are uh, in between which are giving the problems for development of the new drug the key point should be the product development not the newness of an idea unfamiliarity with current regulatory process for investigational new drug applications can be resolved through pre ind meetings now the time the challenges for conducting the clinical trials in pandemic time everybody knows the challenges of the drug development for covid 19 are multifactorial apart from the scientific challenges imposed by our limited understanding of sars covid sars virus biological and pathophysiology there are numerous social practical and logistic challenges that necessitate a deviation from standard drug development pathway the first pressure is the time pressure conventional drug research and discovery can easily take decade from the target identification to pivotal phase three clinical trials in this crisis with hundreds and thousands of deaths in just a few months there is simply not enough time for conventional drug discovery and development currently most efforts focused on identifying existing drugs or drugs candidate intended for other indications that may affect efficacy against covid-19 and putting them into accelerated clinical trials by leveraging the pre existing drugs with non pharmacokinetics pharmacological and toxicological data the need for dose finding and toxicological assessments can be reduced repurposing drugs our current knowledge of the molecular and biochemical feature of the sars virus suggests that drug produced for related rna virus that is ebola may also be effective for treating covid-19 the clinical development pathway for an existing drug proposed for a new indication is well understood by regulatory agencies and is relatively brief however the sars virus is new and reproduced and repurposed drug will not be have an undergo research and early development optimization for covid-19 the third is lack of information once a drug candidate is selected the greatest unknowns are 
the dose doses regime and treatment of duration conventionally these are determined in phase 2 trial with the objective of proof of concepts and dose ranging through studying and drug pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics then there is an operational challenges epidemic epidemiological shifts in the disease burden across the globe also complies with the clinical trials covid-19 was first observed in chinese city of wuhan and many clinical trials of repurposed drugs were first performed there however the strict public health efforts reduce the number of new cases from 100 each day to only few in a matter of months it is likely that the future clinical trials of covid-19 will have to be designed as a global trial for this reason the conduct of global clinical trial suffers from need of the sponsor to establish a trial design and that is acceptable to multi level regulatory agencies finally in absence of an accepted global standard for care of covid-19 is a major complication for conducting the global clinical trial now the regulations and approvals clinical trials need to be reviewed on scientific and ethical grounds before they can take place the requirement for review and approval are well established with relatively minor national differences the investigational new drug review and approval process is the standard pathway for drugs entering the clinical phase the review process usually takes a few months and involves national regulatory bodies due to the time pressure fast changing disease accelerated regulatory reviews and approval for ind are required some covid-19 drugs qualify for so called investigational initiated trials which only require local institutional reviews board or ethical committee approval this is a fast process for initiating clinical trials that will be the critical in the crisis but has the risk of poor design without a randomized control group inadequate patient selection and insufficient patient number in investigational initiated trials pre existing drugs are reproduced for covid-19 treatment now it is the integrated approach to reduce the trial failures first is adhere to the translational translational scientific principles the second is the leverage innovative trial design it includes the adaptive platform like multi arm multi stage design prophylactic designs implement four r standards like the right patient right drug right dosage right timing the right patient means the ensure the medications are administered to the correct patient by checking the risk band the right drug the prescription of drug should be clear and legible the generic name not the trade name should be used highlight any antibiotic allergies on the wristband as well as on the drug chart right dosage means take the name of the drug against the dosage of the medication to be administered right time a drug needs to be administered at the appropriate time for effective outcomes just like an antibiotics and the right route the some drugs cannot be administered by oral route like the insulin the others have to be administered iv for 100% bioavailability the conclusion is to overcome the challenges 
associated with the drug discovery and development following solutions can be implemented to change the challenges in the opportunities an increase in the research dollar for pharmaceutical and toxicological studies in dlp compliant laboratory would improve the drug development universities need to invest in making their research lab glp compliant this is the one of the most important thing so that the companies they are not relying on the research done by the universities because the labs of the universities they are not uh, they are not glp compliant a change in the university policy should be needed to uh, a change in the university policies is needed to fast track this evaluation project for patent stability or for releasing the intellectual properties back to the investigators other challenges include refocus refocusing patent law on new um, on in this new product development and changing the patent law to start following phase 1 clinical trial completion these two changes alone can create enormous opportunities for the development of the new drug products the most scientists they are not familiar with the business and regulatory aspect of the drug development and thus the education and experience in these area are very much needed now thank you thank you so much sir for your informative presentation thank you sir any questions from the audience thank you sir thank you okay thank you ma'am we are about to start the technical session 1 for pharmacology and toxicology i would like to welcome the session chair dr satish kumar sarankar sir professor and head faculty of pharmacy mansarovar global university sehor bhopal mp india and dr rokia sultana ma'am professor and hod department of pharmacogenesis you know pia pharmacy college and research center mangaluru india welcome ma'am and sir thank you good morning ma'am now i would like to welcome our presenters nitesh singh jagwan sardar bhagwan singh university india presenting e poster on pharmacological screening and comparative assessment of the effect of him oxygenase one inducer for nephroprotective effect in gentamicin induced nephrotoxicity in rest in rest nitin singh sir are you nitesh singh sir are you present there good morning ma'am can i present ma'am yes sir yes sir please start okay and is my poster visible yes sir it is visible i'm greetings to one and all present myself nitish singh jangwan from the sardar bhagwan singh university india today i'm going to present an e poster entitled as pharmacological screening and comparative assessment of the effects of heme oxygenase one inducer for the nephroprotective effects into the gentamicin induced nephrotoxicity into the rats now starting from the introduction part nephrotoxicity can be defined as a renal disease or a dysfunction that can be caused due to the various of the reason like exposure to the medication industrial or environmental chemicals or due to the various other lifestyle disorder like that of the diabetes or that of hypertension now the center respect for the gentamicin that is abbreviated as the gm 
nephrotoxicity is the tumor cytotoxicity heme oxygenase one is abbreviated as ho1 is a member of the heat shock family of the protein anti oxidant activity of the heme oxygenase one along with its role into the pathogenesis has been well reported into the several literatures protective effects of the heme oxygenase one are included into the git health nervous system cardio renal systems and to the inflammatory responses are well reported now the heme oxygenase one inducers are divided mainly into the endogenous inducer immune alteration or naturally derived now the naturally derived heme inducers includes curcumin resveratrol and to the other compounds in copaisetanol statins and to the rapamycin it's statins that we are further going to use in our research in our research purpose transchalcone is a trans isomer of the chalcone and that form an important biological compound chalcone that are the precursors of the isoflavonoids and to the flavonoids that are generally present into the large amount into the edible plants now the statins are the class of the rate limiting enzymes that generally inhibit the enzyme hmg coa and is a rate limiting enzyme for the cholesterol biosynthesis therefore the present study aims to evaluate the effect of the heme oxygenase one inducers for the nephroprotective effect in the gentamicin induced nephrotoxicity into the rat now heading toward the next section is the are the materials and to the methods animals generally include the adult male bistar rat that is of the 250 to 270 grams reagents generally used are the gentamicin transchalcone and fluvastatins that were procured from the sigma aldrich now the induction of the nephrotoxicity is done by the gentamicin at a dose of the 100 mg per kg given by the oral route for the 21 days now the selection and preparation of the doses fluvastatin is generally prepared as a suspension using 1% of the carboxymethyl cellulose and transchalcone is prepared by dissolving 10% of the twin at in the normal saline the experimental design animals are divided into the eight groups generally consisting of the six animal per groups based on to the calculation of the g power software and receive the following treatment for the 21 days now the eight groups generally entitled as group 1 include the normal controls that receive the community in the saline by the gavage toxicant control 2 includes the gentamicin is given for at a dose of 100 mg per kg per orally now the group 3 4 and to the 5 includes the gentamicin along with the transchalcone at a dose of the 10 mg 20 mg and 40 mg per kg ip respectively 6 7 and to the 8 groups include the gentamicin given along with that of the fluvastatin at a dose of the 10 20 and 40 mg per kg per orally respectively now the parameters generally evaluated in these studies are the biochemical parameters that generally include the albumin creatinine urea and uric acid and to the estimation of the oxidative stress is generally done by the ox um, oxidative stress parameters lpo sod and gsf now heading towards the result part include the graphical representations of the different biochemical parameters are the creatinine albumin uric acid and to the blood urea nitrogen level now the creatinine as we can clearly see into the graphs that the positive controls had the highest number of the highest quantity of the creatinine that is represented into the mg per dl whereas into the treatment group those there are the variation as per the dose dependent effect same at it consists of the albumin the positive control had the lowest amount of the albumin and to the uric acid into the graphical representation represent that the highest amount of the toxicity and to the blood urea nitrogen represent the positive control group has the highest number of highest number of the blood urea nitrogen now have a look at the table of the oxidative stress now the oxidative stress parameters generally include the gsh and to the lpo and to the sod sod and to the gss are the antioxidant parameters and lpo are generally the oxidative stress parameters so we can clearly see there is a sharp increase into the lpo level into the positive control group as compared to that of the treatment and vehicle control group whereas on the country the gsh and to the sod levels are at a higher part are into the higher part into the treatment group as compared to that of the positive control group now all the values represented in the calculations are represented into the form of the mean plus minus standard error of the mean one way and over test was applied followed by the dunets multiple comparison for the statistical analysis now the heading towards the discussion part various biochemical and to the tissue parameters were evaluated by the end of the treatment period transchalcone produces a 
effect at a dose of 10 20 and 40 mg so the significant decrease into the serum creatinine uric acid and to the blood urea nitrogen whereas the significant increase was seen into the albumin level on to the treatment with the transchalco similarly the oxidative stress parameter the gsh and to the sod shows the clear increase into the significant increase into the gsh and to the sod levels into the treatment of the fluvastatin but into the lpo there was a significant decrease fluvastatin treatment at a dose of the 10 20 and to the 40 mg per kg so significant decrease as just like of that of the transchalco there was a significant decrease into the creatinine uric acid and to the blood urea nitrogen level but there was a significant increase into the albumin level the treatment also improved the oxidative stress parameter and to the antioxidant enzyme levels into the nephrotoxic rat on treatment with the fluvastatin fluvastatin on clear visualization we can see from a graph that these show the dose dependent effect generally into the group 6 group 7th and group 8 we show we see a increase or decrease a uh, trajectory based on to the dose dependent because group 6 group 7 and group 8 consist of the 10 20 and to the 40 mg per kg of the fluvastatin now the comparative assessment between the transchalcon and fluvastatin was generally done and it was concluded that both of them are having the significant nephroprotective activity but transchalcon have the slightly higher nephroprotective ex- action based on to the oxidative stress parameters and to the biochemical parameter now here are the list of the references and thank you for everyone for your patient listening thank you sir thank you ma'am any, any questions from the respective judges yeah nitin yes ma'am uh what uh, can you uh, just explain your result in one sentence yes ma'am based on to the comparative assessment between the transchalcon and fluvastatin it was seen that the transchalcon has the slight more significant action in treatment as compared to the fluvastatin but overall there was a improvement into the treatment comparing both the fluvastatin and to the um, other one is the fluvastatin and transchalcon okay fresh chalcon from where you got Mems, it was procured from the Sigma Aldrich. Okay. Okay, fine. Thank you, ma'am. Any more questions from the respective judges? No, madam. We can get, uh, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Moving to the next presenter, I uh, would like to invite uh, Sri Jamia from Iswana Java Kisvili Tamil State University, India. Now, uh, presentation on effect of anti-inflammatory drugs in Alzheimer diseases. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, ma'am, uh, please ask uh, Mr. Nitish to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Okay. So, hello, everyone. I am Srijamya, fifth year MD student from TSU. It's Tbilisi, Georgia. So, my topic for today is effect of anti-inflammatory drug in Alzheimer's disease. So, what is Alzheimer's disease? So, Alzheimer's disease is a complex, multifactorial neurodegenerative disorder, and we know about it. And uh, the elderly. from like 70 per, 60 to 70% are getting affected with alzheimer's disease so it's it's a very hot topic for now to discover drugs uh, for alzheimer's disease as it's a progressive neurodegenerative disorder and for now we don't have such drugs that can uh, totally cure the alzheimer's disease but yes we have some uh, medications that can help in reducing the uh, progress of alzheimer's disease although the pathophysiology of alzheimer's disease is not very clear but considering that there is inflammatory process that goes on al- along with the uh, misfolded proteins like apoe2 apoe4 presenilin and amyloid precursor proteins 
So yes, in the APC for the CT scan and MRI in AD patients, we see that there is narrowing of gyri, widening of the sulcus, and there would be cortical atrophy widespread, uh, it would be, and there would be enhanced atrophy in the hippocampus. Okay, so objective, as I told that is to study the effective of effect of different uh, anti-inflammatory drug therapy in Alzheimer's disease. Methodology would be immune-based biomarkers and imaging techniques are used in the initial stages to understand the target of the therapy first. And the population would be, would be might 80 patients. Although there, there are three uh, novel drug therapies that are uh, right now uh, going on in these studies, they, they are anti-amyloid therapy, which includes uh, several drugs, then anti-tau therapy and anti-inflammatory therapy. And uh, there are different targets and working mechanism for all of these three. Mostly these uh, uh, drugs are in the cl uh, clinical trial too, and some of the drugs are still in the uh, trials on animals. So if uh, these uh, drugs are like leading towards like clinical human clinical trials, in that case, the effectiveness of drug therapy must be checked through imaging techniques with analyzing of brain changes and serum immune markers. Okay, so what is anti-amyloid therapy? So in this, there are Next three drugs, they are secretase inhibitors, then A-beta immunotherapy and A-beta aggregation inhibitors. So coming to this uh, secretase inhibitors, so secretase inhibitors target uh, the catalytic activities of beta secretase and gamma secretase. So they, uh, these are these both uh, are the uh, enzymes are the rate limiting step in A-beta production. Coming to the A-beta immunotherapy, it is like disrupting the interaction between A beta peptides and metals uh, that provides a barrier against A beta uh, oligomerization. Why coming down to these metals? Because A beta immunotherapy is not helping, like they are very small molecules, they are not helping totally uh, remove the A beta uh, you know, peptides. So, therefore, metals are used in, along with this um, um, immunotherapy to remove more, um, to uh, keep more barrier that helps in. Um, uh, like reducing the oligomerization. Then uh, A-beta aggregation inhibitors. In this, uh, also there is more uh, uh, drugs that are being prepared, but still it's not very uh, clearly done. And in the immunotherapy, one more thing is there that they are giving passive and active uh, 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 vaccinations. It's still vaccinations are leading towards a lot of side effects in the uh, transgenic mice, so they are not yet uh, cleared for human clinical trials. Now coming to the anti-tau therapy, we have uh, again uh, five drugs in this. They are phosphatase modifiers, then kinase inhibitors, then tau uh, aggregation inhibitors, then microtubule inhibitors, and tau immunotherapy. So coming to the uh, phosphatase modifiers, it decreases phosphorylation by acting Activating uh, phosphatases such as uh, protein phosphatase 2A. So, clinical trials are still going on in this, and uh, there was no side effects yet. But the, uh, the problem with it is that the, they are leading, uh, they are not very effective for a very long period of time. They are effective for just like uh, a span year. Then, coming to the kinase inhibitors, they decrease post translational modifications and limit the hyperphosphorylation of tau that. Uh, uh, to, uh, that helps in uh, reducing the neurotoxicity because tau uh, proteins uh, increase the neurotoxicity. Now coming to the tau aggregation inhibitors. So there are two aluminium uh, chloride and uh, it is um, like for now there is no proper uh, in the uh, third phase uh, double blind uh, clinical trial, it was shown that, it, in, especially in the mild to moderate AD, it showed that there was no pro, uh, clear uh, improvement in the cognitive or, uh, or cognitive or functional performance. But yes, if we see that in the cognitive healthy elderly, there is a proper bioavailability and the, uh, uh, some of the uh, if we use curcumin. So, uh, formulation of curcumin helped uh, help in the working memory for a short period of time. But as, uh, but just for six months. So, therefore, it's still more drugs are.
Hello. Yes, you continue. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, coming to the uh, micro tubule stabilizers, we have epothelon uh, D, which induces tubulins polymerization into micro tubules and enhances micro tubule bundling. That she, that was seen in vitro, and uh, it was. Uh, but the problem with this micro tubule uh, stabilizers was that uh, there was an intolerable side effects that was seen in transgenic mice. So this. Uh, this uh, was stopped and there were more modifications, modificational studies were going on to improve this uh, and get some better drug. Then coming to the tau immunotherapy, then yes, we have humanized IgG4 monoclonal antibodies, again, active and passive immunization, and they have shown a good effect on uh, cognition. So maybe this could go further and more uh, clinical trials may, may be helpful in getting better results and understanding the drug. Uh, 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 and the uh, efficacy and safety. Okay, so then we have anti-inflammatory therapy in which there is microglia modulators, astrocyte modulators, insulin resistance management, and microbiome uh, therapy. So coming to the microglia modulators, because these are the one that uh, that are in, very much involved in, in neuroinflammation. So there was a uh, uh, CSF1R pathway that drives microglial proliferation. So there was selective CSF1R uh, inhibitors that were applied in transgenic AD modulators, uh, AD mice, and they showed a good result and reduced inflammation. Now coming to the astrocyte modulators, the astrocyte uh, reaction impairs the clearance of the A beta uh, at the blood brain barrier. So there was mitogen activated kinase inhibitors as there are many uh, signals uh, and pathways that work in the astro uh, astrocyte uh, um, uh, reaction, but one of them is mitogen activated kinase. So uh, we, uh, the, the drugs uh, were made on that uh, inhibitors, uh, on these enzymes like um, uh, MAC inhibitors, they blocked tau phosphorylation and rescued cognitive impairment, um, especially in aged uh, tau, uh, hyperphosphorylated tau mice. And there was decreased A beta deposits that was seen and decreased neuron death was seen and improved cognitive functions were there. Still, it's needed to for further clinical trials. And there were no such side effects. Then coming to the insulin therapy, now insulin resistance management. Okay, so in the AD, we, uh, it, it sometimes, it, in the, some studies, it has shown that deficits in cerebral glucose utilization uh, is very much in, in, included, uh, is like involved in progressive cognitive impairment. And that that is one of the cause for the AD. So there was so many drugs that we use for the insulin, um, and like in diabetes mellitus. So the drugs that were used were uh, GLP, then uh, GLP is gluco gluco uh, glucagon-like peptide one. And uh, then we also use GIP, glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, and uh, which was uh, liraglutide. And even metformin and paroxysm proliferator activator receptors, that is PARS. Uh, so in that uh, was pioglitazone. So all all were effective, but only for a year span. But yes, if we uh, there were some drugs that uh, that uh, were used, and it was like hybrid PARS that showed a great reduction in neuroinflammation. Then coming to the microbiome therapy. So yes, um, gut microbes show a great uh, effect on our cognition. And this has been proved. So uh, if we improve the gut microbe, uh, microbe functioning, so that can also help in reducing uh, inflammation and also in uh, uh, like enhancing the cognitive cognition in AD. So there, is, there, there was one drug that was for, uh, prepared. It was sodium oligomanate. It was a marine-derived oligosaccharide, and that suppresses gut microbiota dysbiosis. And it regulates neuroinflammation and destabilizes A beta aggregates. So uh, this um, sodium oligomanate was approved in China in 2019 for mild AD. So according to the expected outcomes, um, these uh, these are like in, in anti amyloid therapy. It helps in neuro uh, reduction in neurotoxicity. And yes, it works in, on the three strat strategies. We talked about secretase, A beta aggregation, and immunotherapy. 
Then in anti tau therapy, there was a modification of phosphatase, reducing the phosphorylation and aggregation. And there was microtubule stabilizers also, but still no successful results have been seen. And the therapy that includes immunotherapy um, for aggregated neurofibrillary uh, tangles. In the anti neuroinflammatory therapy, we saw that there was microglia modulators improvement. Uh, they showed improvement in different types of memory in transgenic mice. It was emotional, it was cognition. Um, there were so many different uh, things that happened. And even in the spatial memory, uh, it, there was improvement. And insulin drugs also showed a good response, but yes, for a limited year span. And enhancing the gut microbes showed good response in mild AD. These were my major uh, references. Um, uh, there were so many other references also, but these were the major. Thank you. Uh, Shri Jamya, uh, why did you choose uh, this topic that effect of anti-inflammatory drugs? Means, uh, the, you have told number of uh, ways for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, but in your topic only anti-inflammatory uh, okay. drugs. Yes, sir. So it uh, the topic was anti-inflammatory because Alzheimer's disease is itself inflammatory disorder. Uh, along with neurocognitive uh, neurodegenerative disorder and these three types of drugs uh, all these three types of drugs are involved in anti-inflammatory response so uh, in including only the uh, subtitle like uh, subtitle uh, title like anti-inflammatory drugs that were just under that uh, that i talked about was not enough so uh, including all these three novel therapies were important and they all are involved in anti-inflammatory response. Okay. Any more questions from the respected judges? Srijanya, can you summarize your result? Okay, so ma'am, uh, since uh, since uh, 90s, in 1990s... I want it very short. Very short, I want. So ma'am, in and, uh, Alzheimer's disease, we are all working on like just uh, symptomatic relief and we have just uh, accepted that it is it is a progressive disorder. But if we, are, if we would work on the root cause, the root cause are like amyloid deposit, deposits and ne neurotoxicity. So if we, uh, and of course it would lead to neuroinflammation. So if we reduce that thing, inflammation and the aggregation of the proteins that can help in reducing and maybe uh, we would some uh, after some years we can get the cure of alzheimer's disease so these were the novel therapies that we are working on like especially researchers are working on so this is your project right yes ma'am okay so we hello am i audible yes ma'am yes you asked something um, yeah Sorry, ma'am, can you... You are working, you are working on? Ma'am, actually, I'm a medical student, fifth year. Okay, 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 fine. Okay, good. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Any more questions? I... I would like to ask the organizing committee, is there any time limit for presentation? Uh, yes, ma'am. Eight minutes for a uh, uh, presentation that will be there. Two okay. minutes questionnaire and eight minutes uh, of presentation. Okay, fine. Thank you so much, ma'am. Can we move to the next presenter, ma'am? Sure, sure. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I would like to invite uh, uh, Himani Joshi, ma'am for e-poster presentation on to evaluate the anti-diabetic potential of an allopolyhybrid herbal formulations on steroidine induced diabetic reds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mani ma'am, are you present there? Himani ma'am? Uh, yes, ma'am. I am audible. Yes, yes. You are audible. Okay.
Let's start. Good morning, all of you. My name is Mani Joshi. I am from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, Uttarakhand, India. Uh, today, the e poster topic is uh, to evaluate the anti diabetic potential of an allopolyhybrid formulations on streptozotocin induced diabetic rats. First of all, here comes to the introduction. Diabetes mellitus is an endocrine disorder characterized by hyperglycemia and alteration in fat, carbohydrates, and protein metabolism that leads to the decrease in both insulin secretion and insulin action. The estimated data shows that more than 200 million people worldwide have diabetes mellitus and more than 300 million will subsequently have the disease by the year 2025. It may be characterized by several types, but the two major types are type 1, that is known as insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus, and type 2, that is non-insulin-dependent diabetes mellitus. Currently available therapies include insulin and various oral anti-diabetic agents, such as sulfonyl UDRs like lipizide, glycoside, bigunites like uh, metformin that works by suppressing the glucose by liver and alpha glucosidase inhibitors like acarbos. Allopolyherbal can be defined as the composition of allopathic drug and polyherbal preparation. In this research, metformin is used as the allopathic drug and the polyherbal preparations such as Berberis aristata, chitri, fagonia swanforti, hydate, and refinus sativus, radish, were used. From the literature survey, it was found that the plants are used as traditional herbal medicines to treat diabetes mellitus. Traditionally, they also exhibit antioxidant activity. Now, secondly, here comes to the methods. First of all, extraction of different plants through succulation methods were done by using the different solvents such as methanol and ethanol. Then the phytochemical screening of the different plant extracts have been performed. Uh, it has seen this alkaloids, flavonoids, and triterpenoids. Now, secondly, the preparation of the polyherbal and allopolyherbal formulations was done. Then the induction of diabetes, streptozotocin, 65 mg per kg. Uh, now the following groups were divided. First group was normal control. That was given normal saline. Second group was diabetic control. Third group was standard, uh, metformin was given 200 mg per kg. Group fourth was the polyherbal formulation, 300 mg per kg. Group fifth was allopolyherbal formulation A, that is Barbaris aristata, uh, that is uh, 300 mg per kg. Uh, group uh, sixth is allopolyherbal formulations B, that is Fagonia squanfirti. In this, the uh, 100 mg per kg metformin and 180 mg per kg polyherbal was done. Uh, group 7 is allopolyherbal formulation C, that is refinus sativus, 40 mg per kg metformin, and 240 mg per kg polyherbal was given. Then the evaluation of various parameters like uh, physical parameters, body weight, cholesterol, LDL, HDL, LPO, SOD, and GSH has been evaluated. Now here comes to the results. The graph shown below uh, evaluated that the body weight was evaluated on zero day, seventh day, 14th day, and 21st day. And the following tables indicate that the uh, parameters, levels, cholesterol, LDL, HDL, LPO, SOD, and GSH on the several groups. Now, at last, I concluded that from this data, allopathic formulations exhibit the significant and consistent hypoglycemic effect. And the allopolyherbal formulation A, that is Barbaris aristata, has been proved to be most effective out of all these formulations. Allopolyherbal formulations significantly reduce the elevated levels of body weight, cholesterol, LDL, and elevation in HDL level. 
with respect to its antioxidant levels allopolly herbal formulation showed a significant reduction in the lpo level and the elevation of sod and gsh level thus it could be suggested that allopolly herbal formulation with its free radical scavenging property has antioxidant and anti diabetic property in this model thank you hello yes ma'am yeah uh, what is the purpose why you have made allopolly herbal ma'am to check the both allopathic and the poly herbal formulations is effective in anti diabetic property or not combination of the proved right the allopathic drug is already proved right sorry the yes, computer mein aa rahi hai awaaz this allopathic uh, formulation that made for men it's already proved right it is having anti diabetic property yes ma'am is already proved then why you have added in the herbal formulation ma'am to check that it's a herbal formulation so also that it effective like allopathic or not both the combinations no but uh, it is already there no how you will prove again ma'am uh, toxicity ko decrease karta hai that's why which is having toxicity what toxicity you are targeting ma'am the because the herbal formulations also decrease the toxicity yeah but which toxicity you have to target no the toxicity of metformin this will be our something should be suppressed by the herbal drugs that has to be targeted right do you have some uh, literature review where the similar studies is done ma'am yes i have the literature reviews where allo herbal formulations are used yes ma'am which drug yeah it's a good and interesting study i can see but uh, yes ma'am i just wanted to know whether you have got some other reference similar studies and what purpose they are combining the allopathic drug and herbal formulation so good study thank you thank you thank you ma'am any more questions from the respected judges ma'am can we move to move to the next presenter with your permission sure yes, sure thank you ma'am i would like to invite hardik pawar sir from parul uh, institute of pharmacy and research india oral presentation on traditionally used kada as phytochemical and pharmacological re uh, review hardik sir am i audible to you yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah please share your screen And is it as audible? Visible? Yes, sir. You are audible. No screen is not visible yet, sir. You are audible.
Erdoğan da olsun, Erdoğan da işe başlıyor. Maybe is it now visible? Yes, it is visible. Good afternoon, all of you. Myself, so please put it on the slideshow. If it is possible, put it on the slideshow. It would be okay. better. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon, all of you. Today, I'm here to present a new article on CARDA, is part of chemical and pharmacological action. As many of us know that we daily you daily do yogas and any, any breathing exercise to boost our immune system or use any natural remedies such as herbal teas or drinks. The CARDA is one of the best uh, example of the herbal remedies which we use in our daily life. Like the these are some ingredients which we commonly use. The recipe of kada uh, is different in different places as it depends on the individual. But these are the some common ingredients which we use in our day, in the daily use of kada. This is a method which we use to prepare, a simple method to which we use to prepare a kada. So now we'll, I will explain the normal phytochemical present in these ingredients like the honey. Honey is, is the normal product which we know this is, it is a sticky viscous food product which is made uh, found in a honeycomb which is by, prepared by a honeybees the the no, normal raw honey is contains many antioxidants these antioxidants are used to uh, block the free radical free radical are the the antioxidant blocks the free radical by giving its electron its free electron to free radical which is which blocks the uh, which block its uh, chain reaction by blocking it. Cell damage which have been related to the acceleration of aging process as well as the progression of chronic diseases such as cancer and heart diseases. And is also used for digestive problems. Like it is proven that it is an effective treatment like helicobacter pylori bacteria which causes the ulcer in the stomach. And is also an excellent prebiotic which nourishes a good bacteria present in our stomach which has been used for the digestion of our food. Many research has proven that honey helps in maintaining the healthy immunity. It, it, is, it, is, it is rich in antioxidants. This free radical moves freely into a body for searching for spare oxygen molecule to make the stable and in the this process they cause damage to our cells, tissue and DNA, which include the cell and tissue of our immune system. This damage the lead leads to a condition known as oxidative stress that leads to chronic diseases. This high amount of antioxidant in honey helps to prevent harm to immune system. Honey also used to produce the uh, blood cells like T and B cells which have been used as a killer cells which are important in our immune system which makes our immune system strong. The flavonoids and the polyphenols are the two major bioactive molecules which are present as antioxidant in the honey. Basil. The basil is the second ingredient. Now, basil is, we all know it's present in central. These are the some, how it is present in all. The health benefits of basil. The basil also used as in treatment of fever. The essential oil and the phytonutrient are the main reason for the healing properties of basil. Basil is an effective germicidal antibiotic disinfectant and fun fungicidal that protects our body from fungal, viral, and bacterial infection. Fever is caused by bacteria, protozoa, fungus, or viral infection. Basil destroys these pathogens and thus cures us from the fever. Treatment. It also used in treatment of cough. Basil is also used to cure cough. It smoothens the lungs, prevents pain in the lungs, and aids in the mucus exploration. Basil contains this caffeine, cineol, and eugeniol, which can exist in the colds and chest congestion. It also helps to boost immunity. Basil is a natural immunity booster that helps to keep the body free from infection. 
it also used to activate the key helper cell which are as i already said it is a uh, cell present to which is important for make our immune system strong this cell has a lot of antibacterial anti viral anti fungal property which helps in protecting us from large variety of infection it is also used to reduce the blood pressure the osimumoside a and b are the compound which are found in basil that helps to relieve stress and balance the neurotransmitter serotonin and the dopamine in the brain these are the neurotransmitter present in our brain it also cure the heart heart health benefits basil lowers the blood lipid content helps in suppressing the ischemia and stroke and reduces the hypertension thus providing the itself effective in treating the prevention cardiovascular diseases it also used for diabetic patient the basil leaves is effective in lowering blood glucose level in patient with type 2 diabetes it is in treatment of kidney stones basil helps in detoxifying the body and also possesses the diuretic properties it aids in the reduction of uric acid levels in the body which is primary cause the kidney stone development patients suffering from gout will also benefit from the drop of uric acid levels in our body the third is cinnamon cinnamon comes from the inner bark of the variety of cinnamon tree based species as we all know this the essential oil in cinnamon contains the cinnamal diad as well as a lot of other compounds including eugenol and which provides the fragrance and flavor cinnamon refers to variety of tree species this is a normal cinnamon is rich in polyphenol which are the strong antioxidants anti inflammatory properties of cinnamon it has in battle against the infection and repair the tissue damage it is directed towards the body tissue when there is a chronic inflammation however it may it may become a problem cinnamon may be useful in this situation as per the studies potent anti inflammatory properties and antioxidant property present in cinnamon are good in this treatment the risk of heart disease it is as per studies the 1 gram of cinnamon every day is is seen to be a useful for individual suffering from type 2 diabetes it lowers the total cholesterol bad ldl that is the low density lipid protein are cholesterol and triglyceride while maintaining a good hdl cholesterol levels recent analysis study says that this effect are caused by daily use of 120 gram of cinnamon powerful anti diabetic effect of cinnamon the insulin sensitivity can be improved by cinnamon insulin is a hormone that controls the metabolism of metabolism and energy expenditure insulin resistance is a sign of serious illness including metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes cinnamon has the ability to lower blood sugar level by rising insulin sensitivity as described in the following section it is a accomplish this by interacting with the variety of digestive enzyme delaying the breakdown of carbohydrate in our intestines the effective doses of cinnamon is in normal daily life is 1 to 6 gram a day around 0.25 to 2 teaspoons low cloves are the aromatic oil and the stimulate the irritant impact cloves are the boost cloves and can be used to boost blood circulation and slightly increase the person's temperature flow will help the saliva and gastric juice to flow freely which helps in our digestion cloves have a long history of medicinal use in notably for to take the mouth and throat in inflammation eugenol and a primary compound of clove oil has the antimicrobial activity against gram positive gram positive gram and gram negative bacteria Cloves are also known for their anti-nematic and carminative properties. It is also used in treatment of nausea. Clove is clove tea has a distinct taste and fragrance that can cause a nausea, a cure the nausea. The best thing about drinking clove tea is how easily it relieves nausea and leaves you with a fresh air. In reality, chewing a clove every every day, then it is the best breath mint ever, and it helps to prevent nausea and heart. bonds anti inflammatory benefits of clove according to chemical analysis there are 36 distinct ingredients present in clove eugenol is the most important of them clove also contains a number of flavonoids which aid in the anti inflammatory effect of the spice clove oil is often used in aromatherapy to relieve the effect of 
rheumatism and arthritis analgesic benefits of clo clo oils analgesic property can be used to treat number of dental issue including toothache the clo oil is also used to treat sore gums and improve the overall health of in general lemon the many phytochemical and antioxidant anti inflammatory anti tumor and anti bacterial property are known to be present in bioactive compounds lemon is the most acidic of all the citrus fruit with ph of 2.3 health benefits of lemon these are the natural energizer balances ph estimates unwanted toxins from the body aids in weight loss boost immunity abolishes acne immune system is boosted by lemon lemon contains a lot of vitamin c which helps to improve the immune system when you are stressed your vitamin c level is one of the first thing to drop which is why the expert suggest taking extra vitamin c particularly in, particularly in the stressful days it helps to prevent cancer also lemon is well known for its high content of multi purpose flavonoids compound which protects your body from various cancers lemon juice when consumed on a regular basis helps to prevent cancerous cells from forming ginger ginger's phytochemistry is known for the health promoting properties the ginger contains a lot of active ingredients including the phenolic and terpenoid compound the ginger's phenolic compounds include gingerols sugars and paradols impact of antioxidant stress some free radicals that are produced during the oxidative oxidation process are required for energy production oxidative stress is caused by an increase in the free radical production which is which can lead to dna damage in vitro and in vivo experiment have been conducted to investigate an anti oxidative effects of ginger and its components the six six sugar has a most potent antioxidant anti inflammatory effect in ginger owing to its existence of alpha beta and unsaturated ketone ketone moiety around the same time have ginger 1% in a, your diet according to finding finding of one study both ginger and cucumin especially fresh ginger have the high antioxidant potential anti inflammation properties ginger gingerol and sugar and and other structurally related compounds in ginger inhibits the prostaglandin and leukotriene biosynthesis by suppressing phi lipo oxygenase by prostaglandin synthesis this can also inhibit the pro inflammatory cytokines like il1 th tnf alpha and il8 from being processed anti cancer effect ginger contains anti inflammatory anti 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 tumorigenic ingredients such as gingerol sugar and pepper the manju and nalini investigated the effectiveness of ginger in treatment of dmh induced colon cancer ginger can also cure breast cancer by inhibiting cell adhesion invasion motility according to the, according to lee l gingerol can effect the prostate cancer model by modifying the protein involved in the apoptosis pathway i conclude here that the kada is a natural ayurvedic drink made with herbs and spices in ayurvedic combination of several ingredient element has been shown to help improve the immune system kada is an herbal mixture that contains the variety of ingredients and elements that can help to boost immunity these are the ingredients which commonly used these herbs and spices according to ayurveda have some immune boosting properties as well the other healing compounds as a result including this drink in your daily diet can help you to stay healthy and lower your risk from the other infections herbs and spices are the great great because unlike medication you can simply add them to your favorite dishes to add flavors while also improving your immune system the herbal drinks is said to increase the digestion and detox the body in addition to giving the immunity to boost the tackle infection when the body is suffering from other allergies the herbs and spices used in this drinks can extremely good to boost your immune system these are the some references which i have been used thank you thank you sir any questions from the respected judges harshik yes ma'am 
Uh, you have done the review of uh, different method of preparation of kada, right? No, I have review on the uh, simple method to prepare kada. Especially, I have been done review on the ingredients which are having phyto benefit to in, used in kada. Ingredients which is having different phyto constituents, right? Yeah, yeah, which is being used to boost our immune system. Which way it is going to help us? This review, how it is going to help uh, in research? Ma'am, there means uh, we use the different ingredients in the card. The, they are having any uh, any antioxidant and uh, immune boosting properties. So we. Yeah, this, this ingredients are well known, right? Yes, and it commonly. has been used in the long years, and everybody is knowing it. Yes. So your review, which way it is going to help in research? And we can use this extract in our medication to without uh, causing toxins. If you have done the review and different method of preparation, and if you have uh, given one uh, this thing that this method is the best method, or this method can be done in this ratios, it can be helpful. So this would have been helpful for any research, but you are just giving the information what is already available, right? Okay. Right? Yes. What is what is the conclusion? One sentence of your uh, review. Uh, Ma'am, in one sentence that we can use the uh, card we can use in a daily daily basis to boost our immune system without taking other further medication at all in our daily life. Okay. Okay, thank you. So can we move to the next presenter with your permission? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to invite Sonali, ma'am, for presentation, e-poster presentation from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, India. Uh, topic to evaluate the hepatoprotective potential of leaf extract of ulnus nephalinus on hepatotoxic models of red. So yes, Sonali, ma'am, am I audible yes. to you? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sonali Rawat from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, Balawala, Dehradun, India. In this study, uh, this study is based on hepatoprotective potential of Alnus nepalensis leaf extract in red. Many things are responsible for liver damage, like secondary metabolite of drug, excessive alcohol consumption, genobitics, and some diseases condition. Uh, these all uh, compounds affect uh, cytochrome P450, which is important for detoxification of foreign chemicals and metabolism of drug. Uh, mitochondrial respiratory chain. If any defect in mitochondrial respiratory chain, chain is, uh, it causes liver failure. Glutathione as, uh, acetyl transferase. It is an uh, antioxidant enzyme play key role in detoxification and bioactivation. Uh, reaction and mitochondrial permeability translation pore in a uh, protein is a protein and that is found in inner membrane of mitochondria. In the body, liver regulate various physiological functions like carbohydrate, protein and fat metabolism, storage of vitamins, secondary uh, secretion of bile, uh, detoxification, etc. Alcohol is, a, uh, is also continuously uh, detoxify by uh, liver. So excessive alcohol intake destroy liver cells and cause fatty liver, alcohol, hepatitis and uh, cirrhosis. Certain chemicals like acetaminophen, carbon tetrachloride cause liver damage. 
it uh, in this model hepatotoxicity induced by uh, carbon tetrachloride and ethanol carbon tetrachloride convert into uh, ccl3 and uh, oxygen free radical in uh, in the presence of cyp2 e1 enzyme uh, these free radicals activate inflammatory and uh, pro uh, pro uh, fibrogenic uh, mediators which cause lipid peroxidation and uh, liver fibrosis which are responsible for liver injury two time uh, two enzymes alcohol uh, dehydrase and cyp2e1 uh, metabolize the alcohol in liver they convert alcohol to toxic substance acetaldehyde as uh, some uh, some acetaldehyde interact with protein and activate immune cells which produce cytokines like interferon gamma interleukins tumor necrosis factor alpha uh, these all cytokines Uh, it, uh, these all cytokines, uh, reactive oxygen species, and accu accumulate uh, in mitochondria. Available drug, which is uh, used in liver disorder, also cause further liver damage. So herbal drug uh, drugs become popular for treatment of liver disease. Elnis nepalensis, also called piak in Hindi, is a tree used for fire and uh, as a medicinal uh, plant. Elnis nepalensis, also co uh, called piak, in this study, uh, the plant collect from uh, Kathmandu Valley. Traditionally, it is used in this is uh, in for uh, treatment of various diseases like diarrhea, stomach ache, uh, hemostatic, and as a anti-emetic. The plant contain flavonoid, tannins, flavones, uh, phenols, steroids, etc. In this study, adult Vista reds are used. Hepatotoxicity induced by 1 mg per kg CCL4 and 2 ml 1 ml per kg CCL4 and 2 ml per kg ethanol per oral and uh, period of 28 days. Uh, two extract of uh, same plant, ethanolic extract and N hexane extract, prepare in twin 80 solution. Animals were divided in eight groups, each uh, group having six animals. Group one received normal saline. Uh, group two received a two ml per kg ethanol. Uh, group three received one ml per kg CCL4. Uh, group two and group three uh, refers to positive control groups. Group four received one ml per kg leave 52 with uh, CCL4. Uh, CCL4 is an inducer. And uh, leave 52 is a standard drug. Group five received N hexane extract of Elnis nepalensis uh, leaves 500 mg per kg with CCL4. Group six, uh, six received ethanolic extract of uh, e ethanolic extract of uh, plant leaves 500 mg per kg with CCL4. Uh, group six received N hexane extract of plant leaves. 500 mg with ethanol and a uh, group eight received ethanolic extract of plant leaves uh, 500 mg per kg with ethanol in this study uh, we evaluate the level of sgot uh, sgpt bilirubin and other oxidative parameters like lpo and sod ast aspartate amino transferase measure the level of enzyme in the blood a uh, high level of AST in, is a sign of liver damage. In this graph, the level of AST increase in positive control group, decrease in normal group at a 28 day. Ethanolic extract uh, more effective than n hexane extract. LNS, uh, sorry, LNN uh, transamine is also used for measuring liver damage. At the end of the study, uh, ethanolic extract was more effective than n hexane extract. The level of bilirubin also decreased by the plant extract as compared to toxic com uh, control group. Uh, SOD, superoxide dismutase, uh, which is a uh, oxy, uh, which is an antioxidant, uh, which is reduced uh, in disease condition. Ethanolic extract of plant leaves is more effective than an hexane extract. LPO, lipid peroxidation, is increased in disease condition. And hexane uh, extract of plant leaves decrease the level of LPO as compared to ethanolic extract. Uh, now, uh, conclusion. 
this uh, uh, the conclusion of uh, this whole study is uh, an hexane extract is less effective than ethanolic extract of plant leaves and uh, there are some references thank you My first question is why you have chosen uh, ethanol and inhexane as the solvent for extraction? Ma'am, for compare, uh, which is uh, more effective? Uh, which extract is more effective? No, but why ethanol and inhexane? Inhexane is highly nonpolar solvent, whereas yes, ethanol is highly polar solvent. Yes, so ma'am. Two, two different uh, types of solvent you have chosen. Why? Yes, ma'am. Why you have chosen? Ma'am, uh, according to literature review, uh, uh, Alnus nepalensis uh, leaves are um, more effective. Uh, we have found out that uh, Alnus Alnus nepalensis leaves, uh, which is effective in uh, ethanolic extracts. So. Okay, ethanol I can understand because you are also telling the constituents like tannins, flavonoids, those things are present. But I'm not understanding why you have chosen n hexane. Uh, because uh, previous study is not uh, in hexane, n hexane, that's why. You know what? Uh, you cannot choose like that. If that is the case, you can choose all the series. You can go for successive solvent extraction using non-polar to polar, all the solvents, and then you can do a comparison, which is better. Suddenly, okay. one from the non-polar, one from the polar, you cannot do that. Okay? Okay, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. One, and one more is, why you have used CCL4? Now, this uh, CCL4 is already, it's a hepatotoxic substance. It is not yes, been now, but why you have used this? Ma'am, uh, uh, for comparative study, uh, uh, which is uh, more induced, uh, more toxic than in this uh, in hepatotoxicity no but you have other methods also i think ccl4 you should not use now it is not been used since ccl4 is very toxic highly toxic substance yes ma'am ma'am that's why uh, ccl4 is using 1 ml per kg no but you should not use what are the other methods that are available uh, ma'am uh, uh, paracetamol toxicity and uh, ethanol to alcohol toxicity no, I'm talking about your hepatoprotective uh, model. Sorry, ma'am, I can't understand. No, you have used the model, right? Yes, ma'am. What, what is the model? Sorry. We have used the CCL for induced hepatoprotective model, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So for the induction of the hepatotoxicity of use CCL4, instead of yes. CCL4, can you use other substance? Yes, ma'am. Paracetamol, uh, we can use paracetamol. Have you heard about streptojetosin? Yes, ma'am. Streptojetosin. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any more questions from the respective judges? No, madam. Uh, uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I uh, would like to invite uh, Nikita and everyone, uh, ma'am, from Jamia Hamdard, India, uh, e poster presentation on high fat diet induced diabetic osteoporosis in C57 BL6 mice is elevated with the combinations of lingopeptine and mef Metformin. Nikita, ma'am, are you present there? Yes, ma'am, please carry on. Nikita, ma'am, are you there?
Ma'am, can we move to the next one with your permission, please? Yes, if C is not there, so we can move on it. Yeah, thank you, sir. I'd like to invite Medha Sharma, ma'am, from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, India. He posted a presentation on evaluation of anti-diabetic effect of combinations of onion and garlic juice on in, uh, STZ-induced diabetic rats. Yes, ma'am. Share your screen. Is it feasible, ma'am? Yes, yes, it is visible. Please proceed. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Medha Sharma. I'm a student of MPharm Pharmacology and uh, from Siddhar Bhagwan Singh University. Today, my topic is evaluation of anti-diabetic effect of combination of onion and garlic juice on streptojotipsid induced diabetic rate. So firstly, the diabetes. Diabetes is a metabolic disorder which is characterized, like, uh, characterized by uh, hyperglycemia, glycosuria, hyperlipidemia, negative oxygen balance, and ketonemia. So diabetes mellitus is a gathering of metabolic sickness portrayed by the raised blood glucose level uh, hyperglycemia coming about the because of deformities in insulin discharge insulin activity or both diabetes mellitus is a dysfunction brought on by total non-attendance of insulin which showed clinically as a lifted blood glucose level insulin is produced <clears throat> produced by the beta cells uh, isolate of lingerhands uh, of the pancreas, which is required to use glucose from the proceed sustains as a vitability source. In, source. in 1998, another arrangement framework in a light of the etiology elemented work in diabetes was uh, proposed by WHO. The kind of diabetes depends on the assumed etiology. And uh, there's a diagram. There's a diagram you can see. Uh, mainly the uh, stomach converts the uh, food to glucose. When we take a food, it is converted into the glucose and that time glucose enters in the bloodstream. After that, that uh, when the uh, these glucose enters in the bloodstream, then the pancreas produce sufficient insulin, but it resistance to the effective use. That time glucose is unable to enter body effectively. So glucose levels is elevated and that condition is known as diabetes mellitus. There is mainly a four types of diabetes. Diabetes uh, type 1 and type 2 is common. Uh, and the third one is gestational diabetes, which is uh, produce after the pregnancy and then the type 3 diabetes mainly type 1 and type 2 diabetes type 1 diabetes uh, type 1 diabetes mellitus is uh, independent and uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus is non-independent. Uh, in type 1 diabetes, it is only treated by the insulin and type 2 diabetes, it is uh, mainly uh, treated by the active oral drug like hypoglycemic drug. So in mainly the type 1 diabetes, uh, it is occurred that the beta cells is destruction in the pancreatic isolate and in type 2, there is a no uh, there is no loss or moderate reduction of uh, beta cells and it is a, uh, mainly 90% of people is suffered by this uh, type 2 diabetes. So next move to the material and method. Animal which are animal which are used in the study that is a, a, a adult male vestar rat and then the reagent which is used uh, it uh, is uh, mainly an inducer streptojotacin which is used as a inducer and the standard drug which we are used in the study that is the metformin induction of diabetes mellitus diabetes were induced with streptojotacin the red were fed with the standard diet and were injected with 60 uh, 60 mg per kg streptojotacin ip 72 hours after the streptojotacin the serum glucose value was uh, were uh, 
were estimated, which increased more than 200 mg per dl, followed, uh, followed by persistent hyperglycemia. Animal having more than 200 mg per dl, blood glucose level was used as the use for the study. And then the selection and preparation, distilled water was given orally for 20, uh, 21 days. And then the experimental design, animals were divided into six groups, five animals per group and receive followed treatment for 21 days. Group one, uh, group one is mainly included a uh, normal animal, which is uh, mainly, uh, we mainly administered them uh, distilled water. And group two is a toxic and control. We are using the animal, which is uh, mainly a diabetic animal. So animal received normal saline one, ml, uh, one mg per kg orally. Group three is a standard group. Uh, animal received metformin, 20 mg per kg body weight orally. And Group 4, uh, it is a treatment group. Uh, we are using in the study uh, mainly a two, uh, we can say the uh, plants, uh, uh, that is the allium sepa and the allium sativa. So treatment one is the allium sepa juice and the allium sepa juice was dosed with the 0.5 ml per kg orally. And uh, group five is treatment to allium sativa. Uh, it is uh, juice with the uh, dose 0.5 ml per kg orally. In group six, we are using, uh, it is a combination of the allium sepa and the allium sativa. Allium sepa is, a, uh, we are using a garlic and onion. In, uh, in my study. So the parameters which we are evaluated in this study, that is the lipid profile like cholesterol, HDL, LDL and triglycerides and estimation of the liver toxicity, SGOT and SGBT test and estimation of the oxidative stress parameter that is SOD and GSH. So there we are uh, showing the results in a graph, uh, graph form. <clears throat> So the uh, mainly the conclusion and the discussion of this my study is various biochemical and tissue parameters were uh, evaluated at the end of treatment period. Steptojutosin induced diabetic animals showed a significant increase in total cholesterol level when it was compared to a normal group. The 21 days treatment with onion and garlic and onion and garlic juice combination and standard metformin, it was found that there was a less significant decrease in total cholesterol in treatment one, two, and three, and a standard group when we compare to a diabetic control group. Second one is uh, triglyceride test. Uh, so in triglyceride, streptojotosin induced diabetic animal result in a significant increase in the triglyceride level. When we compare to the normal group, after the 21 days of the treatment, the treatment one, two, three, and a standard drug, it was found that there is a more significant decrease in the triglyceride level when we compare to a diabetic control group. In a case of the S uh, HDL, uh, uh, it shows that the significant decrease in the SDL level when we compare to a normal group. After the 21 days of the period with uh, treatment 1, 2, and 3, the standard drug and metformin, it was found that there was a more significant increase in the HDL level and treated group as compared to diabetic control group. In case of SG, SGOT and the results of SGOT and SGPT, it shows a significant increase in the SGOT and SGPT level in both when compared to the normal control group. After the 21 days of the treatment, treatment one, two, and three, and standard metformin, it was shows that there is a more significant decrease in SGOT and SGPT level in treated group when we compare to a diabetic control group. Uh, in oxidative parameter, there is a significant decrease in the SOD, uh, superoxide dismutase, and the GSH that is reduced glutathione level. When we compare to a normal control group, after after the 21 days of treatment with treatment 1, 2, and 3 and extended metformin, it was shown that the there's significant increase in the SOD and GSH level in treated group when we compare to a diabetic control group. These uh, there are some references which are used in the study. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My question to you is first one. Uh, yes, how you prepared the juice of garlic and onion? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, can you please repeat again? Yeah. How did you prepare the juice for garlic and onion? Ma'am, we mainly peeled out and then we crushed uh, in a motar pestle. After the motar pestle, we are filtered with a sieve, with a uh, 
perforated seal and then we extracted the juice okay with distilled water right ah uh, yes ma'am okay then uh, i can see you are telling that you have you have done streptojotosin induced uh, yes ma'am right ma but you, yes, in your group i cannot see where you have uh, induced streptojotosin what is the dose nothing i can see in your grouping i'm just Ma'am, yes. streptojotosin doses. Ma'am, mainly we are using the animals. So, ah, uh, one group is a normal animal. After that, the ah, uh, ah, uh, group two, group three, group four, group five, and group six, we are included the ah uh, animals which are diabetes, ah, uh, which are suffered from diabetes mellitus. So, ma'am, I am showing the induction of diabetes mellitus in this ah uh, mm -hmm. paragraph. Ah, uh, I am showing that we are injected sixty mg per kg streptojotosin IP. So, okay. Is how yes, many days? How many days? Ah, uh, ma'am, twenty one. How twenty one days you are giving stipulated? Yes. You are not. No, ma'am. Ah, seventy two are after. Ah, seventy two are after step to jute. So the serum of glucose will be. Mother will be estimated. You are giving for seventy two hours. Yes. Okay. Ah, uh, yes. to all the animals, including your normal. No, ma'am. No. Ma'am, normal uh, normal control group is included. The only normal animals. Okay, but you have not yes, mentioned anywhere. You have oh, not I'm... mentioned anywhere about streptojotosin, and then uh, you are telling that uh, you are giving garlic and onion juice, twenty one days, right? Yes, ma'am. That also you have to give after the induction, right? So that cannot be from the first day, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. What is your conclusion? Which is better? Combination is better or separately it is better? Ma'am, no combination is not so better. It shows that allium, ah, uh, allium sepa is showing the most significant result as compared to the combination. Okay. So what may be the reason? Ma'am, maybe there is a more ah uh, phytoconstituent which are present in my ah uh, um. So juice that is quercetin and ma'am, it is a uh, ah. Uh, uh, Allium sativum and allium sepa both are included the uh, rich amount of sulfur. No, no. I what I am asking is individually allium uh, is showing your uh, high concentration, right? It is showing more effective, right? Your garlic is showing more effective than your combination, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. What yes, what is the reason combination is showing less? Whereas garlic is showing more because in your combination also garlic is there, right? Yes, ma'am. But the uh, mainly the uh, maybe it is due to the amount, and when we mix to the two amount, sometimes it decreases uh, just because of uh, one uh, one is decreased the uh, second what one. What is the ratio? What is the ratio you have used for your garlic uh, and uh, onion uh, juice combination? What is the ratio? Yes. What's the in combination? What is the ratio? Ma'am, zero point five, zero point five, ah, uh, ml. Zero point five ml of yes, one garlic. ratio one, one ratio one. Is, one is to us. Yes, one is. Two. Okay, ah, uh, but it is. Whereas your uh, normal uh, garlic, how much you have taken? Ma'am, that is zero point five ml. Zero point five. Yes. So your zero point five is showing better than your one, right? Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, but ma'am, in my study, ah, uh, the uh allium sepa juice is most significant is giving the most significant result no, no, as compared to the that treatment is study. now you yes, have to come into conclusion right yes but your single extract is more effective not in combination <laughs> yes ma'am but there is also an exception in triglycerides i'm showing this graph can i share my screen mm. ma'am yeah that that may be because Your uh, whatever the constituents is present in allium sepa in onion, yes, that may be suppressing the effect of your garlic. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Ma'am, but in okay, in triglyceride form, it is uh, the treatment uh, three is showing more significant result when we compare to the allium sativum. Ma'am, this is the triglyceride uh, graph. I'm showing in this. This is your MPharm project. Uh, ma'am, it's not my M form project. Uh, so, I'm presenting. Okay. 
Okay, good presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. One more question I would like to ask. Yes, sir. Uh, for the anti-diabetic purpose, what was the exact parameter uh, you chose in your study? Like uh, you have measured the HDL level, HGPT, HGOT. Yes, so how yes, it is correlated with the diabetes? So That's... mainly uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, it is a metabolic disorder which is characterized by like uh, hyperglycemia. So we should, uh, uh, I think, uh, we uh, I choose these parameters just because of uh, uh, hypolipidemic conditions. So I'm trying to uh, estimate the triglyceride and cholesterol and HDL and LDL. So okay, I correlate this by you, this. You could have given uh, another name. Uh, means I am a little bit confused that why it's only diabetic. means uh, if you, you wanted to evaluate for uh, anti-diabetic purpose, so yes, some sir. other parameters may have been uh, also chosen for that. Yes, sir. I also choose this oxidative parameter because when we, uh, uh, in a, uh, it is a antioxidant study. So in a diabetic condition, the level of the uh, these oxidants is mainly. Okay, because uh, possibility is there that the SGPT, SGOT or the HDL level uh, may vary in the other conditions also, except diabetes. So except diabetes. Yes. Sir, I only choose these parameters. Uh, I also. What was the uh, reason? Uh, what was the reason that uh, you chose that I wanted to know only? Uh, so, uh, so pardon, please. Uh, what was the Sorry. reason you chose only these parameters? Some mainly, uh, I, as I said, that it is a metabolic disorder characterized by the hyperglycemia and like glycosuria. So I choose and hyperlipidemia. So I choose that I want to estimate the hypo, uh, hypolipidemic conditions. So uh, I choose this cholesterol and uh, triglyceride, LDL, SDL, and oxidative parameters. I can uh, in disease condition the level of this uh, in oxidative parameter. Uh, uh, like uh, reduced glutathione and uh, super di uh, super oxide di dismutase. So the level of these is uh, increase or decrease for uh, to estimate. So okay. I only okay. so sorry to answer you clearly. No, 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 no problem. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, you, sir and ma'am. Sir, ma'am, with your permission, can we move ahead? Yes, madam, yes. Thank you, sir. I would like to invite Anita Mishra, ma'am, from up to India. Uh, he posted a presentation on effects of leaves of dendroflosis elastasia on kidney stone and nephroproductive activity by red. Ankita, ma'am, are you present there? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please share your screen. Hello, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Ma'am, my voice is going? Yes, yes, yes. Ma'am, it's going. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Good, good morning, everyone. Myself, Ankita Mishra. Today's my presentation, Effect of Deep Dendrophyta Elastica on Kidney Stone and Nephroproductivity Activity of Red. Dendrophyta Elastica, denser belonging to the family of Laurentis, is less known as India 
Mesleon growing commonly on mango tree. As a hemi parasite, Mesleon is common name most obliated hemi parasitic plants in order sutlandus and attached to the end perniate branch of the tree subs and a structure called through which they absorb water and nutrients from the host plant in India, six mesplions and considered as medicinal property which to belonging to the genus Laurensis for, for to the given vesicum. Nephrotoxicity is the one of the most common kidney problems and occur when body exposes the drug or toxin, a number of therapeutic agents can adversely affect kidney, resulting acute renal failure, chronic nephrit nephrit and nephric syndrome because there are the increasing number of potent therapeutic drugs like aminoglycosides, antibiotics. Antipa, and you can yes. uh, directly go to the uh, means experimental work, what you yes, have sir. done. Okay. Yes, sir. And your this uh, screen is not properly. Sir, visible. my sir, Mira, sir, my work is evaluate the kidney stone and nephroprotectivity activity of uh, dendrophyter elastica. Okay. Yes, sir. So just discuss uh, whatever you have done. Sir, sir, what is it? Is it your research work? Yes, sir. Uh, so go to the experimental work directly instead of telling the introduction. Sir, first of all, literature and second, identify of dendrophytica elastica, then collect drying powders and leaves. You just tell the experimental work. How did you perform? I am saying this. Hello, Haan, sir. Hello, ma'am. Please proceed. Okay, sir. Sir, firstly, uh... Ankita, I was saying that what you have done in the experimental work, you have performed in the Yes, sir. So, sir, we will discuss the process. Haan, wo, wo bhar, wo discuss the process. We will 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 discuss the process. So, the whole process, experimental process, to pura describe kar. Yes. Ah, ye plant ke baare mein bata dijiye aur aage badhiye, theek hai? Fir ishe aage se.
बताइए जैसा बताना बता लो आप आपने जैसा भी प्रिपरेशन किया होगा कोई दिक्कत नहीं सर एक्चुअली फोन में लैपटॉप इसकी वजह से थोड़ी प्रॉब्लम नहीं कोई बात नहीं जैसा भी आपने प्रिपेयर किया है वैसा बता दीजिए सर फर्स्टली कलेक्ट द आइडेंटिफाई एंड प्लांट मटेरियल द प्लांट डेंड्रोफाइटा इलास्टिका ग्रोइंग टू मैग्नीफायर इंडिका एंड कलेक्ट ड्रग मेथड सेप्टेम्बर अक्टूबर एंड साउथ जोन सेकेंडली प्रिपेयर द मैथनोलिक एक्सट्रेक्ट ऑफ डेंड्रोफाइटा इलास्टिका द कलेक्ट प्लांट मटेरियल the methanol 80% extract concept using rota vapor under the vacuum pressure third primarily uh, uh, phytochemical screening the quantitative phytochemical screening performed on the methanolic extract da and quantitative determine phytochemical constituent such as alcoholic carbonized phenolic common tanning staining tannin carbohydrate is forming glycoside determine of carbohydrates sir maine isme test use kiye the felix bear test mayers test an instrument sir use kiya the maine hot air ones particular uv spectrometer and digital digital polymeters iska medicinal use hai mainly anti microbial activity anti oxidant activity anti hyperglycemic activity anti hypoprotective activity and diuretics nutrients activity sir in vivo method anti urethralis activities for assessment of anti urethralis activity two doses level 2 2 mg gram kg 2 mg and uh, 400 kg were used in mayers wister's test ethylene glycol induced urethralis method experimental animal were uh, divided to eight groups study uh, preventive effect of methanolic extract सर सेकेंड इन इन वीवो मेथड यूज किया था नेफ्रो प्रोडक्टिविटी एक्टिविटी का एनिमल्स रिसीव डेली ओरल डोजेस एंड व्हीकल्स वन डेज फिफ्टी एम एल एनिमल एडमायर सिग्नल डोजेस वेट डे वन फिफ्टी ग्राम बॉडी वेट फ्रॉम द टू an animal received signal this is 5 mg the room temperature 25 to 30 uh, celsius and require the working solution perform the assay given below so ho gaya हेलो 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 अंकिता जी हां मैम सर कंप्लीट हो गया ओके आपने क्या किया बताओ व्हाट यू हैव वर्कड एक सेकंड बताओ व्हाट इज योर वर्क What activity you have done? Sorry, ma'am. Ma'am, can you hear me? Ma'am, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You are a B form student, M form student. Ma'am, M form. M form student. Which branch? Ma'am, pharmacology. 
ओके सो क्या किया आपने विच एक्टिविटी किया है कौन सा प्लांट लिया है मैम डेंड्रो फाइटर लास्ट का विच पार्ट मैम लीव ओके कौन सा एक्टिविटी किया मैम नेफ्रो एक्टिविटी बाय डेट किडनी स्टोन किडनी स्टोन एक्टिविटी कौन सा मॉडल यूज किया मॉडल यूज किया मैंने अच्छा रिजल्ट क्या है व्हाट इज द रिजल्ट मैम क्रूड मेथेनॉलिक एक्सट्रैक्ट होल प्लांट ऑफ डेंड्रोफाइट एनर्जी का वस्ते पेयर चॉकलेट एक्सट्रैक्ट मेथेनॉलिक हाइड्रो अल्कोहलिक मिक्सचर सेकंड प्राइमरली फाइटोकेमिकल स्क्रीनिंग एक्सट्रैक्ट द रिजल्ट्स फ्लेम फाइटोकेमिकल स्क्रीनिंग नहीं गिवन बिलूट इज ऑल आर यू आर टेलिंग फाइटोकेमिकल रिजल्ट नो आई वांट टू नो व्हाट हैपेंड टू योर गोल्डस्टोन रिजल्ट whether it is showing any activity or not मैम कार्बोहाइड्रेट टेस्ट देखा तो उसमें पॉजिटिव रिजल्ट था नहीं नहीं मैं गोल्डस्टोन तुमने गोल्डस्टोन के ऊपर किया ना मैम आवाज नहीं आ रही एक्टिविटी किया ना गोल्डस्टोन सॉरी एक बार रिपीट कर दे यस मैम या so you have done what is the effect what is the result kaun sa extract ko effective hua kaun sa effective nahi hua or not at all effective result kya hai what is the result ma'am uh, alkaline reagent test positive aaya ma'am killer killing test bhi positive aaya legal test bhi positive aaya mayor test bhi negative Ankita, listen. These all are phytochemical tests. These all are not activity. I am asking about yes, activity. Activity, ma'am. Man, ma'am, I am telling you. Ma'am, body weight me changes are there. Before study, one seventy eight, or after study, one seventy four. This is your M Farm project. This is your M Farm project. M Farm project. Yes. ये आपका project है? Yes, ma'am. This work हो चुका है? Already done the work? नहीं ma'am अभी चल रहा है. अभी नहीं हुआ है. Then where we got the result? Ma'am, ma'am अभी अभी नहीं हुआ है. अभी third semester. Fourth. Which college you are studying, Ma'am? C A T College, Varanasi. Okay, 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 Ankita. Madam, we can move ahead with the next presentation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, and ma'am. I'd like to invite uh, Somya B Mukherjee, ma'am, from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, for a poster presentation on pharmacological evaluation of methyl methylic extract of bindas betray betraynata steam for hematic activity in rats. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, am I audible and visible, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are audible. Okay, I am sharing my screen. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, am my screen is my screen visible? 
So it has started uh, sharing, but not yet visible. Okay. Yeah, it is visible now. Okay, ma'am. So. Uh... Uh, today, uh, my topic is pharmacological evaluation of methanolic extracts of bitter nut. Is it possible to please uh, slide show your screen now? Nah? Just okay. do a slide show presentation. Would be better. Can you see uh, see it right now? Uh, no. Is it properly visible right now? It is visible, but you can put on the slide show. Uh, it's on slide, so ma'am. Okay, fine. So please proceed. So you close, uh, you close the uh, that uh, sideways uh, uh, screen. What, sir? That is small uh, uh, slide which is visible at the side. Is that okay, sir? It's okay, but. Uh, uh, so uh, on the right side, there is a small icon. You can click on that bar for the slideshow. It is still not on the slideshow. Okay, just a minute, ma'am. Please give me a yeah. second. Uh, now can you see, ma'am? Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. Please proceed. Thank you. Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Shamudip Mukherjee from uh, Sardar Bhagwan Singh University of Alawala, Dehradun. And today my topic is pharmacological evaluation of methanolic extract of Baden's Peternata stem for hematinic activity and rate. So what is anemia? We, know, we should know it better. Uh, basically, uh, when RBC count decreases, then anemia happens in, in our system, uh, in our body. And... Uh, when the blood oxygen uh, capacity decreased, uh, that condition is known as anemia. So what we did, uh, we take male whistle rats uh, between 250, 225 to 250 grams for uh, which is aging uh, six to seven uh, weeks age. Uh, then uh, what we in introduce if, uh, or induction, the uh, phenylhydrazine, which decrease the uh, uh, which basically react with the uh, RBC and decrease the RBC count so that uh, hematinic activity uh, decreased. Then uh, we treated it with the uh, methanolic extract of Baden's bitter nut stem, uh, stem for 14 days. Now, basically, what is the result? Uh, in, in my phytochemical constituent, there are alkaloid, glycoside, flavonoid, tannin, and terpenoids are present, and the anthraquinone are not present in there. Uh, in that group, we can clearly visible uh, it. It can clearly visible that the normal control group having uh, that much uh, hemoglobin level and RBC and uh, WBC level, which is decreased in positive control group by uh, induction of phenylhydrazine. And uh, in my treatment, when I use the extract uh, with the phenylhydrazine, then uh, in the low dose, uh, 100 mg per kg, uh, it slightly increase then in uh, moderate 2000 mg per kg it uh, moderately increase and in 4000 mg per kg it coming to next to normal level and here's my uh, graph you can clearly show that the uh, increase of the uh, hemoglobin and uh, rbc level and wbc level and uh, uh, in future uh, we can determine its uh, why it is uh, in specific mechanism of action, we can determine that in future. We have no clue right now. And uh, we can do uh, more preclinical studies and or clinical, if uh, possible, then we can do clinical studies and uh, we can optimize the doses and uh, active, we can determine the main, uh, main active constituent which uh, effect in that uh, hematinic activity. And uh, here is my uh, some references right now. Thank you, ma'am. Hello.
Excuse me. Ma'am, uh, am I visible? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sir. Some technical issues. Yeah. Okay. Any questions from the respective others? Sir, ma'am, any questions from your side, please? Hello, ma'am. Happy judges. Any question? Ma'am and sir? Satish, sir? Lokya, ma'am? So just a moment, please wait. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. okay, 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 ma'am. Any questions from the respected judges? Uh, Ma'am, so. Uh, so actually judges are facing a little bit technical issue, so they are unable to join. If once they are joined, we'll let you know and for the questionnaire. Yeah, thank you for the wonderful presentation, sir. I'd like to invite Mukund Kumar Yadav, sir, for presentation from Sheet College of Pharmacy India for a poster presentation on evaluation and effect of leaf of cumin's opiculares on analgesic and antipyretic effect activity by the albino rabbit that sorry mukun sir are you present there yes ma'am yeah please share your screen hello Hello. So please proceed. Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please proceed. Good afternoon, ma'am. Myself, Mukund Yadav, pursuing M Pharma from State College of Pharmacy. 
Hello. Yes, you are audible. Audible. I have to represent my poster presentation on the topic of uh, evaluation and effect of document support letters on uh, analgesic and antipyretic activity. Huh? Cucumis operculatus also known as a risk gas family. It belongs to the family of cucurbitacin uh, and uh, it is a vegetable, uh, vegetable plant commonly used in kitchen. Very popular in Asian countries and uh, contains several amounts of uh, fiber vitamins, minerals, including vitamin B12, C, carotene, calcium, niacin, phosphorus. Some other species, species are uh, Cocumis Confessed uh, uh, to uh, Cocumis Melo, Lupa Pongulata, Lupa Cilindita, etc. Uh, Hello. Yes. Yes, Mukun. Uh, uh, I have selected uh, herbal plants because uh, thousand years before uh, several natural medicines uh, used for the human uh, in uh, human element and. Uh, Uh, and uh, there are uh, several uh, aspects about that, just uh, Charak Sahimta, Ayurveda, or uh, etc. Man. Mukund, and, uh, is it your uh, research work or you are representing a, a review? What is this? Ma'am, uh, sir, research work also. It, it is research work. Then uh, uh, tell the, about only the experimental work, how you have the, uh, performed the experiments and what are the results. Okay, yeah. so from here you can discuss. Yes. First of all, uh, sir, I have uh, collected the information about the uh, uh, about the plants from the several uh, literature review. Hello. Hello. Mukul Dariu, B form or M form student? M form. M form. Yes, ma'am. This is your project work? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so carry on. What What is your exact research work and what is the result you have got? Please continue. Ma'am, uh, plan of work, I have uh, read several researcher survey and thereafter I have collected the uh, plant, uh, plant and... Uh, uh, what is the plant name? Cocumis operculatus, ma'am. Okay. And thereafter, uh, I have uh, uh, done its authentication from uh, Barkacha VHU. Okay. And thereafter, uh, ma'am, I have confirmed its, uh, its uh, phytochemical evaluation. And uh, in that, uh, there are uh, several compounds are found, for example, glycosides, alkaloids, leonoids, etc. And uh, Thereafter, pharmacological studies uh, performed. Uh, I have uh, performed uh, two activity, ma'am, of this plant. First, analgesic activity, and the sen uh, second one is antipyretic activity. In uh, uh, analgesic activity, ma'am, I have performed hot plate method and tail immersion method. And uh, in 
anti piracy activity i have uh, performed viewers this test ma'am okay what are the extracts you have made how many extracts you have made what ma'am which are the solvent you have used for extraction ethanol ma'am only ethanol yes ma'am why only ethanol ma'am because uh, uh ma'am i have done extraction from ethanol uh, by the chocolate operator yeah that's fine but why only ethanol why not other solvent ma'am uh, ethanol uh, ethanolic extract uh, uh, exist maximum uh, anti pyretic activity ma'am okay okay Now, what is your result you have completed the activity yes ma'am uh, what is the result ma'am uh, result mein ma'am iske uh, anti uh, inflam uh, anti pyretic activity ma'am maximum dose pe uh, maximum so kar rahi thi which what is the maximum dose ma'am uh, 200 to 5 uh, uh, 500 mg per kg body weight ke hisab se usko diye the nahi dose uh, how much is the dose How much Sorry, mg ma your gram? What is the amount? Mg ma'am. Mg ma'am. How much mg? Ma'am, two hundred mg is four hundred mg. Ah, uh, जैसे जैसे ऊपर जा रहा था और जैसे जैसे उसकी एक्टिविटी बढ़ रही थी. हाँ. और लगभग एंटीपायरेटिक. Maximum कौन सा हुआ? जी ma'am. Dose dependent matter में इसकी जो एक्टिविटी थी वो maximum show कर रही थी. कौन सा dose में maximum हुआ? मैम 500 हंड्रेड एम जी पर के जी के हिसाब से उसको किया था उसमें उसके इफेक्ट मैम उसके यस मैम वॉट इज दॉक्सिक डोज टू हंड्रेड टू फाइव हंड्रेड डोज सिलेक्ट किया ना कौन सा बेसिस में सिलेक्ट किया वही अब सिलेक्टेड टू हंड्रेड टू फाइव फाइव हंड्रेड डोज Ma'am, oh. you are a pharmacology student, right? Yes, ma'am. Ah, uh, pharmacology means you have to be familiar with all these things, no? You should know what dose you are using, why you are using, yes, what is the formula behind it. All these things you should know, right? Yes, ma'am. Hmm, but you are not telling anything. Have you done toxicity studies? Yes, ma'am. Hmm, what is the dose? मैम मैक्सिमम इसका मैम टू हाउ यू हैव डन टॉक्सिसिटी स्टडीज व्हाट मैम हाउ यू हैव डन टॉक्सिसिटी स्टडीज मैम अकॉर्डिंग टू ओईसीटी गाइडलाइंस मैम पैरा सेक्शन 423 हाउ हाउ यू हैव डन राइट यस मैम Mm, tell me how you have done procedure. You tell me. Ma'am, उसपे dosing कर रहे थे और उसमें मतलब इसका जो maximum dose है जो toxic level का dose है वो तो two thousand mg per kg body weight के हिसाब से है. मैंने उसको 500 तक का किया था तो जैसे ही मैंने मैम दो सौ के क्रास किया तो उसका जो एक्टिविटी थी वो एज कम्पेयर टू एस्प्रीन शो कर रहा था पैरासीटामोल के अकॉर्डिंग शो कर रहा था मैम जैसे 10-15 मिनट पे 10-10 मिनट पे ऐसे ऐसे करते बढ़ाते जा रहे थे उसका डोजिंग वगैरह तो लगभग इसका डोज मैम चार घंटे तक मतलब जो इसकी प्रॉपर्टी थे ना एंटीपायरेटिक प्रॉपर्टी वो मैक्सिमम फोर हवर्स तक आ, आ, फीवर को कंट्रोल कर रहा था टेम्परेचर का बॉडी टेम्परेचर रेक्टल टेम्परेचर को ओके 
Okay. And there are ma'am chart are so available. Okay, you can leave the meet. Okay, ma'am, thank you. Sir, can we move to the next participant with your permission? Sure, sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'd like to invite Ankita, Ankita Singh, ma'am, from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, India. He posted a presentation on uh, preliminary uh, cytochemical screening and anti anemic activity of Haldina uh, cordifolia bark. Ankita, ma'am, are you present there? Yes, ma'am. Uh, please share your screen. Hello, ma'am. Am I audible? Uh, yes, yes, ma'am. You are audible. Please proceed. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ankita Singh from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, Balawala, Dehradun, India. And my topic is preliminary phytochemical screening and anti anemic activity of Haldina cordifolia bark. Let's come to the introduction part. Anemia. Anemia can be justified as an, as an ailment in which the level of hemoglobin series of RBCs and their oxygen carrying level is low, by which they don't fulfill the physiological needs. It is caused by the deficiency of nutrition. There are different types of anemia like aplastic anemia, megaloblastic anemia, iron deficiency anemia, sickle cell anemia, and hemolytic anemia. Let's come to the plant part. Haldina cordifolia bark, which is belonging to the family Rubiaceae. Haldina cordifolia, um, in English, this is known as yellow teak, saffron teak. In Sanskrit, this is known as haridru, while in Hindi, this is known as haldu. Haldina cordifolia consists of huge number of deciduous trees throughout India, but they are found in, ever, they are found in evergreen forests, especially in Eastern Ghats, Kerala, and Karnataka. Also found in Sri Lanka, Ker uh, Sri Lanka Vietnam, and China. Morphology, morphology of park. <laughs> its bark are dark gray, thick blackish, and to a certain extent, pale, ashy, bitter, pungent, and tonic. Chemical constituents. Bark contains 7 to 9% tannins and triterpenoids, etc. <clears throat> Traditionally, Haldina cordifolia used in joint pain, eye infection, jaundice, etc. In case of pregnant women, decoction of stem bark is given to prevent miscarriage. This plant has many phytoconstituents like azolic acid, quercetin, tannins, carbohydrates, alkaloids, oleoresins, essential oils, etc. Literature survey on Haldina cordifolia uh, revealed that various, various activities are performed such as anti-diabetic, anti-fertility, anti-oxidant, anti-ulcer, anti-inflammatory. But pharmacological activities like activity like anti-anemic was not reported. Therefore, this research involves pharmacognostical and pharmacological activity on anti anemia Materials and methods. Pre sorry, preliminary phytochemical screening uh, revealed the presence of alkaloids, saponins, steroids, tannins, and terpenoids. Materials and methods. Materials which are used for phytochemical screening and anti anemic activity of Haldina cordifolia bark. Firstly, Haldina, Haldina cordifolia bark and then Soxet apparatus for uh, extraction, and Sudan Red, Millen's reagent, Morris reagent, Dragon Dog, HCL, Biorit reagents, etc. for phytochemical screening. There are silica gel G, chloroform, toline, HCL, ethyl acetate, ethanol, methanol, etc. for TLC, TLC fingerprinting, and also used for pharmacological evaluation. Then come to the methods, phytochemical screening. 
that's phytochemical staining of haldina cordifolia bark the extract of haldina cordifolia bark are subjected to various qualitative chemical tests to determine the presence of various phytoconstituents such as alkaloids flavonoids glycosides carbohydrates phenolic etc test for alkaloids like mears and hager tests test in hager tests sample is uh, sample was treated um, with mears reagent and it gives yellow cream color precip precipitate which indicates the indicates the presence of alkaloids test for carbohydrates uh, like molles test test for glyco glycosides like legal test balger test killer kiliani test etc and come to the tlc finger painting analysis firstly prepare tlc plate then um, firstly prepare tlc plate then tlc finger painting analysis was performed extraction is subjected to tlc extraction is subjected to tlc to identify the nature and number of chemical constituents by using different solvent system like chloroform methanol ethyl acetate etc the rf values were determined um, for various phytoconstituents present in different parts of different extraction various phytoconstituents detecting agents and solvent system used in chromatographic solvents like chromatographic studies like like for alkaloids detecting like for like for alkaloids detecting agents were um, was dragon drop and a solvent system uh, are chloroform and methanol in the ratio 9 is to 1 whereas for tannins detecting agents were ferric chloride and solvent system toluene chloroform and acetone in the ratio 4 is to 2.5 is to 3.5 then come to the result and discussion result and discussion fight of chemical screening as you can clearly see uh, in the table that in ethanol extract maximum amount of phytoconstituents are present tlc fingerprinting analysis different mobile pages were used to develop tlc of different extracts as per the procedure and it is identified on the basis of rf value then come to the anti anemic activity anti anemic activity was performed as per the procedure hemoglobin and rbc count uh, two parameters were um, determined in total three extracts were, were used that is ethanol chloroform and ethyl acetate maximum maximum hemoglobin and rbc content was in dextrose syrup but but ethanol in it but ethanol ethan, sorry but ethanolic extract has more rbcs and hemoglobin content in comparison to the chloroform and ethyl acetate results are tabulated in table then come to the determination of total phenolic content total phenolic content in extracts extracts of haldina cordifolia was determined using standard curve of gallic acid as per the procedure for this standard cup of gallic acid was prepared as shown in the figure and uh, amount of total um, phenolic content in different extracts of bark are shown in the table table determination of total flavonoidal content total flavonoidal content of haldi uh, haldina cordifolia bark extract was det uh, was determined using standard curve of routine as per the procedure and the standard curve of routine is shown in the figure and observation are given in the table then come to the conclusion haldina cordifolia contain tannins flavonoids carbohydrates glycosides and alkaloids in anti anemic activity uh, ethanolic extract was found more effective this extract can be further used for the isolation of uh, active constituents and further formulations will be prepared in future thank you thank you ma'am any questions from the respected judges thank you sir yes ma'am you are a b form or m form student m form m form which branch cognosy pharma cognosy okay okay so anti anemic activity you have done right yes ma'am yeah anti anemic activity uh, which are the models you have used models hello yes ma'am yeah i can see I that 
you have written that uh, bark on hemoglobin what is the model yes. how you have done can you explain now my total phenolic it's a in vitro method or it's a in in vivo method hello in ma'am hello ma'am yes ma'am in vitro in vitro uh, can you tell me the method i think you have not mentioned anywhere what method you have used this on the uh, blood parameters you have done right yes ma'am okay so you have in the, you have added phenyl hydrazine right yes yes ma'am yeah why you have added that hello hello yes ma'am yeah i want to know about your pharmacological activity model can you explain but ma'am ma my topic is phytochemical screening and i understood phytochemical screening is all right then and anti anemic activity right yes ma'am how you have done that i want to know that method because you have not mentioned anywhere ma'am I, i have done only phytochemical screening and tlc fingerprinting and then i have done total phenolic content and flavonoidal content very good after that yes, this uh, result you have given no effect of yes ma'am work on hemoglobin then on rbc how did you got that result what you have done yes ma'am yes ma'am by by determination of total phenolic content and by determination of total flavon flavonoidal content i and i have mentioned the standard plot of lutein and gallic gallic yeah. acid also that is exactly fine very good that is i am talking about the pharmacological activity yes ma'am uh, how you have done that ma'am i have mentioned oh uh, ma'am by hemoglobin and rbc count two parameters were determined mm -hmm, but i have i have mentioned that and uh, three extract i have used um, ethanol chloroform and ethyl acetate you have done the grouping right there you yes, have written the normal group is aline then you have hmm. written phenyl hydrazine induced what you have induced anemia yes ma'am okay so what is this model i am asking about this one then you have written that phenyl hydrazine plus your plant extract 500 mg per kg how many days that is not there sorry ma'am how many days you are? and you have used standard control as a dexorin syrup yes ma'am i think you are not thorough with the, your pharmacological activity so you have induced anemia right yes ma'am and then you have seen how whether it is able to increase the hemoglobin and rbc yes ma'am yes, right? ma yes oh. ma'am Okay, so you have taken uh, three extracts. Mm, yes, ma'am. Chloroform, ethyl acetate, and ethanol. And ethanol, yes, ma'am. Why you have taken this three only? Any reason? and it is it is based on solubility of drug yeah i know but uh, you have other non polar and polar solvents also right why you have not taken them only this three you have chosen chloroform ethyl acetate and ethanol ma'am this uh, from where i have taken this research in that research this is this was mentioned okay so you have you have collected the data from yes. the uh, references and then you have gone for this yes ma'am yes ma'am okay. which which one is showing better result ma'am ethyl acetate ethyl acetate is showing better result so what you can conclude
So you are uh, telling that it contains tannins, flavonoids, carbohydrates, saponin, glycosides, glycosides and alkaloids. Yeah, all are present in all the three. Ma'am, all are all are not. Yes, ma'am, all are present in all the three. And ethyl acetate dissolves more. See, uh, you are mentioning the constituents. Some yes, will be present in the polar. Some will be present in the non-polar. Yes, right. So your chloroform is non-polar, ethyl acetate is slightly polar, and your ethanol is highly polar. Right? It yes, cannot be all the constituents, cannot be present in all the three solvents, right? Yes, ma'am. But here you have to check properly. This is your M from project? No, ma'am. This is not my project. Okay. Fine. But you should know why this is ethyl acid it is showing, what is the thing, where, when you have done the activity, you should know the method, isn't it? Ma'am, extraction, extraction was performed in different solvents as per the polarity. Okay. As so per the polarity order. Have you and done then maximum effective yield obtained. Okay. Successive solvent extraction you have done. Right? So, so, socks. What what is the method of extraction you have used? Toxic. Is it a successive? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you have, what are the solvent you have used for successive solvent extraction? See, when we are doing successive solvent extraction, we start yes. from petroleum ether yes, and then in, in the water, right? So all yes, the from non-polar to polar, we do it. And maximum extractive yield was obtained in water and extraction. And minimum was obtained in ether, uh, petroleum ether. Minimum in petroleum ether. Yes, ma'am. Okay. But you have selected chloroform, ethyl acetate and ethanol. Even yes, though your water was maximum, but you have taken ethanol, not water. Why? Because, ma'am... Uh, in anti anemic activity, okay. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, you it's, have done total stenolic and total uh, uh, flavonoid also. Right? Yes, ma'am. So, here also it is showing your water as the highest, not yes, your ethyl acetate, right? But water you have not taken only for your activity, ma'am. In phytochemical screening, ethyl acetate, but ma'am, in total phenolic water, water was. No, it should, more it should be connected, no dear. When you have got in uh, phytochemical screening, that is your qualitative method. You have done quantitative method. You have found yeah. out how much amount of phenolics and flavonoids are there. There you are getting water as the highest uh, content, right? Then yes, this water also should take for the activity, no? Yes, ma'am. In fact, your ethyl acetate is showing lowest total phenol and flavonoids among this three. Right? Yes, Water, phenol, and ethyl acetate. But you have selected ethyl acetate and alcohol, not water. I don't know what is the reason for the activity. Any, any uh, reason can you give? Why you have not selected water? Ma'am, this is not my research. That's why I don't know. Hmm, I can I understand. Know. When you are presenting, you should know the reason, no? Right. Okay, okay. Well done. Uh, this uh, PPT is made uh, very nice. Good. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, can we move to the next one? Yes, please move on. Yeah, thank you, thank you, ma'am. I would like to invite Vikas Suresh Sindhi, sir, from Parul Institute of Pharmacy and Research, Parul University, Varoda, India. 
presentation, e-post a presentation on neuroprotective activity of Solomon dandentinum leaf extract on three nitropropionic acid induced nephro, uh, neurotoxicity in red statinum. Vikas, sir, am I audible to you? I have to show I am audible. Thank you very much. Myself, you can send it. My project. So please, uh, I request you to uh, put your slide on and slideshow, please. Yeah, yeah. No. It would be better for the judges. I will put on the slideshow. Uh, no, it is not on the slideshow, sir. Okay, one No, no. no, sir, no. It's still not. No? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, all the respected judges. Myself, Vikashan, PhD student of Ahul Institute of Pharmacy. Mm -hmm. My PhD topic is Neuroprotective Activity of Solanum Legatism with Extract on the Nitrocopenic Acid in the Neurotoxicity in the Bank. Introduction The neurodegeneration means the lack of the structure and the function of the neuron. The main default neurodegeneration is amelotropic neurosis, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease. In Huntington's disease, it mainly caused to the, the gene mutation of the Huntington. And then when we lost the motor and the internal function. The here this activity, neuroprotect activity, I was for the food supply, solenum vegetation. So many solenum cases show the neuroprotect activity, the new and the perform this neuroprotect activity on the solenum vegetation. That's why I have seen this plan. The aim of goal or aim of this project to study the Determine the phytochemical antioxidant neuroprotective property of the solenum vegetation. For the material maker, first of all, I am the current protein beside the plant. After that, the, the uh, extraction is carried out by the successive extraction method. There are the many things all over our use, vegeta, chloroform, and the uh, ethanol. After that, perform the breeding the phytochemical screening, various phytochemicals like alkaline, glycoside, and yeah. After that, perform the acute and subactive publicity. The acute and subactive acute publicity perform according to the OECD guidelines for 22, and the subactive publicity perform according to OECD guidelines for 07. After that, the pharmacological activity or for the neuroprotective activity perform. For that purpose, select the Mr. Rack. And then the neurotoxicity reduced by the free nitrocopenic acid, 15 mg per kg per day dose. They are uh, the, uh, the nitrocopenic acid administered up to 28 days. Then uh, the second week and third week, we study the behavioral activity, behavioral parameter like the locomotor activity, motor rod activity, motor rod activity. Uh, in the plus one activity, penis and the modis, sort of next case. Then, last day, after 21 days, animal are sacrificed, the brain are the remote, and the brain um, are removed, and they are done after activation of the brain in phosphate buffer. They have to perform the union biochemical parameter like the estimation of the uh, acetylcholine stress enzyme in which for oxide is. And we use antioxidant as the sodium catalase, glutathione, total cholesterol protein. And after that, this uh, half portion of the brain cell for the histopathological study. And also study the DNA fragmentation study. The result of the Maya study, uh, Colonel Vigat is on medicinal to active available in India. There, the extraction is carried out by the successive extraction method, the treatment with hydrochemical screen, to find out the chemical extract. Show the presence of the tannin. Chloroform extract of the show the presence of glycoside alkaline and the chloroform uh, alcoholic extract show the presence of chloride. Then, uh, then we used to get the acute and subjective talk. Uh, after that, performed the in vitro antioxidant study. In vitro antioxidant study, I would choose the three models 
the DPP or radical scavenging activity, hydrogen peroxide scavenging activity, and nitric oxide activity. So from this study, I, I was found that the chloroform extract and the alkylic extract show the good antioxidant activity, and that both extracts are similar to the chloroprotein. After that, I was performed the active toxicity study. In active toxicity study, the solenum vitism alcohol extract did not show any toxicity as the dose of the 5000 mg per kg. For that, the, the future study, I was selected the two 50 and 500 mg dose for neuroprotectivity. And solenum vitism chlorine extract showed the toxicity at the 2000 mg per kg dose. That's why previous study. 100 and 200 mg dose of select for the future study. After that, I performed the subactive toxicity. In subactive toxicity, we have to select the three dose level, uh, the 250, 100, 250, and 500, uh, sorry, 250, 500, and 1000 mg for the uh, alcoholic extract, and the 50, uh, 50, 100, and the 500, sorry, 100, 50, and the 500 for the uh, chloroform extract. There, the chloroform extract showed the higher dose toxicity which is extremely in the liver damage at the skin. Then, after that, we performed the neuroprotective activity. Then, neuroprotective activity, uh, the antipropinic acid, propinic acid, administered continuously 15 days. And the second week and third one, we, we studied the behavioral activity and the behavioral activity. In behavioral activity, the locomotor activity. The solenum vegetation chloroform extract shows significant improvement in the locomotor activity compared to the TV to control. In rotor apparatus, all behavioral activities, the uh, solenum vegetation ex chloroform extract at the 200 mg and 100 mg dose show both those show the significant improvement, significant activity. And alcoholic extract did not show the significant activity. And uh, after that, in biochemical parameter, the Chloroform extract 200 mg dose significantly improve the, improve the polymesterase level, uh, liquid peroxidase level, and the uh, SOD, glutathione, and the uh, uh, catalyst level, RBC. And then in histopathological study, it is clearly seen that the uh, negative control group to show the clearly due to neuronal degeneration at the negative group and the 2200 mg per kg dose of chloroform extract shows the less degeneration compared to the negative control group. In DNA fragmentation study, this DNA fragmentation study is a molecular study where the, the, the negative group shows the more fragmentation of the DNA compared to the normal group. And the your alcoholic group, alcoholic extract of the learning negative of both those levels show the fragmentation. And the chloroform extract 200 mg dose show the less fragmentation. So in previous study, we have investigated with the oral administration of the learning negative extract of extract of the, the chloroform and the alcoholic extract. And the, my conclusion is that the chloroform extract show the Neuroprotective at the dose of the 200 mg show the neuroprotective activity. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. 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 Hello, I am audible. Hello. Hello, ma'am. I am audible. Hello. Hello. Hello, I am audible. Yes, Hello. yes.
for any question any questions from the respected judges so ma'am any questions no madam ma'am so okay sir so can we proceed to the next one yes ma'am yeah thank you sir i would like to invite thank you thank you sir yes madam you can call the, the next candidate yeah yeah okay sir okay, okay. i'd like to invite uh, naila parveen ma'am for sardhar bhagwan you singh university e poster presentation on a review on a drug drug naila ma'am are you present good afternoon good afternoon ma'am good afternoon uh, ma'am please share your screen yeah hello yes ma'am am i audible yeah 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 you audible ma'am uh having... good afternoon everyone uh, the topic of my uh, presentation is a review on drug drug interaction of macrolides uh, uh, start with the, from the introduction your... macrolide hello ma'am nala ma'am please put your screen on slide show yeah, yeah. this is for I have already put my screen on slide slide show. No, it is not there. Just please, it will be easy for judges. Yes, uh, is it visible now on slide show? No. Hello. No, ma'am, it is not. Yeah, it is now. okay uh, uh, macroid antibiotics are the most widely prescribed class of antibiotics and they are in uh, general uh, they are very uh, generally used in clinical practice nowadays and often combined with other uh, drug therapies thus they can create potential for pharmacokinetic interactions the rapid expansion and thorough clinical usage of the macrolid antibiotic family in recent years has increased the risk of drug interaction between them and other pharmacologically active drugs macrolid as we know whenever a xeno uh, xenobiotic substance or any other foreign substance is introduced into our body they are first being metabolized by the liver uh, microsomal enzymes so uh, similarly with that uh, any macrolid along with any other drug that is being co prescribed will be metabolized together by cytochrome p for 15 enzymes so if uh, like uh, we are studying drug drug interaction so that implicates that if uh, we are uh, co administering macrolides with any other drug then they may inhibit or uh, they may uh, induce the cytochrome p450 that will have the effect the the effect of the uh, the macrolide or the co administering drug that will lead to increased plasma con concentration or or any other uh, interactions we reviewed the interaction between macrolides and drugs theophylline cyclosporine terfenadine warfarin uh, carbamazepine and calcium channel blockers so next uh, we have to understand the mode of action of cytochrome p450 uh, cytochrome p450 is a family uh, the large family uh, of enzyme and th that has the core of iron heme heme core and what happens is how cytochrome p450 acts is when uh, rh here rh is the drug substance that uh, combines with p450 uh, having iron uh, core and they form an enzyme substrate complex in the second step what happens is nadph uh, gets converted to nad nad plus and releases an electron that is uh, that gets reduced the p450 rh fe3 plus complex get reduced to p450 rh fe2 plus in the third step uh, oxygen comes in and that oxygen is uh, uh, along with the electron that electron gets transferred to the o2 minus 
and they bond together. In the fourth step, uh, two protons are added. And what happens is uh, the two protons get uh, take away the oxygen, one oxygen from this complex, and, and they get released as H2O. And uh, the, they, we are left with P450ROH. That is uh, the oxygen gets transferred, the um, oxygen, the remaining oxygen and the hydrogen. After in the next step, fifth step, what happens is uh, the metabolized the uh, drug was uh, incorporated as RH and it will be released as ROH. And after really after its release, uh, the P450 will be available in its default Fe3 plus state. So we have studied drug drug interactions. Uh, so uh, starting with theophylline, theophylline is metabolized by cytochrome P453A. Now co-administration of macrolide antibiotics that are metabolized by the same system can competitively inhibit the conversion of theophyll, causing toxicity that includes vomiting, tachycardia, or increased heart rate, tachypnea, or increased respirations. Erythromycin and other macrolides initially induce cytochrome P450. They rapidly form a stable complex with the cytochrome, rendering it inactive. As a consequence, what happens is cytochrome P450 is unavailable for the theophylline metabolism. Clearance is therefore compromised and theophylline accumulates in the plasma. And because of that, uh, the uh, increased uh, theophylline concentration in the plasma will lead to exaggerate, uh, exaggerated effects of uh, the high-dose theophylline. No, and the non sedating antihistamine, terfenadine, undergoes rapid first pass metabolism in the liver, where cytochrome P453A enzymes converts it to the active form terfenadine carboxylate. Now, when we are co administering terfenadine along with uh, macrolides, what happens is, as we uh, studied now, that uh, the uh, macrolides inhibit the P cytochrome P450 system. So because of that, the product terfenadine that we are administering will not get converted into the active form that is terfenadine carboxylate. And because of that, the uh, product concentration will increase in the plasma and that may lead to cardiotoxicity. Uh, many cases have been uh, studied and have been reviewed in other literatures that show that uh, because of uh, this uh, drug-drug interaction between uh, terfenadine and uh, the uh, macrolides that are being prescribed, there has been many cases that the patient has to be hospitalized. This includes the development of torsidipointis, a potentially fatal cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, proceeding to next, most of the agents, including macrolides, enhance the anticoagulant effects of warfarin, probably by interfering with metabolic clearance. The other proposed mechanisms are disturbance. Uh, as we know that macrolide antibiotics in general have uh, uh, an effect, de depleting effect that they uh, that they kill the intestinal flora. Because of that, the uh, microorganisms that are beneficial to our body they get reduced and adverse effects are observed. Disturbance of intestinal flora and subsequent reduction in intrinsic vitamin K production. Decrease in vitamin K absorption due to antibiotic-induced malabsorption and displacement of warfarin from serum albumin binding site. And warfarin becomes available free from the albumin and it becomes free in the plasma and shows uh, high dose effects. Cyclosporin is extensively metabolized by the cytochrome P450. As with theophylline, there is a considerable potential for interaction with the macrolides. Uh, uh, this is par uh, particularly important since cyclosporin has a low therapeutic index and its renal toxicity is concentration related. Uh, by inhibiting the metabolism, Metabolism cyclosporine, macrolides given to transplant recipients receiving cyclosporine can increase blood cyclosporine concentrations, resulting in nephrotoxicity, neurotoxicity, and hepatotoxicity. The next drug, carbamazepine, anti-epileptic drug, has shown marked toxicity when co-administered with erythromycin. Carbamazepine is primarily metabolized by cy cytochrome P453A4 subtype. The toxicity symptoms include vomiting, blood vision, and ataxia. Uh, the macrolide antibiotics clarithromycin and erythromycin may potentiate uh, calcium channel blockers by inhibiting the same cytochrome P450 system. Erythromycin, the strongest inhibitor, was not most strongly associated with hypotension, and because hypotension is uh, hypertension is uh, uh, is a very general. Uh, illness among elderly patients because of the co-administration of erythromycin along with calcium channel blockers what happened is uh, there was marked hypotension and for a sh uh, and the patients were ad uh, hospital in, admitted in the hospital for a very short term 
The discussion is uh, cytochrome P450 are a family of enzymes containing heme as a cofactor and are responsible for the metabolism of macrolide class of antibiotics along with other xenobiotics. Cradithromycin and erythromycin are thought to inhibit cytochrome P3A4 by forming inactive complexes with cytochrome P3A4 through their nitroso alkane metabolites. In contrast, the Azithromycin has been shown to be a weak substrate for cytochrome P3A4 to be minimally metabolized by the enzyme. When uh, an enzyme is, uh, when a drug is interacting minimally with an enzyme, it is bound to show less, uh, less effect on other drugs the effect that cytochrome P3A4 will have on other drugs. The ability of the enzyme to interact differently with the different macrolides forms the basis of the explanation as why only some therapeutic agents administered concomitantly with macrolides show clinically significant interaction and others do not. Differences among individuals, and this also differs from individual to individual because in the of the hepatic content and catalytic activity of P450 enzyme varies from person to person. Because, and that is based on genetic and non-genetic factors and the various uh, various variations of a patient's unique P450 profile over time may be the reason behind the observation that only some patients exhibit clinically significant drug interactions. Uh, macrolide, uh, uh, there are two uh, structural factors of macrolide antibiotics that are uh, that pose for, for, the, uh, for the inhibition of cytochrome P450, that is a hydrophobic character of the drug and accessibility of N-dimethyl group of the macrolide. Thank you. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions from the respected judges? No, madam. Can we move to the next one, sir? Yes, madam. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'd like to invite Ravi Khan Pandey, sir, from Sheet College of Pharmacy, Varanasi, India for e-poster presentation on preclinical evaluation and comparison of anti-diabetic drug along with anti-dyslipidemia drug for its synergetic action by using red model. Ravi sir, are you present there? Ravi sir? Patient to Patient to
Sabir sir, can we move to the next presenter if it is possible? We'll take the Ravi sir afterwards with your permission. Hello. Ravi sir, is it okay to present afterwards, after the remaining presentations, once you find your PPT? I'm, a, I'm unable to hear you. So just take your time. We'll call you back. Sorry. Um, I would like to invite Isha Chaudhary, ma'am, from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, India, e poster presentation on a questionnaire based study of students' opinion on the teaching and learning method in pharmacology of undergraduate students in various pharmacy colleges of West Bengal, India. Isha, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah. Just share your yes. screen, please. Yes, ma'am. Ravi sir, please close your desktop. Just stop your screen. Thank you. Ma'am, my screen is visible. Yes, yes. It has started sharing, but not yet visible. Yeah, it is visible now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. I am Isha Choudhury, studying in pharmacy from Sadar Bhagwan Singh University. Uh, today, my presentation topic is a questionnaire based study uh, regarding pharmacology teaching pattern in various pharmacy colleges of West Bengal in India. First of all, introduction. Pharmacology is the branch of biology that deals with the study of drug action, understanding current perception of pharmacy student regarding learning pharmacology and understanding pharmacology's role in both clinical practice and research may help improve the method of teaching. The aim of this study is to evaluate pharmacy students' opinion towards pharmacology. The main objective of this study to explore the most effective learning process of pharmacology at bachelor's levels in multiple pharmaceutical colleges of West Bengal. To, uh, the, another objective of this study to explore the choice of specific pharmacology subject in course curriculum of Bachelor of Pharmacy as prescribed by Pharmacy Council of India. Next, materials and method. Third year and fourth year bio pharmacy students are selected for this survey. 200 pharmacy students at Bengal School of Technology and 100 pharmacy students at Guru Nanak Institute of Pharmaceutical Science and Technology were included for this survey. This was a descriptive cross-sectional study built upon the questionnaire. A 14 item self-assessment pre-validated questionnaire pro, pro forma was circulated to the student in the classroom just after completion of the classes. By investigation for following a brief explanation of the objectives and relevance of voluntary-based participation. The time allocated for the completion of questionnaire was 30 minutes. A consent form provided to the participant for the take consent from the participant before to start of the study. All participants were assured that their personal information would be kept confidential. In this questionnaire, the first eight questions were you know, formed based on the internationally accepted Likert scale. Basically, Likert scale have five standards. 
SDA that stands for strongly disagree, DA stands for disagree, NA stands for not sure, A stands for agree, and AC stands for strongly agree. The remaining six questions were based on choosing the most appropriate opinion. Uh, yes, not, maybe, may not be. Next is result and discussion. This is the first table. We show the result of first eight questions. The first question is pharmacology is their favorite subject in uh, basic science. They have the four uh, options, strongly disagree, agree, not sure, disagree, and strongly agree. Second question is studying the pharmacology in third and fourth year of medical faculty will help in choosing the drug rationality in the future. Uh, and third question was the pharmacology should be integrated horizontally with other paraclinical subjects. Fourth is uh, there uh, should be emphasis on problem solving exercise rather than on didactic lecture. And there should be distribution of uh, hand notes giving the outline of topic before the lecture classes. Problem based on learning and uh, prescriptions are extremely useful in clinics. It would be difficult. Next is it would be difficult to correlate the drugs with the disease unless pharmacology is simultaneously learned along with the clinical. This question answer is show the first table. Next is the graphical presentation of question nine. The question was the rating evaluation method for examination, which shows that students prefer the all method in combination like MCQ test, written and viva and voice. Next is the graphical presentation of the question state uh, ten. The question was study material to learn pharmacology. They have the highest student uh, choice, the combination of uh, taste, teaching classes, and self-prepared. This time... Ma'am, are you done? Isha, ma'am? Isha, ma'am, am I audible to you? Yes. Have you done your presentation? Hello, ma'am. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. My screen visible, ma'am? No. Yes, I'm network problem. Ma Just a minute. My screen is visible right now, ma'am. Yes, it is okay. That's the conclusion part. The result obtained from the present study disclosed that pharmacology is a cornerstone of medical science. More specifically, this explanation of the student preference regarding pharmacology teaching and its outcome could potentially modify undergraduate pharmacology teaching, formulating new educational strategies to meet the objectives of making pharmacology more interesting and practicable is the main need. As teaching and learning is self-evolving process, a well-designed and systematic prospective research needs to be carried out very often. These are the reference. That's all, ma'am. Thank you. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Any questions from the respected judges? Any questions from the respected judges? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. I'd like to invite No Fazi, ma'am, from okay. SBS. Oh, no question, go ahead. Lunch, I guess. I did 
Ishanan, please move, mute yourself at some request. I would like to invite Noor Fuzzy Ma'am from SBS University, India, from oral presentation on evaluation of neuroprotective effect of S human seed extract in ciprofloxacin induced CNS disorder in rats. Yeah, good afternoon, ma'am. Am I audible to you? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would like to discuss my topic about uh, uh, just this. Please share your screen, ma'am. Uh, is it visible now? Hello? Yeah, it is visible now. Please proceed. Yeah, uh, I will discuss about the topic of evaluation of neuroprotective effect of cesium cumini seed extract on ciproflexacin induced CNS disorders in rats. First, I will start with the introduction about the neurotoxicity of ciprofloxacin, which, uh, which is the toxicant drug used in the project uh, in this experiment, which belongs to quinolone class of antibiotics, which are uh, uh, quinolone class of antibiotics, which are known for their neurological side effects. The mechanism of neurotoxicity is related to GABA-A receptors and activation of NMDA receptors, which release glutamate, as well as the rise of uh, oxidative stress. The mechanism is as shown, like the normal mechanism of a healthy cell, uh, 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 as shown in this figure, in the first figure, where the uh, positive ions enter the neuronal cell. It, uh, uh, it activates a case of depolarization, which leads which lead to activation of, of glutamate and excitation of neurons. While uh, the reverse action of, of, uh, glut, uh, of GABA receptors by, uh, by, uh, by uh, making uh, chlorine ions, which are uh, negative charges, entering the cell, which lead to Depolar, uh, repolarization of the cell. But for the neurotoxic toxic effect of ciprofloxacin leads to the increase of uh, or activation of NMDA receptor, which leads to the further excitation of the neurons. And for uh, the excitation of the neurons lead to onset of action like encephalopathy, dizziness, somnolence, confusion, agitation, restlessness, insomnia, and anxiety, and epilepsy. Uh, the aim of the study, uh, uh, the objective of the study, first I have identified the seed of the plant, then the, we prepare the uh, extract of it, then I've done phytochemical screening of the, of the extract, uh, then I have induced, I've induced the toxicity of the drug by the following method. Uh, sorry, no, uh, sorry, the extraction of the plant was done by powdering the seeds. Then the, seed, the powdered seeds were extracted with methanol and succinate apparatus at uh, 64 degrees Celsius for 12 cycles. The extract then filtered and the filtrate were concentrated to dryness by evaporation at 40 degrees Celsius. This, the dried extract then used for dosing. Uh, the animals were divided into six groups. Uh, one for control group, which were uh, administered water. The uh, positive control group, which is the toxicant group, were given 100 mg per kg of ciprofloxacin. The standard group were given 100 mg per kg body weight of ciprofloxacin plus 10 mg per kg dextromethorphan as the standard drug for 15 days, the whole project study was. Uh, the treatment group were receiving was again 100 mg of ciprofloxacin plus 150 mg per kg of the seed extract, which is the treatment drug used. 
and the treatment and the second treatment group which has administered 300 mg per kg of sq mini seed extract and the third group was administered 600 mg per kg of sq mini seed extract then behavioral after the end by the end of the experiment neurobehavioral test was done including neuro neuro beam tests in which the animal was made to cross the bean the animal and uh, according to that it was giving a scores the animal which fails to cross and uh, huh, the beam was uh, divided into three segments each of 50 centimeter the animal which uh, has passed the cross the beam without any any issue it, it was giving the score of zero while the one which fell in the first segment was giving a score of three and the second segment fall was giving a score of two and the one for the one which failed to cross the uh, the beam uh, then there was a get score behavioral index which is the observation test and accordingly the scores of the animal by observation was the phytochemical screening test shows of the plant shows the presence of alkaloid glycoside tannins flavonoids saponin and carbohydrates uh, the behavioral test results shows the uh, increased score in the positive control group which indicate motor disorders of the animal as compared to treatment group which get retreated, where we show which shows low scores here in the treatment group. group. Uh, there was uh, biomarkers, uh, sorry, oxidative stress parameters were done. The results of it, as shown in this figure, where we have uh, glutathione, glutathione, and uh, sodium oxide dismutase shows highest uh, so shows decrease in positive control the toxicant group which is due to the failure of uh, which is indicating an oxidative attack and failure to protect uh, against it while in the treatment group we show is uh, retreatment, uh, treatment of the group and the treatment groups it shows uh, uh, recovery of the oxidative stress which indicate there uh, which is due to the oxidative effect of the plant seeds while in lipid oxide pyridase Uh, lipid oxide evaluated lipid oxide peroxidase and toxicant group indicate low antioxidant defense, which le which means that the risking of polyunsaturated fatty acid components of membrane to oxidative attack that can affect membrane organization and loss of function and modification of proteins and DNA bases. While in the treatment group, it show a retrieve of uh, LPO increase in the treatment group lead to the present, which may be due to the presence of gallic acid and quercetin and isoquercetin, which are antioxidants. Uh, uh, while uh, nitric oxide, which is showed in a yellow column, yeah, nitric oxide shows Again, uh, high no, uh, while nitric oxide shows high score for positive control, which is which in which in, which, in, which indicate pathological condition due to glutamate release and NMDA receptor activation in rat brain cortex. This might attribute to restrained stress, which may involve convulsion. While the reduction of the uh, of the nitric oxide in the treatment groups indicates uh, indicates less nitric oxide, maybe due to the inhibition of nitric oxide synthase, which shows potential neuroprotecting activity of SQ mini seed extract against ciprofloxacin toxicity. The next slide shows uh, the effect of SQ mini seed extract 
uh, by doing acetylcholine esterase test. The high, the high concentration of acetylcholine esterase in positive control, it indicates a disorder, indicate altered cholinergic neurons, which can lead to limit the availability of acetylcholine and excitatory neurotransmitters in the synaptic cliff. With this, which may affect neuromodulation. While in the treatment group, uh, we see a decrease in acetylcholine esterase. This is uh, acetylcholine esterase is an enzyme responsible for the depletion of acetylcholine. Yeah, uh, we show recovery in the treatment groups or decrease in it in the treatment group, which indicate recovery. This can be attributed also to the presence of gallic acid and quercetin antioxidants, which are present in the seed of the plant. These are reported in the literature to inhibit acetylcholine esterase. The histopathological uh, report shows uh, uh, for, uh, under, yeah, for the normal uh, group, the first row, and the second row for, uh, for the toxic group. Here in the toxic group, it shows gliosis, which is, which is, a, uh, which is a remark indicate a dysfunctional or, or, a, or a, an effect. It indicates a damage to the brain, which, which a gliosis is, can be defined as the increase or deformality of shades of the glial cells due to damage in the brain. We, it shows uh, in, the, in the histopathological report of the, of the toxicant group, the positive control shows gliosis, while the standard group shows recovery in the third row. It shows re recovery of gliosis. While the, third, uh, the fourth row the, for the treatment group shows receding gliosis in the figure, which might indicate recovery, recovery effect of acumini seed extract. Uh, results and discussion about which has been discussed with the results. Conclusion, overall, it is evident that methanolic seed extract of Sudicum cumini protects against ciprofloxacin neurotoxicity by restoring ciprofloxacin-mediated alteration neurotransmitters and oxidative stress parameters. And here are some references, and thank you for listening. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions from the respected judges? Any questions from the respected judges? Thank you, ma'am. I would like Thank to invite you. Anurag sir from Sardar Bhagwan Univers Singh University, India. He posted a presentation on a review on pharmacological activity and traditional uses of Ziriwa Optiva. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, sir. Please share your screen. Ma'am, please. Uh, please uh, uh, just close your screen. Stop sharing your screen, you ma'am. Noor ma'am, am I audible to you? So you can start your screen. So please share your screen.
Ma'am, I am audible. Yeah, yeah, you audible. Please start. Good afternoon to all of uh, all of you. I am Anurag from Sardar Bhagwan Singh University, Balawala, Dera, Uttarakhand, India. Today, my poster present uh, poster present topic is a review on pharmacological activity and traditional use of Grebe Optima. Firstly, we are into, uh, firstly we are to do the introduction of Grebe Optima. Grebe Optima is an important species. It is largely distributed in Himalayan region of India, Nepal, Pakistan, and uh, subcontinent of Asian uh, Asian subcontinent uh, and it's uh, they attitude a range of uh, 500 to 2500 uh, uh, 2, meter mean sea level and then the grebia the, the genus of its member of atlasi family grebia round uh, grebia around about 150 species which are mostly sub secreted and climbing a grebia optiva fruit has an Hasting an anti-inflammatory activity can reduce fever. It bark has medicinal activity against diarrhea. And Gravia Optiva is a medicinal plant having significant potential to be studied for its phytochemical compound. Due to the medicinal importance of plant Gravia Optiva, the study was explained and uh, the study was planted, uh, planted and explored its phytochemical uh, constituent and antioxidant activity. Then we are discuss about next of uh, the phytochemical screening of Grevy Optima. Some uh, uh, the steam bugs, the steam bug alkaloid, tannins, stonins, flavonoid, terpenoid are present in steam bug of Grevy Optima. And in uh, and li in leaf, the phytochemical are present uh, uh, is alkaloid, flavonoid, terpenoid, fat and oil, sponin, tannins, carbohydrate, Steroid are present in leaves of Grebe Optima. And the root alkaloid, flavonoid, glycosides, tannin, stoil, stonin, terpenoid are the present in root of Grebe Optima. And now you see the antioxidant activity of Grebe Optima, which are uh, which are studies about the uh, uh, crude extract and aqueous extract, where the aqueous and crude extract are more uh, antioxidant activity in this uh, Grebe Optima. Now we are discuss about the pharmacological uses of grape optica. The, pharmacol the pharmacological uses are the different extract of leaf, root, stem bug of grape optica were tested some phytoconstituent and the responsible for grape optica has been used so many diseases like anti anti-lipidemic, anti anti hepatoprotective anti-diabetic, antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial, Nephroprotective, anti malarial, anti inflammatory, and sedative, hypnotic, and Alzheimer. Then we are discussing our next line, uh, next setting the traditional use of Grevy Optiva. A number of species of Grevy Optiva has been used as a medicinal agent to treat several diseases. The Grevy Optiva review, based on the literary source of discusses the current knowledge of traditional uses. Grevy Optiva is a traditionally used in a medicinal plant belonging to the Family of Triplacy. It's widely distributed in India and Asian subcontinent from the ancient time. It has been used as a treatment of traditional like uh, like the disease inflammation, dysentery, fever, typhoid, diarrhea, eczema, smallpox, uh, smallpox, malaria, and cough. Now we are uh, we are discuss about the whole study of the uh, whole study conclusion. It's are uh, it has been concluded that this plant process. Flonic content and as well as flavonoid content is an addition to the antioxidant activity. Various classes of phytochemical were also found. Further phytochemical studies are required to found new pharmacological activity and also isolated and identified new compounds from the national product. Discovery of a new antioxidant for the better health and as a challenging field of nutraceutical, keeping the significance antioxidant potential of Grevo Optiva is in review. Extensive bioactivity guided as a study are necessary to identify the new effective antioxidant compounds. And these are the ref uh, major reference of the review of uh, pharmacological activity and traditional uses of Grevo Optiva. Now, ma'am, that's all. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the respected judges?
Any questions from the respected judges? Satish sir? Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Moving to the next presentation, I would like to invite Sandeep Kane, sir, from Raja Ram Babu College of Pharmacy, Kesegaon, India. Oral presentation on silicon molecular mechanics mechanism of flavonoid as a cyclooxygenase two inhibitor. Sandeep, sir, are you present there? Yes, ma'am. My voice is audible. Yeah, your voice is audible. Just share your screen. You cannot start screen share while uh, other is participating in that message experiment. Anurag sir, please stop your screen. Yeah, just share it now, sir. Okay, ma'am. Okay. One second. Okay, is it visible now? Yes, yes, it is visible. Please okay. proceed. Good afternoon, Thank everyone, you. one and all. Uh, I am Sandeep Ramdrakani. I am presenting topic in silico molecular mechanisms of a flavonoid as an cyclooxygenase is to inhibitor. Under the able guidance of Dr. Srinivas Moite, sir. So we know that uh, a queer set in molecule is a well-known bioactive compound with a wide range of pharmacological effect, ranging from the neurological to cancer and inflammation as well. Significant research has been concluded, conducted on the anti-inflammatory profile of queer setting and its source. From, it has been isolated from the source, plant source, it could be a microgen. Inflammation is the major condition that uh, frequently linked to a wide range of diseases. So, anti-inflammatory medications are used to treat these inflammation and the related conditions. Most of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs amongst the most commonly used to, to treat this uh, pain and the inflammation. We know that these NSAIDs work by the inhibiting the cyclooxygenase enzyme and uh, which results it from the biosynthesis uh, inhibition of the biosynthesis of prostaglandins. The COX means the cyclooxygenase enzymes has the two isomers, COX-1 and the COX-2, similarly enzymes. New and the emerging COX-2 inhibitors, I'm, I'm targeting COX-2 inhibitors, New and the emerging COX-2 inhibitors are being thoroughly researched in order a well-known cure setting has recently been discovered to have that uh, COX-2 enzyme inhibitory action activity. So the no structural and the computational insights I have found at this molecular level in the mechanism to study the mechanism of the cure setting for the COX-2 inhibitors. So in this study, we attempted to investigate the significant molecular interaction of curcetin with its target protein, the COX cyclooxygen 2 enzyme, in order to explain its pharmacokinetic interactions. So these are the this is the drug uh, that uh, I have isolated curcetin molecule bioactive constituents, and I have docked with the COX2 enzyme. The methodology used, Mervin sketch method, I have utilized for the uh, structural parameters of that pure setting and the MMF forces field was used to further optimize the molecular coordinates. The omega pre-generated multicon formal library was docked. It has been used for the docking purpose and it has been docked on the software VM visualize. The exhaustive docking was performed with the shape was using the, for the optimization mode in that attempt to optimize the docking score performance. 
when the optimization mode is being entailed systematic solid body optimization on the top rank poses for the exhaustive docking parameter. COX-2 was investigated in the three different boxes by using the PDB file, uh, namely 3PGH. Three different simulations with the, an added value of nine were run around the active sites and uh, following with the completion of the base scoring poses was chosen to investigate the molecular interaction of the quercetin uh, for the inhibition of that COX-2 enzyme. So, uh, these are my conclusions. Prostaglandins are the autopoids that play a variety of biochemical and key enzyme in the biosynthesis of and physiological processes. Cyclooxygenase 1 is the housekeeping enzyme found in the gastrointestinal tract, mainly in the kidney and the platelets. So the prostaglandin regulates the renal blood flow and maintains the integrity of the gastric mucosa under the influence of COX-1 enzyme. So COX-2 is primarily associated with inflammation. It is due to the cytokinins and the growth factors, which increases the cyclooxygenase 2 expressions, preliminary responsible for the inflammatory site of action. Where it has been produces the prostaglandins that mediated the inflammation, pain, and the fever. So the COX isoenzymes means COX1 and the COX, COX2 molecules, it's made up of three folding units and epidermal growth factors of the domain. So the membrane binding site and the enzyme. So this enzyme we have screened with the uh, microcytin molecule. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory was found to be blocking promising the molecular interaction with the crucial anti angiogenesis and the proliferation. Induction of the apoptosis and the prevention of the metastasis in the animal model. So the NSAID and the selective in that COX-2 inhibitors have the capacity to suppress the COX-2 enzymes and the inflammation in the clinical context. So the quercetin has been shown to have the beneficial interaction with the major amino acid residue, which we I have pointed out, we have found the structural investigation on the lesions with the includes the arginine 120, phenylephrine 518, tyrosine 355. So in this uh, examination, the in silico interaction against the uh, valine 523 and the methionine 522 are shown in the figure. Using this protein lesion docking study, it uh, revealed that the whole cyclooxygen is to active sites. These are depending on the hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole interaction, pi pi aromatic interaction, and the non aromatic hydrophobic interactions. These we have uh, screened for the activity. So, in these uh, terms of the steric and the electrostatic property that we have studied, the lesion elongated and its flexible skeleton was similar to that the active site of the enzyme. We increase the strong bonding property in between the lesion and the protein. Particularly, we have found the, the distance in between that uh, lesion and the protein at about 3.32 and strong. The oxygen at of the phenyl groups which are present, these are connected with the hydrogen connections, uh, particularly with the leucine enzyme, leucine, uh, sorry, amino acid with the number of three fighter for the electro electrostatic interaction between the lesion and the protein. So this was demonstrated by the interaction of the lesions. Phenyl group with the COX-2 enzyme, uh, particularly due to the phenyl, it will connect it with the enzyme uh, with the amino acid tyrosine side chain. And the potential interaction actually Explain the pharmacological Thank you.
Hello. Yes, sir. Mm, I think there is. Huh. Is it is it audible now? Are you audible, but we can't see your screen. One second, ma'am. Yes, it is there now. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, where, uh, uh, which point? Uh, I I think it has been disconnected. Is it sl slide number this or this one? From this slide, slide you can go ahead. Okay. 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 Thank you, sir. So, this was and demonstrated by the interactions of the legion, particularly. The phenyl groups which are present from the pure setting, it will uh, interact with the COX-2, particularly with the amino acid tyrosine 355 as a side chain. And that is the one of the key factor at work in a protein nucleotide folding interaction uh, with the hydrogen bonding. This potential interaction could partially explain the pharmacological effect of pure setting. According to our findings, a side chain containing the hydrogen bonding favorable hydrophobic interaction appear to be an another important element in the compound with the higher bioactivity. Hydrophobic interaction also considered and uh, we found in between the trypsin 387 and uh, methionine 522 in between these two amino acids particularly. And this, uh, this is because of the hydrophobic interaction. This interaction could play the role in the uh, macromolecule complex stabilization that uh, valine 5331 and the valine 116, leucine 93, Valine 89 and the leucine 359 are showed a different hydrophobic interaction. Methionine 522 and phenylalanine 518 have the distinct phenyl hydroxyl side chain. Uh, structure and the adding which improves the binding forces for the lead structure identification. So these are Uh, Any questions from the judges? Madam, uh, I would like to see the last slide, result slide. Yes, sir. Uh, so please, sir, please. Please proceed, sir. Mr. Sandeep, am I audible to you? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audio listening.
Am I audible, ma'am? Hello? Ji, sir. Ji, sir. Sir, am I audible to you? Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hello, yeah. am I audible? Yeah, uh, yes, I... you are audible. Uh, Mr. Sandeep, sir, am I audible to you? Hello, hello, uh, ma'am, sir is facing some technical issues. So, yeah, yes, uh, Sandeep, yeah. Sir. hello, hello. I think you are facing some technical issues. So, so many slides, I could not see it. Uh, so, can you just brief your yes. uh, result part, yes. sir? Can you just brief your result part? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, in the search of a new COX-2 inhibitor, ma'am, it is a prominent molecule. Curcetin is the prominent molecule as a lead for the development. Because quercetin uh, made a numerous molecular connections with the COX-2 sites, particularly arginine 102, tyrosine 355, and methionine 252 at level. And uh, the main, this is because of these the interaction due to the different attractive forces at the micromolecular level, uh, hydrogen bondings, dipole-dipole interactions, and the, due to the hydrophobic interactions. The, that is my conclusion. Okay. So which activity you are looking for, sir? Uh, further, uh, we are targeting uh, anti, uh, antioxidant uh, as well as in vitro anti-cancer activity. Okay, okay. So on this, on this uh, behalf, what, what uh, this thing you have got, sir? What uh, you can see? Uh, particularly uh, because of this in silico study, we found a particular uh, amino acid responsible for that uh, activity. And we have the traditional uh, literatures that the most those drugs which have the stronger anti-inflammatory activity they possess the anti-cancer activity. So we are targeting the breast cancer area for that. Uh, uh, we are looking. Uh, we have done this study, ma'am. Quercetin you are using for the cancer, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So you have got the targeted uh, amino acid which will be uh, used for the cancer, right? through the in silico studies. Yes. Which are the targeted amino acids? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, particularly arginine, tyrosine, and the methionine. Okay, okay. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. It was nice job. Nice work. Uh, I would like to ask one question. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, which yes. software you used for your in silico study? I wanted to uh, know. We like we like MTS, sir. Uh, which one? We we like MDS. We like MDS. Okay, so uh, you have got in your institute licensed version? Yes. Okay. Yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. We have licensed for this. Okay, okay. Okay, that's the main thing that the software you used, I wanted to know. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, can we move to the yes, remaining presenters with your permission? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I think yeah. some uh, were left. Uh, yes, sir. Ravi Pandey sir has Nikita. left, and one Nikita Narwani ma'am is there. Uh, these two are left. Okay, okay. 
so can we move to them yes yes yeah thank you sir i would like to invite ravi kant pandey sir from sheet college of pharmacy varanasi for presentation on preclinical evaluation and comparison of anti diabetic drug along with anti dyslipidemia drug for its synergistic action by using ret model uh excuse me uh, how can i unshare the screen yes it is visible please proceed Ravi sir, we are unable to hear you. Please be audible. Ravi sir, there is no voice in your presentation. I'm audible, ma'am. Yeah, you are audible. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can I start from starting? Can I? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, ma'am, uh, my topic is preclinical evaluation and comparison of anti-diabetic drug along with anti-dyslipidemia drug. Uh, I have chosen this topic because, on many surveys and reviewing so many articles, it is found that diabetes and cholesterol these are two points of a side. Means most of the diabetic patients also have uh, cardiovascular complications. In alone India, more than 45 million patients of cardiovascular diseases are suffering from diabetes, and uh, these patients taking medicines uh, separately for diabetes and cardiovascular complications that causes uh, some side effects also so in my study i have taken this uh, these drugs in a combination and uh, look whether they might uh, reduce their uh, side effects and also so synergistic effect or not for that i have taken 30 male albino wister rats and divided into six groups Group zero, one, two, three, and four. In group zero, I am further divided into two subgroups, control and normal control. And in each group, I have taken six animals. Group from good uh, to group one, I have given uh, normal diet and normal control. Group one, I have given uh, five liter zone. Group two, atorvastatin statin alone. Group three, five liter zone and atorvastatin statin combination. And group four, glimpride and atorvastatin statin combination. At every fifteen days interval, I have taken blood sample. and uh, uh, this is the total study of 19 days after 19 days uh, the animals are sacrificed and the section of heart and liver is uh, taken and uh, um, and the uh, amount of uh, fats deposited in the tissues are uh, calibrated so in in our study it is found that the combination of uh, uh, atorvastatin and glim uh, pyoglita zones are more effective and more better than the combination of atorvastatin and Uh, glimpride 
so we can say that uh, this combination is more uh, effective. Hello? Am I audible, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, very much audible. Carry on. Yes, ma'am. So, um, uh, after 19 days study, this is the results where uh, normal group shows no changes in their cholesterol, glucose, and triglyceride level, while normal group two, in group two, where diabetic uh, rates are taken and their uh, level of glucose is increases, or also HDL and VLDL level is increases. Group to which five glutazones is given, glucose is reduced from 240 to 127, and triglycerides also removed. HDL is increases from 59 to 62, while VLDL and HDL is decreases. They, at the same, we are uh, given uh, seeing the atovastatin response. So glucose is increases, triglycerides is decreases, HDL and HDL is also increases, while LDL and VLDL is decreases. At the same time, the combination of atorvastatin and triglutazone, um, the most uh, specific response we got from this combination, glucose is uh, reduced from 195 to 120, triglycerides is also removed from 221 to 110, while HDL is increasing, increases 43 to 58, and uh, LDL and VLDL level, uh, level is also decreases. So after that, this uh, study and this result, I have concluded that the combination of uh, both combinations are uh, showed a significant response, but the combination of atorvastatin and pioglitazone is more effective than combination of atorvastatin and glimpride. That's all, ma'am. So what exactly you have done is, uh... ma'am. Actually, uh, I have uh, taken these uh, anti-diabetic drugs and anti-dyslipidemia drug combination because uh, separately they have some side effect also. In my in my uh, work in my progress work, I have taken the combination of this anti-diabetics along with anti-dyslipidemic, which shows significant synergistic effect, and the side effect is also in uh, decreases. So patient who is taking separate medicines for both diseases, diabetes and cardiovascular complications or dyslipidemia, now he can take only one medicine and he can uh, got a better result than uh, alone medicines. What is the dose? Ma'am, uh, for this, uh, uh, for diabetic, inducing diabetes, we have I have taken Alexon model for that is 100 mg per kg body weight. And no, no, I'm, I'm talking in combination, what is the dose? Okay, ma'am. Uh, Glimpride 2 mg and uh, pioglitazone 20 mg per, uh, per kg body weight and atorvastatin also 20 mg per kg body weight, ma'am. Both are 20, 20 mg. 20 mg per kg body weight, ma'am. The drug is given to the animals. 20 mg per kg body weight, the drug is given to the animal. And singly, how much you have given? Yes, ma'am. Only, only uh, tropostatin and the other drug singly, how much you have given? Okay, okay, this is the grouping, right? Yes, ma'am. This is the uh, uh, grouping of animals and this is the dosing of animals. Pioglitazone okay. alone and 20 mg per kg body weight, atorvastatin also 20 mg per kg body weight, pioglitazone and combination is also 20 mg, while glimpride is 1 mg per kg and why, why taken 20? per kg body weight. Why, why 20? This is the reference uh, I have taken from the other sources. But this, this work is already done before? Uh, it is also done with statin. Okay. But you have to select for this also, no? 20, how you have selected 20? Ma'am, because the alone is work alone is done by Atorva Estatin, so I am taken from that source. I, I understand. Not in a this combination is... with Glimpride or Pyrolytazone. 
Okay, but in combination you are giving 20 mg, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this from where you got? How you have selected this 20 mg? This might effective in 10 mg also, 15 also, 30 also. We don't know, right? Yes. On what basis you have made this 20? This is your MPOM work? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But you should know now what basis you have selected. In the group directly you are giving 20, right? Ma'am, first we also uh, done the HD, uh, the lethal dose uh, I have given. Okay. The toxicity studies you have done. The, the, yes, okay, yes, that is fine. But you could have been taken, no? Minimum dose and the maximum dose. Some two, three doses you have taken, should have been taken, no? Instead yes, of taking only one dose. Uh, I have right. also taken uh, 10, uh, 10 mg and 20 mg. And the result uh, which is which I got is better in 20 mg. That's why I had taken... 20 mg and also you, you uh, already reference done. References to yeah, yeah, that is only my question whether you have done and how much because in the grouping you are showing straight away 20 mg right yes, uh, yes ma'am now mm -hmm. here i am only showing 20 mg but in my um, study i have taken also 10 mg also okay so you have taken 10 also 20 also 10 and yes, 20 so 20, 20 yes. is showing better yes ma'am you should have been taken one more and you should have been proved no it is not showing that better. So 20 is best like that. Three dose you would have been taken below 20 above and above 20. Uh, I have taken uh, only two doses, um, 10 and 20 mg. Mm -hmm. Then you are taking two combinations, right? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. What is the reason behind me taking this two combinations? Uh, both have potency to reduce the uh, diabetic, uh, di uh, uh, diabetes. But uh, in my study, it is also checked whether which combination is better along with uh, atorvastatin. If okay. I am, uh, suppose, uh, I'm manufacturing this drug, so which combination is more effective? Either mm. pioglitazone with atorvastatin or glimipride with atorvastatin. Glimipride, you are using 1 mg, right? Glimipride, you are using 1 mg per kg. Yes, ma'am. Why that is 1 mg per kg? Have you done any in vitro studies? No, right? Yes, ma'am. Have you done any in vitro studies? In vitro, not, ma'am. No. This is also one more uh, this thing. You have taken again one mg per kg. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is also one more. Uh... Okay, fine. Yes. Fine, good work. Thank you, ma'am. Any more questions from the respected judges? No, madam. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Moving to the next present, I would like to invite Nikita Nirvan, ma'am, from Jamia Hamdard, India. He posted a presentation on high fat diet induced diabetic osteoporosis in C57BL6. Mice is elevated with the combination of lignipitine and metformin. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Uh, yes, yes ma'am, you are audible. So, good afternoon, everyone. The topic of my uh, e poster presentation is hyperdiet induced diabetic osteoporosis in C57 BL6 mice is alleviated with the combination of lenalidine and metformin. So, this is the introduction. As diabetic osteoporosis is a relatively newer complication which is associated with type 2 diabetes mellitus and that is characterized by higher fracture rates, increased bone resorption, impaired bone formation, and disrupted bone architecture. Now, uh, the available uh, marketed drugs uh, like DPP4 inhibitors and metformin have proven benefits in improving bone health and it has been proven in clinical as well as preclinical studies. So, therefore, we have investigated the effect of lena metformin 
uh, and metformin alone, any combination to treat diabetic osteoporosis in high fat fed mice. So the method followed was uh, first of all, C57 BR6 mice were kept on high fat diet for 22 weeks to induce the diabetic osteoporosis, and this osteoporosis was checked by micro CT. Uh, and then after that, linagliptin 10 mg per kg and metformin 150 mg per kg uh, alone and also in combination were already administered to the diabetic mice from 18 to 22 week, that is for four weeks. Then after that, the bones were removed and bone microarchitectural changes and bone turnover markers, namely bone morphogenetic protein 2, sclerostin, trap, uh, osteocalcium, ALP, calcium, and some pro inflammatory cytokines were assessed. Uh, so, this is the uh, uh, protocol that was followed. So, uh, at week zero, these mice were taken. Then, initially, the diabetes was checked uh, by measuring their fasting blood glucose level and OGPT and IP profile. And then, after that, uh, dose was administered orally for four uh, weeks. Then, uh, after that, uh, serum uh, parameters were assessed and the bones were excised and checked with micro CT. And further, ELISA was conducted for parameters like DNA. Coming to the results, the combination of linaglipin and metformin reversed the hypertype impaired bone microarchitecture and um, reduced the uh, BMD, distorted bone histology, and altered bone turnover markers. And this is indicated by significant increase in bone uh, ALP, uh, we could see here, and BMP2, which is in this one figure, and osteocalcin here, and uh, TRAP. Yeah. and uh, serum calcium. So additionally, mice uh, body weight and fasting blood glucose was also improved ah. with this combination. And uh, we observed that. This method is percent Pardon, sir? Count ho karke, kitna dikha raha hai, ta sara mila karke. Ravi Khan ji, aapki awaaz ariye, beech mein disturbance ho raha hai, mute kar lijiye. Ah. The graph for body weight, we could see that initially when hypertype was given for 18 weeks, the body weight increased rapidly. But when uh, metformin and uh, linagliptin was uh, given, so we found that body weight had reduced in the mice. And similarly, this is for fasting blood glucose level. So basically, the blood glucose level increased initially. For starting uh, 18 weeks, and then after the induction, after giving renovating and microbiome, it was reduced. So, and these are the bone uh, microarchitectural uh, images which are uh, taken from the micro CT. This is for normal control group. As we could see, this trabecular region is uh, very uh, spongy and uh, very thick. And, but in high fat diet, we could see the hollow sphere as the trabecular uh, bones uh, cells has reduced here. And then in again, high fat diet plus linagliptin group, uh, this has been improved. And in metformin group also, it has been improved. But the highest impact was observing with the combination of linagliptin and metformin. And this is the uh, femur cortical bone uh, images, uh, which also reflects the um, uh, this thickness, uh, which were uh, like like this, um, these three are the uh, cortical uh, parameters, uh, which is our total trabecular area, cortical area, and cortical thickness. So, as we could see, there is only change in cortical thickness as compared to normal group. Hyper diet uh, mice observed less uh, cortical thickness, and which was further improved with the combination of this. Uh, uh, Vena Gepin and Metform. Similarly, here uh, on the trabecular parameters, we have conducted these uh, six parameters that is, bone volume to trabecular volume, which was found to be increased with the uh, combination of Vena uh, Gepin and Metform. And then, trabecular number, which was found to be increased with this combination. And again, trabecular thickness, which was again increased with the combination as compared to hypertype group. Then, trabecular separation was reduced, as we could see here in this graph. And then, uh, connectivity density was increased 
and uh, SMI was uh, reduced. So, in this study, we could conclude uh, on the basis of these parameters, we could conclude that uh, there is improvement in bone microarchitecture and bone mineral density, bone turnover markers, and bone histopathology by the combination of phenylephrine and metformin, as it shows its bone protective potential in hyphenite induced diabetic osteoporosis, which is possibly mediated through the modulation of PMP2. Because uh, uh, PMP2, we have seen uh, there is a major uh, change observed. So, PMP2 was the possible mechanism uh, which was. Uh, Floor bias uh, behind this uh, protective effect of this combination. This is all. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions from the respected judges? Yeah. Uh, I would like to congratulate you for doing uh, the work on the bones. Because uh, working on the bones is not an easy task. And, yes, uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would like to know that wh what is the reason you have chosen this combination? Uh, actually, ma'am, uh, this uh, Lena fifteen, among other DPP, if we talk about general DPP four inhibitors, uh, so as we know that DPP four inhibitors are one of the safest and mostly prescribed uh, anti-diabetic drugs for treating diabetes in patients. Yeah. Yeah. So, and metformin was also one of the uh, you know, very clinically used drug. And metformin has a very good effect when it is combined with the uh, DPP-4 inhibitor. So there are clinical studies and in patients also doctors prescribe this combination. So henceforth, we have took the, uh, we initially decided to take the combination of DPP-4 inhibitor and metformin. Then after that comes uh, which DPP-4 inhibitor we should choose. So among the DPP-4 inhibitors, we found that there are two type of DPP-4 inhibitors, but that peptidomimetics and non-peptidomimetics. So linagliptin was non-peptidomimetic uh, DPP-4 inhibitor. That means it had more uh, effect on, uh, uh, prolonged effect on DPP-4 inhibition as compared to other drugs. And one very important advantage was uh, that this, this drug had non-renal route of uh, elimination from the body. So it is very safe in elderly patients who have renal problems and also in patients who are already suffering from the kidney disease. So that's why we uh, went for this combination. Okay. So both, are, both, this, both the drugs are uh, reported for the, this activity separately alone? Yes, yes. There are some in vitro uh, in vitro studies that have been conducted, and in uh, there are also uh, some studies that have seen uh, clinical that was seen clinically the fracture risk, but they have not seen uh, this, uh, this special effect of this uh, combination on the osteoporosis. Right? Uh, like uh, in osteoporosis, we have this bone microarchitecture parameters and PMP two and all this. Uh, uh, osteocalcin and trap. So the effect of these drugs, specifically when we talk about diabetic osteoporosis, that has not been evaluated till date. So that's why uh, we went ahead looking for the. Uh, are you looking for synergistic effect? Are you looking for synergistic yes. effect of this? Yes, ma'am. Actually, we are looking for the yeah, synergistic effect in combination. Yeah, that's that way you can reduce the dose also. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah, good, good work. Is it a part of your PhD or uh, any other project? Yes, ma'am. This is part of my PhD project. Okay, okay. All the very best for your PhD. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot. Thank you, ma'am. Any more questions from the respected judges? No, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, ma'am and sir, we are done with the presentations. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your valuable time and for the sessioning, the uh, session chairs, being the session chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am and sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.
your invitation also yeah, it was my pleasure to be part of this event lot of knowledge i have gained thank you for making me part of this most welcome ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you so uh, shall we leave now ma'am uh yes sir once one just a moment sir on behalf of association of pharmaceutical research i would like to express my gratitude to all the speakers for their presence and contribution to making this conference a more informative and interesting session apr extends our sincere gratitude to our speakers and participation participants to take out their time for their busy schedule to grace the event thank you everyone thank you so much thank you Thank you ma'am and sir we can end the meeting Thank you